I will. Thank you, sir. And somehow I'm logged in as you. All right. God bless. We need to talk. This is insane. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. It might be time for a Feldman vacation A camping trip, maybe a river cruise Or a week in L.A. so you can really schmooze It's a very long show, two times a week Could it be your brain has sprung a leak? It's time to take a break and get out of town Before this whole thing comes crashing down about doing a best of show you could mine the archives and save some dough with all the crazy stuff happening each day you could play old clips of harvey J. So go up to Nantucket, find the man who can suck it You better do it now before you kick the bucket You better do it now before you kick the bucket You better do it now before you kick the bucket God, I wish I were Mike Steinem Welcome to the broadcast. I'm David Feldman. Welcome to the mop up. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 57 degrees in Sunday. Sunny, sunny, sunny. It was sunny. It was sunny at the causeway. They got sunny at the causeway. It was the shortest tenure in British history. Liz Truss resigned today. Uh, Liz Truss resigned today uh, as British Prime Minister. If you were betting on the head of lettuce to outlast her, congratulations, Liz was shredded first. Given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning, I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. Fewer than two months in office, and she killed the queen. She really did. She shook hands with the queen, and like 48 hours, the queen was dead. Ambition, Liz Truss, ambition. This is the face of ambition. Of course, it's sexist to call a woman ambitious. I get that. And I also understand that her predecessor, Boris Johnson, handpicked Liz Truss uh, because he knew she would fall flat on her ass and the Tories would come crawling back to Boris Johnson. But still, it is ambition. Johnson is just as big, if not a bigger, cravenly ambitious clown. And he didn't get treated that way, not the way Liz Truss did. Let's go to Sheila Scheisen. She covers 10 Downing Street for German television. Sheila Scheisen, uh, what was Prime Minister Truss's thought uh, leading up uh, to this decision? Dann hieß es plötzlich, es gebe doch keinen Fraktionszwang, obwohl das vorher angekündigt worden war, woraufhin dann der stellvertretende Fraktionschef das Parlament mit den Worten verließ, I'm fucking furious and I don't fucking care anymore. Ich übersetze das jetzt mal nicht, aber das ist eine Partei, wo wirklich jede Disziplin zusammengebrochen ist. 
I'm so sorry, Sheila Scheisen uh, with German television. You have a very thick German accent. Could you uh, could you say that again, please? What 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 did Liz Truss say right before stepping outside to resign? What what were the words she used? I'm fucking furious and I don't fucking care anymore. That would be Sheila Scheisen from German television. Thank you, Sheila Scheisen. The conservatives in Great Britain normally march in lockstep, probably because it's still too soon to march in goose step. Give it some time. But here is a Tory backbencher, a conservative who is really pissed off at former Prime Minister Liz Truss all the time but now worrying about their own personal circumstances because there is nothing as X as an ex MP I think it is utterly appalling so, so you seem I'm, quietly I'm, I'm livid and you know wow you know that's the thing about the British uh he's livid this is what I love about the British they're a hot-blooded people can you see how he's wearing his emotions right on his pleated sleeves Basically, this backbencher is saying, basically what he's saying is. Dann hieß es plötzlich, es gebe doch kein, I'm fucking furious and I don't fucking care anymore. That is the conservative uh, backbencher. Please continue, uh, conservative uh, backbencher who's mad at Liz Truss. I really shouldn't say this, but I hope all those people that put Liz Truss in number 10, I hope it was worth it. I hope it was worth it for the ministerial red box. I hope it was worth it to sit around the cabinet table because the damage they have done to our party is extraordinary. I'm sorry, it's very difficult to convey. You look just furious about this. I am. I am. I've had enough. I've had enough of talentless people um, putting their tick in the right box, not because it's in the national interest, but because it's in their own personal interest to achieve ministerial position. And I, and I know I speak for hundreds of backbenchers who right now um, are worrying for their constituents all the time, but now worrying about their own personal circumstances because there is nothing as X, as an ex MP. And a lot of my colleagues are wondering, as many of their constituents are wondering, and how they're going to pay their mortgages if this all comes to an end soon. I'm a little confused there, backbencher. You're a Tory, you're a conservative, and you're worried about your mortgage? You're, you're worried that you're going to be an ex-prime minister and then you won't be able to, you're a cons what, say that again? There is nothing as ex as an ex-MP, and a lot of my colleagues are wondering as many of their constituents are wondering how they're going to pay their mortgages if this all comes to an end soon. I'm sorry, you're a member of the Tories. You're a conservative and you're worried about your mortgage. Maybe you should join the Labour Party. I thought the whole point of being a conservative like Liz Truss was to quit government eventually and get paid by a bank to be their show pony. What a loser. Why would you be a conservative if you're worried about paying your mortgage, you effing moron? What a loser. Mike Pence, remember him? Speaking of losers, was speaking at Georgetown University Wednesday night, and someone with a British accent asked Vice President, former Vice President Mike Pence, this. If Donald Trump is the Republican nominee for president in 2024, will you vote for him? <laughs> Well, there might be somebody else I'd prefer more. Well, there might be somebody else I would prefer more. You know what? You are an ingrate. That's what you are, Mike Pence. Donald Trump picked you out of the chorus line. He made you a star. And there might be somebody else you prefer more. How dare you? How dare you? Donald Trump and his supporters on January 6 built a stage for you outside the Capitol. And, and they were looking for you that day so they could put you up on that stage right in front of the Capitol. He wanted, Donald Trump wanted you to be a star. And, and, and his supporters were going to carry you up on that stage. And, and to make sure you wouldn't fall, they, they had a safety noose to wrap around your neck. And instead, you ran 
from them because you're afraid of success, you self-destructive coward, you, Mike Pence. And now you have the audacity to say you might prefer somebody else to be president. Whatever happened to gratitude? Nobody, nobody thanks Donald Trump. You're just as bad as the rest of them. You know, it reminds me of all those gay children who committed suicide in Indiana when you were governor there because, you know, you demonized homosexuality. And do the parents of those kids who committed suicide ever call you and thank you for their son's suicide? They never call and say, thank you, Vice President Pence. My son is no longer gay because he's dead. No, they never call you. People, you know what? You know what? You know what? I'm just, I am just so... I'm fucking furious and I don't fucking care anymore. You know, they block me out. Well, the Jewish media block me out. Uh, well, you know who else is furious? Ah, Vladimir Putin is furious. Vladimir Putin is furious. He declared martial law yesterday in the four partially annexed regions of Ukraine. Those regions are Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk. And uh, what does that mean? What does martial law mean? It means the military can set curfews and restrict movement of civilians by forcing them to seek permission to leave their homes, or as the Republican Party calls that, 2023, after the, uh, after the midterms. Well, poor, poor Kanye West. Poor, poor Kanye West. The poor guy, the poor guy cannot catch a break. His marriage is over. The Gap and J.P. Morgan Chase refuse to do business with him. He's been pretty much kicked off of Twitter and is forced to buy Parler, that conservative social media network that's run by Candace Owens' idiot husband. All this trouble because he accidentally made a poor choice of words over and over and over again. He accidentally said over and over and over again, he accidentally said this. They block me out. The Jewish media block me out. He accidentally said that over and over and over again. Come on, we all make mistakes. We all say something like that over and over and over. So he went on Pierce Morgan's show to set the record straight. Uh, you know, he cleared things up. It was a poor choice of words on countless podcasts and several tweets over and over again. So here he is assuring everyone that he's not the bad guy everybody thinks he is. Do you now regret saying I death gone free? Day. The question for you is, do you now regret saying I death gone free day. on Jewish people? Are you sorry you said that? No. I don't think it matters. You should be. Absolutely not. You should be. Absolutely not. Yeah, but yeah, you should be. Absolutely not. When you insult the Jewish people and say you're going death gone free on the Jewish people, that is as racist as anything you say you've been through and any pain that you've experienced. It's the same thing. Racism is racism. And you know that, I think, don't you? Yeah, obviously, that's why I said it. So you said it knowing it's racist? Yes, I fought fire with fire. Okay. I'm not here to get hosed down. At least that's it's a honest. different type of freedom fighter. Well, I'm glad he cleared that up. Obviously, it's all cleared up now. Obviously, he's mentally ill. But because he still makes money for people, we put him on television shows and hang on his every word when he clearly needs to be institutionalized. Uh, Anti-Semites, uh, racists, people who wear White Lives Matter shirts are mentally ill. They need to be institutionalized until they can get better. But people like Kanye, he still can make money for other people. So he's referred to as a troubled genius because he can still make money for Piers Morgan. He can still make money for whoever's going to carry his clothing line or release his records. Uh, he's going to buy Parler because uh, he's worth, they say, a billion or two. But 
you know, he's sick and he needs help. And eventually he's going to lose all his money. And when he loses all that money and when nobody can make money off of Kanye, then and only then will people like Piers Morgan say, I can't have Kanye on my show. It would be irresponsible. It would be irresponsible for my audience to see somebody like that. And it's a disservice to Kanye and his children. I mean, their father is clearly suffering from a psychotic episode. I can't put him on television. I couldn't live with myself if I exploited Kanye in such a shameless fashion. Yep, all it takes is for Kanye to go through all his money and not be able to make any money for his investors before he finally gets the help he needs. And the, the same basically goes for Donald Trump, who is still making money for people, right? Uh, he's being called an anti-Semite, just like Kanye this week. Uh, Trump is being called an anti-Semite this week, all because he warned American Jews to get their act together. Get your act together, Jews, he said. He's upset with the Jews in America because they don't support him. Something like 80% of Jews don't vote for Trump. And this infuriates Donald Trump. He doesn't understand why, because he's so supportive of Israel. Yeah, yeah. You know, Don, it's, it's hard for Jews to decide whether to vote for Republicans or Democrats because there are very fine people on both sides. Something tells me, Donald Trump, that Jews don't vote for you because when they hear you talk about Muslims, they know Jews are next. Now, all stereotypes, all stereotypes about Jews are statistically wrong, except for one. A Jew can spot a Nazi a mile away, and Donald Trump is a Nazi. And Jews, for some reason, I, I haven't read history, but for some reason, Jews have a problem voting for Nazis like Donald Trump. Here is Alan Dershowitz explaining it uh, a little bit better than I can. Israel is not the only issue that we deeply care about. We're, we're Americans and we care about me as a liberal. I care about a, a, a gay person's right to marry somebody of his own sex. I care about a woman's right to uh, have an abortion at the early stages of her pregnancy. I care about climate control. I care about reasonable gun control. I care about separation between church and state. And those are issues the Republicans are not good on. They're yes, that's Alan Dershowitz, liberal, uh, who has said that Donald Trump has done a great job on Israel. Not quite sure what Donald Trump did for Israel. He moved the American embassy to Jerusalem and got the Saudis who attacked America on 9-11 to side with Israel in a cold war with Iran, Iran, which didn't attack us on 9-11, Saudi Arabia did. Uh, but uh, the brilliant Alan Dershowitz, who put his teeth in for that interview, uh, says that he's a liberal and, and liberals cannot support Donald Trump. They just can't. Unless Donald Trump is being impeached, in which case... Alan Dershowitz, his schedule is wide open to go to the Senate and defend Donald Trump when he's being impeached because Alan Dershowitz is a liberal. He's a liberal and he wants to protect women's rights to choose and the rights of the LGBTQ. And he's a liberal, but he needed to step up and save Donald Trump's presidency because the liberal Alan Dershowitz, he had no choice. Trump needed him because it was in the Senate and, and Mitch McConnell controlled the Senate. The Republicans controlled the Senate. You remember what happened during that first impeachment. They were ready to throw Donald Trump out of office. Trump needed Alan Dershowitz, the big liberal, 
They were going to throw Donald Trump out of office, right? No, they weren't. No, they weren't going to do that. They didn't need you, Alan Dershowitz. You needed the attention because you're in your 80s and you want to be relevant. You want a reason to put your teeth in. That's all you're looking for. Uh, liberal, we don't need you. We need you to go away. No, I'm kidding. You're a great guy, Alan Dershowitz. And you went to Harvard and you hang out with brilliant Harvard people. You taught at Harvard. You taught constitutional law at Harvard, Alan Dershowitz. You're a truth seeker. Here is Alan Dershowitz with another Harvard professor talking Harvard stuff. Who is that guy? Um, it's a guy. Who, who is it? uh who is that guy he's talking to it looks oh it's Jeffrey Epstein it's not a Harvard guy Jeffrey Epstein never went to Harvard but he donated a lot of money to Harvard so you get to wear a sweatshirt that says Harvard on it and Alan Dershowitz gets to hang out in your apartment and get massages that's if you donate money to Harvard they give you a sweatshirt that says Harvard on it and Alan Dershowitz will come to your apartment in New York City and get a massage from a woman who may or may not be underaged. That's what you get for your uh, donation to Harvard. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Epstein, smart guy, good with numbers. Did you know that? He's very good with numbers, taught math at Dalton, the prep school, Attorney General Bill Barr's father was the headmaster at Dalton, and he hired Jeffrey Epstein to teach math at Dalton Prep School, even though Epstein can't count past the age of 15. Should mention that Attorney General Bill Barr's father, the headmaster at Dalton, who hired Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Bill Barr's father also wrote science fiction that involved space travel. He wrote some stories about space travel and a planet ruled by men who have sex with children. Odd that the headmaster of uh, Dalton would be fantasizing about men who rule planets and who have sex with children. Uh, interesting. Anyway, Alan Dershowitz is a liberal. That's why in the late 90s, he wrote this op-ed for the Los Angeles Times entitled, Statutory Rape <laughs> is an Outdated Concept. I've referred to this repeatedly on the show. I always think it's important that we should remember that Alan Dershowitz wrote uh, an op-ed piece for the uh, Los Angeles Times entitled uh, Statutory Rape is an Outdated Concept. It was in the late 90s, and he was saying something to the effect that if a 16-year-old can choose abortion, she should be able to choose to have sex basically with anyone they want, writes Alan Dershowitz, Harvard's very own friend of Jeffrey Epstein. Well, yes. Toxic men, toxic, toxic men. Roger Stone, for example, has had a long relationship with Donald Trump. Stone was convicted on all counts of obstruction, making false statements, and witness tampering on November 15th, 2019. Do you remember this? He lied before Congress and he was convicted and he was facing nine months in prison. And then a few months later, after the conviction, Stone was pardoned by President Trump. Here is a fully pardoned Roger Stone talking to a Danish documentarian about how the 2020 presidential election was going to play out. This was back in around August of 2020. The fully pardoned Roger Stone talking about how Donald Trump is going to win in November of 2020. But what they're assuming is that the election will be normal. The election will not be normal. 
oh, these are the California results? Sorry, we're not accepting them. We're challenging them in court. If the electors show up at the, at the Electoral College, armed guards will throw them out. I'm the president. Fuck you. You're not stealing Florida. You're not stealing Ohio. I'm challenging all of it. And the judges we're going to are judges I appointed. Fuck you. You're not stealing the election. That's what, that's basically what Bush did to Gore. So, it, you know, if they want to run a bunch of fake ballots, we'll have an investigation. We'll say, these ballots are fake. Yep. Your results are invalidated. Goodbye. That's the way it's going to have to work. Wow. It's, it's going to be really nasty. Wow. Be, be, but you cannot count on, we're not going to get an honest election. Right. So let's say that Trump is a little behind right now, which he probably is. That doesn't bother me. But even if he wins an honest election, we're not going to have an honest oh, election. Got it. They're going to steal it. They're stealing this blind in Florida right now. So, wow. you know, it's not the first time it's happened in this country. It happens around the world. Yeah. So he's going to have to he's going to have to fight for the presidency in the courts. Our next election will be decided in the courts wow. because they cheat and we don't cheat. Yeah. We've never cheated. We never cheat, he said, with posters of Richard Nixon behind him. The uh, Danish documentarian stuck with Roger Stone throughout uh, the election and then afterwards he, he tailed roger stone filmed him he was there uh, during president trump's speech on the ellipse on january 6 where stone was getting his protection from the proud boys and uh, later on stone was meeting uh, at the willard to stop the certification of the election you know all that stuff well it turned out that trump only pardons you once Roger Stone obviously wanted to be pardoned for what happened on January 6. He didn't get the pardon he wanted. Here is Donald, uh, here is Donald Trump's friend, Roger Stone, in the documentary talking to another friend about Donald Trump's election prospects for 2024 now that Roger Stone has not been pardoned again. I'm done with this president. I'm, support, I'm going to go public supporting impeachment. I have no choice. He has to go. He has to go. Run again. You'll get your fucking brains beat in. Very calm, peaceful Zen. Sweet man. Sweet man. Yes, he has no choice but to support impeachment. He has no choice. I have no choice because someone didn't pardon me for January 6th. Little toxic. Little toxic man there. And then the conversation in the car turns to Harvard's very own Jared Kushner. Well, Jared is a friend of Roger Stone's. One would think here is what Roger Stone had to say about Jared. Jared Kushner has an IQ of 70. Wow, I thought it was much lower. Jared Kushner has an IQ of 70. I didn't know he was that smart. He was obviously smart enough to get into Harvard all by himself. He has an IQ of 70. Why did his father have to donate $2 million to get Jared into Harvard? He's got an IQ of 70. That's higher than Ted Cruz's IQ, and Ted Cruz got into Harvard. Well, Roger Stone uh, lives in Miami, and he loves hanging out with smart people like Jared Kushner, who have an IQ of 70. So Roger Stone lives in Miami and, and Jared is planning to move to Miami. Here he is uh, planning a welcoming party uh, for Jared Kushner when he moves to Miami. He's coming to Miami. We will eject him from Miami very quickly. He'll be leaving very quick, very quickly, very quickly. He has 100 security guards. I'll have 5,000 security guards. You want to fight? Let's fight. Fuck you. Hmm. That doesn't seem like the kind of welcoming party Jared Kushner with an IQ of 70 deserves when he moves into, into Florida. I mean, he's a brilliant writer. He's a best-selling author. Did you know that Jared Kushner's a best-selling author? Because he's got, he's got an IQ of 70. His autobiography hit the New York Times bestseller list this year. And according to the Washington Post, the brilliant Jared Kushner came up with the idea of a Donald Trump political action committee purchasing, all they had to do was purchase $131,000 worth of Jared Kushner's books 
to make his autobiography a bestseller. That's pretty smart. All, I mean, all it took was $131,000 to make his book a bestseller. Anyway, here is Roger Stone talking to the Danish documentarian uh, about uh, somebody we all care about deeply. He's talking about Jared's wife. Who doesn't love? Who doesn't want to make love to Ivanka? except for Jared. Uh, the subject turned to Ivanka, and here are some choice words about President Donald Trump's girlfriend, Ivanka. Fuck you and your abortionist bitch daughter. Ooh, well, that's interesting. I don't understand why he would call Ivanka Trump an abortionist bitch doctor. That makes absolutely no sense. She's pro-life. Did you know that back in 2020, when her father was running for president, she came out and said she was against abortion. She said, I'm unapologetically pro-life. She said she was pro-life. Why would, why would Roger Stone say this? Fuck you and your abortionist bitch daughter. That makes absolutely, well, Maybe because after Roe v. Wade was overturned, I just remember this, Ivanka's friends from high school talked about those abortions she got. Like this famous tweet about Ivanka. This is from Lauren Santo Domingo, who knew Ivanka Trump uh, in high school. And she tweeted this right after, right after Roe v. Wade was overturned by Trump's Supreme Court. Laura, Lauren Santo Domingo writes, Ivanka Trump, you are noticeably quiet today. The high school friends who took you to get an abortion are not. Oh, maybe that explains why Roger Stone said, Fuck you and your abortionist bitch daughter. Well, a uh, lot of rage there for Roger Stone. He's angry. And after these highlights have begun to spread on the internet, Roger Stone suddenly had his old friend Donald Trump as an enemy. I mean, apparently Donald Trump doesn't like it when you talk this way about the woman he's in love with. Fuck you and your abortionist bitch daughter. Yeah. So, uh, turns out we got this all wrong we got this all wrong here is what really happened here's what really happened to roger stone the film crew the danish film crew it was a set up it was the deep dark state here's roger stone to explain what happened to him Documentary filmmakers who made this crap were financed by the Danish government through their intelligence agency. Yes, I will file a lawsuit because their latest video isn't even logical. It isn't logical. It makes no sense. Yes, Roger Stone is going to sue uh, the Danish Central Intelligence Agency for setting him up. He's going to sue because it was the Danish intelligence service. It was Denmark's deep, dark state setting him up. The Danish CIA spiked his glog and got him to say things he didn't mean. Things like... Fuck you and your abortionist bitch daughter. Uh, yeah. So, uh, please forgive me, is what Roger Stone is saying now to Air Trump, Hair Trump. I would never say those things about your beloved wife, Ivanka, mine Fuhrer. Well, Dr. Ronnie Johnson, Dr. Ronnie, is it Ronnie? Oh, it's Ronnie Jackson. Dr. Ronnie Jackson was President Trump's personal physician back in the White House. And Trump loved Dr. Ronnie because Dr. Ronnie protected the patient-doctor relationship by lying to everybody about Donald Trump's health, especially his weight. 
Dr. Uh, Dr. Ronnie would often add a few inches to the president's height. So when uh, he reported the president's weight, Donald Trump wouldn't be classified as morbidly obese, which he is. Uh, Dr. Ronnie Jackson prescribed uppers and downers to the White House staff. He liked to drink alcohol and would often wake up hotels pounding on the doors of female White House staffers whenever President Trump took the show on the road. And all that came out because President Trump appointed Ronnie Jackson to be Surgeon General of the United States. But when they found out that he had a temper, that he was abusive towards women, he drank too much, that he prescribed uppers and downers, uh, Congress said maybe he wouldn't be our first choice for Surgeon General of the United. Maybe this isn't the guy who should be lecturing us about eating properly. And so he had his nomination with, withdrawn. Uh, it's sad because Dr. Ronnie Jackson was a, a great doctor. He accidentally got his nose so far up Donald Trump's ass, his brain turned to boiled cabbage. And so when your brain turns to boiled cabbage, you have no choice but to turn to politics in Texas and become a congressman. Here is Dr. Dr. Ronnie Jackson uh, talking to uh, Joe Biden. Hey everybody, this is Congressman Ronnie Jackson from the great state of Texas. I have a message for the Biden administration. If you're thinking about taking our ARs, you can start here in Texas. On behalf of all the law-abiding gun owners in the state of Texas, I just wanna say, come and get it. That would be uh, Dr. Ronnie Jackson holding not one, but two AR-15s. A healer. He's a healer. Yes, that would be Ronnie Jackson. And apparently, with all that's going on in Texas, all the school shootings, he's not worried about gun control. The good doctor, his diagnosis is, don't worry about guns, it's drag queens yes that's who we have to worry about here in america it is the uh, drag queens here is a tweet that dr ronnie jackson uh put out uh here it is he put this out i believe it was yesterday he writes, it's just been discovered that our very own State Department is sending tens of thousands of dollars to fund drag shows overseas. What? This is just sick. This is how your tax dollars get spent under Biden. These degenerates must be defeated in November. That would be uh, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who got borked. He was going to sit, he was going to be our Surgeon General, but the Democrats borked Dr. Ronnie Jackson, all because he was drinking and yelling and screaming and effing and fighting and pounding on hotel room doors, and he likes his AR-50. If that doesn't sound like a Surgeon General to me, what does? Finally, they call him a Surgeon General. When have we ever had a general a surgeon general who knew how to fight, who, who had AR-15s. It's drag queens. That's the big problem. Wait, we have late breaking news. Here is Cynthia Potato Head in our Idaho Bureau. Take it away, Cynthia Potato Head in Idaho. Out of North Idaho, state lawmakers are set to propose a bill to ban drag performances at all public venues. That includes drag queen uh, story hour events where they read to kids at public libraries. The Idaho Family Policy Center says the bill will be introduced in January in the first few days of the session. Thank you so much, Cynthia Potato Head, in our Idaho Bureau, where thankfully the good people, the brilliant people of Idaho are going to take on the problem that's destroying this country, uh, drag queens. That's good. Ever get the idea that maybe men are toxic, filled with too much rage? 
Well, turns out so is Nancy Pelosi. I'm sorry to say this. I mean, what's the point of having women running our government if they're going to be just as toxic as men are, filled with the same toxic masculinity as men? Uh, well, you don't want to mess with Nancy Pelosi. You do not want to cross her. Here is the Speaker of the House with Andrea Mitchell on MSNBC yesterday. I have to warn you, the language includes violence and could be triggering for some people. So you may want to ask your kids to uh, step away from the screen. On the day of the riot, you said that if he led the rioters and came up to the hill, you would have punched him out. That's right. Uh, I don't even like to talk about him because it's really a tragedy for you, our country. But you did say you would have punched him I out. Punched Tell him me about out. your anger. I said I would have punched him out. I would have gone to jail and I would have been happy to do so. Would you have done for it? For our country. He wouldn't have had the courage to come to the Hill. He's all talk. <laughs> you know who she is? She's Joe Pesci. He's all talk. Yeah, he's all talk. You'd be late for your own fucking funeral. What the fuck are you looking at? Come on, make that coffee to go. Let's go. Come on. That's Nancy Pelosi. Well, she's tough. She's Pesci. She doesn't put up with it. You know, she's looking for a fight. It's all talk. <laughs> it's all talk. <laughs> wow. That is one scary, scary, toxic male masculinity inside of uh, our speaker. And this tough talk got Kimberly Gargoyle upset. She's a gentle soul. That's why she's marrying uh, the, the, the sweet and innocent Don Jr. Because Don Jr., he wouldn't hurt a fly. Zebras, giraffes, other assorted endangered species, sure, but not a fly. Here is Kimberly Gargoyle. Uh, going after our speaker for this violent language she's using. Andrea Mitchell fawning over Pelosi, Pelosi lying what's left of her face off about Biden's <laughs> accomplishments and the legislative achievements. I mean, it's a freak show. Yeah. I mean, Halloween's around the corner, but it's too much. It's Fright Night. Yeah, really. That, uh, that would be Kimberly gargoyle talking about halloween and interesting thing about halloween for kimberly she actually goes as herself on halloween that is kimberly gargoyle's costume for halloween uh and that got sweet innocent don jr going right he's angry about all this tough talk from nancy pelosi he took to social media to also attack Nancy Pelosi. And when you watch this, uh, pay attention. Kudos to John uh, Don Jr., who is suffering. Uh, he doesn't like to talk about it, but he suffers from lobster hands. It's a condition where your fingers open and close like lobster claws to the sound of your own voice. But Don Jr. doesn't allow a disability like that to keep him from speaking out. Pay attention to what Don Jr. is saying and ignore the condition, ignore his lobster hands. Pelosi is quoted as saying, I hope Trump comes. I'm going to punch him out. This is my moment. I've been waiting for this, for trespassing on Capitol grounds. I'm going to punch him out. And I'm going to go to jail and I'm going to be happy. Talking tough. Preaching violence, I was told that's a huge threat to democracy. So it turns out the only elected official actually calling for violence on January 6th was in fact Nancy Pelosi with, I'm going to punch him out. Mm. Yes, she was the only one talking violence on January 6th. I don't remember anybody saying anything about violence on January 6th, other than Nancy Pelosi wanting to punch out Donald Trump. Very sweet man, Don Jr. I hope those uh, lobster hands, I hope that condition gets cured. It's very sad. Uh, it happens uh, in, your, uh, in your early 40s to uh, people addicted to Adderall, cocaine, and uh, 
Anyway, Don Jr. has a younger brother, and his name is Eric, Eric Trump. And Eric isn't violent, not at all, like Don Jr. He's not violent. He knows it's a dangerous world out there, and that's why Eric is so grateful the Secret Service continues to protect his father and the Trump family when they're when they were in the White House and now when they're out of the White House. That's right. The, the Secret Service is still protecting this treasure, the Trump family, this national sacred treasure. And the Trumps, like all of us, are grateful for the Secret Service protecting the Trump family. Here is Eric Trump three years ago talking about how grateful he is and the Trumps are for the Secret Service's protection. If my father travels, people, they stay at our properties for free, meaning it's like, you know, cost for housekeeping effectively because you actually have to legally charge government something. Um, so everywhere that, that he goes, if he stays at one of his places, the government actually spends, I mean, it, it saves a fortune because if they were to go to a hotel across the street, they'd be charging 500 bucks a night, whereas, you know, we charge them like, you know, 50 bucks. Isn't that great? They only charge the Secret Service 50 bucks a night for a hotel at, at the world famous, you know, the world famous Trump Hotel, because the Trump family loves the Secret Service so much. And they're so grateful they only charge the Secret Service $50 to stay at the Trump Hotel. Uh, that's great, except he's lying. Yes, he's lying. The House Oversight Committee reported this week that the Trumps were so grateful for Secret Service protection that they charged the Secret Service nearly $1,200 a night to stay inside the Trump hotels. That might seem expensive, but it also includes free bed bugs. That's right, free bed bugs whenever you stay at a Trump hotel. What a great family. What a great family. I like them. They're sweet. You know who else is sweet? Very sweet man. Very sweet man. James Corden. Who, who doesn't laugh at James Corden? You know, except for me. But I love James Corden. I, I you know, I watch him every night. He's on, I think it's 7 p.m. on CBS, right? Every night at 7 or 12, 30, I don't know, but he's a nice guy. And that's what I'm looking for in comedy. I have to be sure the person making me laugh is nice and kind. And I know that James Corden is a sweet, sweet fella. He just wants to have a good time. His comedy isn't mean. That's what I love about Jay. Who wants cruelty in their comedy? And James Corden doesn't need to be mean doing comedy because he gets to be mean in real life. Yes, it turns out James Corden is a bully. He's a bully. The owner of a popular restaurant here in New York took to social media and said they were banning, they were banning poor James Corden from the restaurant because sweet James Corden yelled at the staff at this restaurant when he found a hair in his salad. And even worse, he found an egg white in his wife's egg yolk omelet. That's a healthy meal, an egg yolk omelet. Hmm. That's really good. That's good. That I think Dr. Uh, Ronnie Jackson prescribed uh, egg yolk omelets for Donald Trump's heart. And that's where uh, the Cordons got that idea. Egg yolk omelets. The owner of the restaurant said he's been in the restaurant business for 50 years and never saw anyone lay into his staff the way sweet lovable and cuddly James Corden did. Wow. Hard to believe a comedian who is so sweet on television would be an abusive bully when the cameras aren't rolling. Hard to believe. Interesting. 
Next, you're going to tell me that Harvey Weinstein is a rapist, which he is. Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein, is on trial once again for rape, this time in Los Angeles. He's already serving time uh, for the rapes he committed in New York, some of the rapes he committed in New York, but he's appealing those, those convictions and he could end up like Bill Cosby getting released. So the anti-rape people here in America, uh, they're hoping that Harvey Weinstein Stein uh, is found guilty in this Los Angeles trial as well. And Harvey Weinstein's lawyers are attacking the accuser. And her name is Jennifer Seibel. Uh, it's now Jennifer Seibel Newsom. Weinstein's lawyers uh, are saying she's a, a grifter. They want to know uh, that if Weinstein really raped her the way she claims, then why did she call email? Why did she email Harvey Weinstein two years later for advice on how to handle a crisis for her then boyfriend and then mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom? Well, it turns out uh, Gavin Newsom uh, was uh, dating his soon-to-be wife, and she loved Gavin Newsom, but he had a problem that she needed help with. So she apparently emailed Harvey Weinstein because she was dating somebody who was guilty of adultery. Uh, Gavin Newsom was sleeping with the wife of his campaign manager. And that kind of scandal doesn't sit well with voters. That's the Harvey Weinstein trial. So we're really getting to the bottom of, uh, of the rapes that he committed. This is what his lawyers are entering into evidence. The fact that Gavin Newsom committed adultery and his wife, his soon to be wife contacted Harvey Weinstein uh, two years after the rape for advice on how to handle Gavin Newsom's uh, adultery problem. Therefore, Harvey Weinstein did not rape her. Case dismissed, lawyers. By the way, Gavin uh, Newsom, uh, well, while he was mayor uh, of San Francisco when all this was going on, he had just divorced his first wife, and that would be Kimberly Gargoyle, who soon to be father-in-law, would often hang out with people in show business, like uh, this guy. Here's uh, Donald Trump hanging, Melania, and some show, who's the showbiz guy he's hanging? Oh, that would be Harvey Weinstein. Okay, see, I don't like Donald Trump, and that's why I didn't vote for uh, Donald Trump, because uh, he hangs out with the wrong people. I voted in 2016 for Hillary. Hillary was a good judge of character. She only hung out with people who were liberals, were Democrats, like this guy. This, this guy donated uh, some money to her campaign, and here she is uh, going through his uh, pockets to see if he has. Who is that guy? Oh, that's Harvey Weinstein. Well, you see, that's why she lost. She hung out with Harvey Weinstein. She's a bad judge of character. That's why she didn't win the presidency. Unlike her husband, Bill. You see, Bill was elected president and then reelected because he was a good judge of character. And he hung out with, he didn't hang out with show business people. He hung out with people uh, from Harvard. Like this guy, he's flying with this, who's this Harvard guy? Oh, Jeffrey Epstein. That would be Jeffrey Epstein, who I don't believe actually went to Harvard, but he donated uh money to harvard and you get uh, a sweatshirt that says harvard on it and alan dershowitz harvard professor comes to your house in new york and gets a massage from a woman who may or may not be underaged that's if you donate a couple million to harvard so if you have some spare cash sitting around you might want to donate to harvard it's well worth it get the harvard sweatshirt 
and you get to have Alan Dershowitz come to your mansion and get a massage from a woman who may or may not be underaged. Uh, there's what, what, who, there's Donald Trump again. Who's he hanging out with? Who's that guy? That's Melania and Donald Trump. I've, I, who is the guy? Oh, that's Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, Donald Trump hung out with Jeffrey Epstein? That doesn't seem right. Who else did he hang out with? Who's this guy? That's a, a picture at Mar-a-Lago. Oh, Jeffrey Epstein. Hmm, sounds like Donald Trump hangs out with uh, bad people. People who uh, didn't go to Harvard. Donald Trump hangs out with bad people. Donald Trump was deposed yesterday in the defamation case brought against him by journalist E. Jean Carroll, who says Trump raped her in the 1990s. After the deposition, Trump called her a lunatic, said he was innocent, and once again said she wasn't my type. She's not my type. I mean, look at her. I rape much hotter women. One of my favorite directors of all time is the great Ivan Reitman. No, nobody better when coming to, to do comedy. Uh, but we all know that he was a bit of a bully. Ivan Reit, Reitman is the director. Uh, he was a bully. And uh, more, than he, more than a bully, it turns out Ivan Reitman is also dead. He's dead. Actress Anna Faris this week described what it was like working on the set with comedy director Ivan Reitman. Well, one of my hardest film experiences was with Ivan Reitman. Yeah. I mean, the idea of attempting to make a comedy under this, like, reign of terror he was a yeller. He would bring down somebody every day. That's and so my hard. first day, it was me. And then he like went behind the camera. But then later, he slapped my ass too. That was a weird moment. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Ivan Reitman was unavailable for comment because he is dead. Okay, who doesn't love that 70s show other than, than me? Who doesn't love that 70s show? I love that 70s show. Who doesn't love that 70s show? Who doesn't love Danny Masterson? Me, me. I don't love Danny Masterson. Uh, I don't know Danny Masterson. I have no idea who he is. All I know is he was one of the stars of that 70s show and he is a Scientologist on trial this week for rape. The trial is going on right now, and Masterson is accused of raping another Scientologist who, in testimony, says she was told not to go to the police by the Church of Scientology. The woman was threatened by the religion, the religious leaders. They said, uh, if you go to the police, you'll never see your parents again. Her parents also happened to be Scientologists. So she didn't report it to the police, and then she did report it to the police, and then she signed a non-disclosure, and uh, these non-disclosures, something like four, she was paid $400,000 not to disclose the rape, and uh, it's going on right now. You should pay attention to it. It gives you insight into the Church of Scientology, and Hollywood, Hollywood lawyers like uh, this guy named Singer, who uh, big big mover and shaker in Hollywood, great lawyer, ranges the non-disclosure agreements for people accused of rape. Hey, remember the movie Crash? Do you remember Crash? Great movie if you know nothing about film. Uh, and it was directed by Paul Haggis. And turns out Paul Haggis is also a Scientologist. Excuse me, I got that wrong. He's an ex-Scientologist. And he too is on trial for rape uh, this week. 
he uh, cooperated with the people who made the HBO documentary Going Clear, which was pretty much an indictment of sci Scientology. And he is a, uh, an enemy of Scientology. He quit the Church of Scientology. He claims uh, that he had consensual sex with this woman and that the rape charge is retaliation for his speaking out vociferously against Scientology. Another trial that you might want to pay attention to, kind of interesting. Uh, another trial that's going on this week is Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey is not a Scientologist. He is gay, and he's been accused of sexually assaulting an underaged actor named Anthony Rapp when Anthony was underage. The trial took place this week, and the jury is deliberating while we speak. During testimony, a tearful Kevin Spacey said that he was afraid to come out of the closet. He waited years to come out of the closet because his father was a neo-Nazi white supremacist. That's not just a neo-Nazi, but also a white supremacist. That's one thing to be a neo-Nazi, Kevin, but your, your father is also a white supremacist. It's very rare when a neo-Nazi is also a uh, white supremacist. That's interesting. So that, that was like a double gut punch to have a father who's a neo-Nazi and a white supremacist. That is just very unlucky. Richard Dreyfus is an actor and uh, was working on a movie with Kevin Spacey a few years ago. They were in a hotel room together and Richard Dreyfus's son accused Kevin Spacey in public of fondling him while he sat next to Kevin Spacey while Richard and Kevin Spacey were working on a script together. Dreyfus's son said Kevin Spacey used his power to fondle Richard Dreyfus's son in front of Richard Dreyfus, knowing the son would be too frightened to say anything. Interesting. Meanwhile, Dreyfus's other son says he saw Bill Murray hurl a paperweight at Richard Dreyfus's face on the set of one of my favorite movies, What About Bob? You know, maybe it's not a good idea to bring Richard Dreyfus's sons to work with you. Bad things seem, seem to happen. Uh, that would be uh, Richard Dreyfus, And apparently the set of What About Bob, they needed a real psychiatrist on that set. Apparently, Bill Murray was incredibly abusive towards Richard Dreyfus. got in his face. They had a higher security to protect. Disney made this movie. They had a higher security to protect Richard Dreyfus from Bill Murray. And uh, somehow Richard Dreyfus survived it. Uh, very, uh, must have been very difficult for Richard Dreyfus to put up with that abusive behavior. Oop. L.A. writer says Richard Dreyfus sexually harassed and exposed himself to her in the 1980s. Hmm. On the set of What About Bob was a producer named Laura Siskin. Bill Murray allegedly threw her into the water and broke her glasses and was... Uh, physically and verbally abusive towards the producer, Laura Siskin. She can't comment on this because she's now dead. Other reports about Bill Murray's behavior come to us from Seth Green. The actor Seth Green says that when he was about eight years old, he had a bit part on Saturday Night Live and Bill Murray uh, asked him to move. Uh, he was sitting on the couch. Bill Murray asked him to move. Seth Green, at the age of eight, refused to move. They were in the green room, so Bill Murray grabbed him by the ankles and dropped him inside a uh, 
garbage bin. That's according to Seth Green. Also, uh, friends of Solange Knowles, the singer, say that they watched as Bill Murray uh, kind of physically assaulted uh, Solange Knowles after her performance on Saturday Night Live. This is a tweet from one of her friends who writes, your yearly reminder that I saw Bill Murray put both his hands into Solange's scalp after asking her three times if her hair was a wig or not. Uh, Lucy Liu starred with Bill Murray on the movie, on the movie uh, Charlie's Angels, great movie. And we've known for at least a decade that Lucy Liu was not happy with the way Bill Murray treated her on the set. Lucy Liu has opened up and talked about this and uh, she says she stood up for herself and she doesn't regret it. She hasn't gone into specifics as to what exactly uh, Bill Murray said or threatened to do, but uh, apparently it wasn't good. Gina Davis has a new book out where she talks about working on a movie with Bill Murray. She says that alone in a hotel room, he touched her inappropriately, wanted to give her a massage. And then when she resisted the next day, he was uh, verbally abusive on the set with her. That would be Gina Davis. And that would be Bill Murray, whose career, I don't know, might be dead. Yes, that is Bill Murray. Uh, makes a lot of money for people, right? His movies gross billions, right? People look the other way. You can, you know, if one person says it, it's hard to believe. But when people keep saying it about Bill Murray, uh, it's not so, not so difficult to believe this about Bill Murray. And uh, it's sad. It's sad that people were treated this way by Bill Murray and that he was able to get away with it for decades all because he made a lot of money for Hollywood. Hard to believe that in Hollywood, they only care about money. They don't care about the well-being of the people who work for the stars or work with the stars. They only care about the money. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Do me a favor and subscribe to this show wherever you're listening to it. It helps if you subscribe. Give us uh, a thumbs up and write a nice review. If you could, subscribe to this show. If you're listening to us right now on YouTube, please subscribe to the show and tell your friends about it. Ah, that is some good water. Brian Kemp is the governor of Georgia, and he's running for re-election against a woman named Stacey Abrams. Uh, I don't know who, from the name Stacey Abrams, I'm going to assume that she was born in Long Island and she's Jewish. She's a I, I, the name, I think I dated in high school a, a Jewish girl named Stacey Abrams. And I guess she moved to Georgia and she's running as a Democrat against Brian Kemp. And for some reason, she's not winning in the polls. There was a debate this week and she was asked an interesting question. Uh, here it is. Ms. Abrams, public opinion polls in our state show support for the right to abortion, Medicaid expansion, and banning assault weapons. You are on the side of public opinion in each of these issues, yet you are behind in almost every poll. Why? Hmm, that's a good question. Very interesting question. Stacey Abrams, Democrat, uh, the positions that she has the people from Georgia agree with, right? Abortion, uh, guns, they agree with her in everything. 
And yet, for some reason, she's losing in the polls. It just makes no sense to me. Uh, I don't know. What, 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 uh, what does she look like? Does, does anybody have a picture of her somewhere? Where is, what does Stacey Abrams look like? That makes no sense to me. To me. Why would people in Georgia agree? I'm looking at a picture of Stacey Abrams. Uh, why, if you agree with everything she stands for, Georgia, what is it about her where you just can't bring yourself to vote for her, Georgia? What, what is it? Interesting. Oh, you know what? Stacey Abrams is not a, uh, a white Jewish girl from Long Island. She's a black woman. Uh, hmm. I wonder if that has anything to do with her not polling so well in Georgia. I always think of the state of Georgia as being so advanced, especially after their governor has scrubbed the voting rolls of African Americans, which is how he got elected in the first place. Brian Kemp was the Secretary of State in Georgia four years ago, and before he ran for governor, and he knew he was running against African American Stacey Abrams, he scrubbed the voter rolls of black people. Hard for an African American woman to run for office, even though they're so clearly better than the white man they're up against. Which brings me to the race in Florida. We have an interesting Senate race going on. Marco Rubio is running for re-election against the brilliant Congresswoman Val Demings. And she's not going to win. She's not going to win because Governor DeSantis, after the, the hurricane, he's made it impossible for black people to vote again. He's rounding up black people who have uh, who did time in prison and then were told they could vote and then they voted. And now they're being arrested for voting, even though the state of Florida set them up by telling them they could vote. After the hurricane, he's making it impossible for black people to vote in Florida. That's Ron DeSantis, the worst of the worst, the worst of the worst. Uh, Congresswoman Val Demings, the best of the best. She kind of knows she's going to lose. So why not talk to this piece of shit, Marco Rubio, the way he deserves to be talked to? This is... Uh, this is what happened during their debate earlier this week. Of course, the senator who has never run anything at all but his mouth would know nothing about helping people and being there for people when they are in trouble. That was how she answered the question about inflation. <laughs> what are you going to do about inflation? Wait, it gets worse. Uh, I don't know if you know this about Marco Rubio, but he's a liar. Well, he's a Republican, and Republicans can't get elected unless they lie. And we rarely call them out. I mean, on this show we do, but, in, you know, it's just impolite for people to call their opponent a liar. That's not true. I know the senator, look, and, and I'm really disappointed in you, Marco Rubio, because I, don't, I think there was a time when you did not lie in order to win. I don't know what happened to you. You know that is not true. Hmm. That's nice. That's sweet. The next question was on voter suppression, which is notorious in the South, especially Florida. Marco Rubio is against drop boxes. You know, the idea that you fill out your absentee ballot and then you go to a drop box and, and vote. You know, a lot of old people a lot of poor people can't make it to a, a, a voting precinct. So, you know, civilized nations, civilized states have drop boxes where you can just drop your ballot into the drop box. But Marco Rubio says it's not a good idea. That's a method of voting that doesn't advantage one group or another. There's danger involved in drop boxes. 
People need to think about it. Okay, imagine someone decides, oh, there's a drop box. I'm just going to put some explosive in it and blow it up and burn all of those ballots, and now those votes don't count at all. My God, I never thought about that. There's danger involved in drop boxes. There's danger involved in drop boxes, which means mailboxes could also... We need to get rid of mailboxes. We need to just get rid of boxes. We need to get rid of trash receptacles. People can drop bombs in anything that is a box. We need to get rid of all boxes because... There's danger involved in drop boxes. I, I didn't know that. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Marco Rubio, for keeping us safe. Then the subject turned to guns. You know, there are a little problem with guns. Stand your ground. Castle Doctrine, Parkland, Pulse Nightclub in Florida. And uh, Congresswoman Val Demings uh, was very gentle. This is a touchy subject, and she handled it very delicately. He thought he would get a pass for the mass shootings that we've had in our state and doing nothing significant to do anything about it. Your primary responsibility, Senator, is to protect the safety of the people. Hmm. Wow. And uh, she's saying that he didn't keep the people safe, that he's not passing any meaningful gun control legislation. And then she politely added, How long will you watch people being gunned down in first grade, fourth grade, high school, college, church, synagogue, a grocery store, a movie theater, a mall, and a nightclub? Congresswoman, and do nothing. That is time. I can't believe she would talk that way to a United States senator like Marco Rubio. And, and he defended himself. And he, he explained why gun control legislation doesn't work. Represent. We just passed the bill they wanted, and there was a shooting a week later, and a, a week after that. Yeah, that makes... Why pass gun control legislation if you pass these bills and there's a shooting the next day? Uh, Reverend Val Demings... Reverend, well, she kind of a reverend. Representative Val Demings uh, explained maybe why... Uh, Marco Rubio is completely full of shit. Why don't we just stop arresting are, murderers? Are, the only people that we can't follow these laws are law-abiding citizens. A rapist, a robber. Let me replay that one again, because of this piece of shit Marco Rubio is saying, gun control legislation doesn't work. We passed it, and there was a shooting, and then another one. And she, then he, she talks over him and says, yeah, then why don't we just, you know, we, we've outlawed murder and there's still murder. We've outlawed rape. There's still rape. Why don't we just legalize all here? Listen to Congresswoman Val Demings. You know, the people who are. Why don't we just stop work. arresting and murderers? Are, the only people that follow these laws are law abiding citizens. Are rapists, a rapist, a robber. Send her money if you don't live in uh, Florida. Send her money. Vote for her, please. Vote for Congresswoman Val Demings. She's not perfect, but uh, she's saying what needs to be said to pieces of shit like Marco Rubio. You know, the people who are the families of victims of gun violence just heard that, and they're asking themselves, what in the hell did he just say? Senator, you used the, the Pulse nightclub shooting as your inspiration to run again for the Senate in 2016. Parkland, uh, Pulse is in my district. And yet, you've done nothing, nothing to help address gun violence and get dangerous weapons out of the hands of dangerous people. Florida, after Parkland, after you made promises that you had no intentions on keeping to the parents of Parkland, Florida passed legislation raising the age to have an assault weapon, passed red flag laws that we've seen 7,000 plus instances where they've been used now. To, our primary responsibility is the safety of Floridians. And Senator, 24 years, 
in elected office and you have not yet risen to that occasion. And then when asked about it, you say something that makes no sense. All right, Congressman, thank you. And yeah, you would think she'd be leading in the polls and she isn't. Why? Why would Florida, why would Floridians not love her? And I wonder what it is. What could it be? What does she look like? I don't have a picture. Uh, what could it be about Congresswoman Val Demings that uh, makes uh, Marco Rubio the likely winner? Um, very interesting. Well, there's a, another race going on in Wisconsin. The detestable Senator Ron Johnson, Republican, racist, is running for his third term in Wisconsin against Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. And Ron Johnson has called Mandela Barnes un-American, says he hates America. Uh, Mandela Barnes is named Mandela. His parents named him after Mandela. Mandela Barnes is an African-American, and Ron Johnson has been exploiting it, accusing black people of being takers, not working hard. And Senator Ron Johnson is a Republican. He's wealthy, and he calls himself a successful businessman. So yes, has yeah. the lieutenant governor ever created a job? I've created hundreds of jobs. Wow, he's created hundreds of jobs. I didn't know that. I know that he's a multi, multi-millionaire. Uh, and then Mandela Barnes, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, explained how Senator Ron Johnson created all those jobs. And look, the biggest uh, achievement in business was Ron Johnson saying, I do. He married into his business. He didn't start that from the ground up. All right. Um, again, we're, it, again, we'll get I, I to get ping pong here, but you yeah. over 30 seconds. yes, yeah. So uh, 30 seconds. First of all, I'm proud of my accomplishments. You have no idea how hard it is to make my wife happy. I'm proud of my accomplishments. Uh, I have an idea of what those jobs he created are now. Well, then the subject turned to gun violence. Ron Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson, Republican, is adamantly opposed to gun control. And he was asked, what do you say to the families of loved ones who, uh, who's, who lost somebody to gun violence? Obviously, I'd ex express my sincere sympathy first. I would talk about the overall macro solution, which is renewed faith, stronger families, and more supportive communities. But then you start drilling down, one thing you have to do is you have to keep violent criminals in jail. And you have to support law enforcement. Unfortunately, you know, we have an administration in Wisconsin right now that their goal was to reduce the prison population by 50%. Yes, we need to lock up more people. That's what we need to do. That's how you solve gun violence, lock up more people. Even though the vast majority of people behind bars never had a trial. They just plea out and are just locked up. Uh, but we need to lock up more people and we need to trust the police. That's his solution to gun violence. He supports the police. Like any good Republican, he supports the police. He believes in law and order except when it comes to the real police, the ones who can lock up white people. In, in response to the wild charge of uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, the FBI set me up with a, corrupt, with a corrupt briefing and then leaked that to smear me. I am... No, I mean, right, let's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I mean, I, right. He is referring to corruption with the FBI, which I've been trying to uncover and expose. Yes, we're supposed to give blind support to the police, but not the FBI because they're corrupt. They set me up and we have to defund the, the FBI, but not the police. Uh, 
we just need to go after the FBI because the FBI, they're accountants with guns. That's who the FBI is. They're accountants with guns and Republicans do not like accountants with guns. That's why Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, during her debate with Marcus Flower was called out by Marcus Flower. She claims she supports the blue, but not the FBI. Oh, Congresswoman no, we Green, let, we find you buy the FBI three. shirts and hats that you're selling, Let's making go money to off of? Yes, three. the FBI that is targeting We're going to cut their mic like, in just a minute because that can... Yes, the FBI. <laughs> and uh, so what are the issues? It would seem to me the, the, the number one issue in America is wages. People are worried about not being able to make rent to pay their bills. And the subject of minimum wage came up during the debate in Wisconsin. Ron Johnson is against raising the minimum wage. Minimum wage has not gone up since 2009. In Wisconsin, our minimum wage is still the federal minimum wage of $7.25. It is shameful. Since 2014, we've been supporting a $15 minimum wage. And for the most, one of the most wealthy members of Congress to sit and say that Congress shouldn't set a standard of living and raising the minimum wage is the frustration that so many people have in this country. It's why people are tuned out of, of politics, because they feel like nobody's looking out for them. And that's because Ron Johnson is in the United States Senate not looking out for us. You know, the Republicans always opposed the minimum wage. They were always against the minimum wage. And their goal was to get rid of it. But you can't run against the minimum wage. Who in their right mind would say they're against the minimum wage, right? So you do what the Republicans are doing. You make sure that we go 10 years without raising the minimum wage. Inflation kicks in like it is now. And we don't have a minimum wage. If you tell me the minimum wage is $7 and some change an hour, there's no minimum wage. There's absolutely no minimum wage. Republicans aren't going to say they're against the minimum wage. They're just, they're not going to admit that uh, unless you're Herschel Walker. Here is Herschel Walker during the debate last week in Georgia being asked about raising the minimum wage by a simple showing of hands. Raise your hand if you support a federal minimum wage. Okay, well, Mr. Walker, you did not raise your hand. So I'd like to ask you, first of all, why not? And what would you do to help struggling Georgians? Well, when you said a federal, um, I think right now, and he said that I want the federal government. No, he wants the federal government to run your life. Right now, I think you have to work with different corporations and see just where they can pay. There are some companies right now, and he should know this, after getting the All-Star game moved out of Atlanta, they destroyed a lot of small businesses. So those small businesses couldn't pay $15, $20 an hour. So they have to pay what they're capable of paying. So to mandate a federal, uh, federal uh, fee that they have to pay hourly wage, no, I couldn't, I couldn't approve that. Yeah. he accidentally said the thing you're not supposed to say, which is, I'm against a minimum wage. One of the reasons he didn't show up for the second debate, uh, he spilled the beans. He revealed what the Republicans really want to do. Get rid of the minimum wage, get rid of Medicare, get rid of Medicaid, get rid of Social Security. That's who the Republicans are. The head of the RNC, head of the Republican National Committee, is Ronna McDaniel. She's a cousin of Mitt Romney, and she thinks the Republicans are going to win. They're going to win the House. They're going to win the Senate because the Democrats haven't picked the right issues. Here is what Ronna McDaniel, head of the RNC, said earlier this week about why she thinks the Republicans are going to win. The Democrats want to talk about abortion mm -hmm. or January 6th, issues that really aren't resonating with voters. It's not something you're waking up thinking about every day. And so if we stay on message and we talk about the economy and crime, crime is a big yep. issue, especially in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, we'll win. 
you know, it's uh, interesting. The Republicans should not be doing so well in the polls. It looks like they've got the House. It looks like Ron Johnson is going to beat Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin. It looks like the Democrats will be lucky if they keep the Senate. They should be doing better. Uh, the Republicans are running on absolute bullshit and fear. The Democrats are stronger on crime. They're stronger on the economy. They're stronger on taxes. They're stronger on inflation. And yet uh, they're losing to the Republicans. They're going to lose to the Republicans. And even if the Republicans lose, it doesn't matter. Here is Carrie Lake. She is the Republican candidate for governor of Arizona. It doesn't matter anymore if the Democrats put together a winning message and actually win. Let's look forward then. Can we talk Will about you the accept the results of the election in your election? Will you accept Can the we results? talk about the issues? I came on here thinking we were going to talk about the issues facing Arizonans right now. We did. And you've spent the entirety of this time talking about 2020. I think you're stuck on 2020. I, I really do. I would. I have interviewed I many, many Republicans and haven't even mentioned it. I only did with you because this is a big thing that you are running on. Let's look ahead. Dana, and let's Dana, let's talk I'm about Dana. the 2022 election. Will you accept the results of your election, Miss Lake? I'm. I'm running against a twice convicted racist. I'm Katie Hobbs. My question is, will you accept the results of your election in November? I'm going to win the election and I will accept that result. If you lose, will you accept that? I'm going to win the election and I will accept that result. Uh, yeah, I think Eric Trump said it best. I think he's fundamentally changed a party. It's no longer the Republican Party. It's the Trump Party. Yes, it is. And you know what? I'm fucking furious and I don't fucking care anymore. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Professor Mike Steinel. There we go. Well, what's going on here? All right. We're having some technical. There, we're back. Okay. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. And he will be with us on Monday. Grace Jackson will be with us in a little while. She's going to talk about the conference, the Chinese, uh, the 20th Communist Party conference in China this week. Let's now go to Great Britain, where Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling is standing by. He is a royal watcher as well as a good friend of King Charles. He lives next door to Sandringham in East Anglia. Welcome there, Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling. Are you there? Salutations, David. How are we this evening? 
Uh, very good. It's good to hear your voice, Sir Arthur. Yeah. Uh, things have settled. It feels like in Great Britain, things are settling down. King Charles, uh, yeah. a month or two into his reign, very calm. Uh, no, no, uh, no big news coming out of Great Britain. Uh, he rang me today, cackling wildly for about ten minutes. I couldn't get a word out of him. I, I put the phone down. Then he rang me again about half an hour later, cackling, cackling, cackling wildly again. I can't even say the word. But uh, he is he was slightly deranged. Then, of course. Uh, so what would, John, be, what would be making King Charles laugh so hard today? It's the idea of democracy. Hmm. Yes. It's a little in joke between us, uh, aristocrats. It's a little bit of fun we have with the public. Nah. So he's cackling inanely at the whole thing, yes. So yeah. apparently there was a dust up in the Conservative Party today and yesterday. Yeah, it's the usual roundabout of shit coming from that lot. There, there was Craven as the other bunch. Right. Uh, but- the, uh, the upshot I gather is. Uh, um well for me nothing really will change much like the poor right so what what happened you 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 had a home secretary ms braverman and and yes. and she w- she was asked to leave and then today you know she's called suella and for a long time i shit thee not I thought she was from the deep south of America. Well, apparently it's one name. And um, imagine my surprise when I turned on the TV and found a lady of a southern hemispheric hue. Right. Mm-hmm. So, Suella Braverman. That, that, that Sounds like a knight with that name. Braverman. Braver, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Br- Braverman. Raven. Yes. And so she was home secretary, as I understand it. That's in turn, that's security that makes people feel yes. safe, right? Yes. The pretense of uh, keeping this, the, the populace secure. Right. Yes. And, and how good a job could she have possibly done if she couldn't even keep her job secure? I think she would have been a fantastic home secretary. There's nothing better than we colonialists. I can't even say the word. It's we colonialists like than turning brown people against brown people. And she wasn't a fan of immigrants. So, yes, that was a perfect, perfect score. Right. That's that's interesting. uh, She is against bringing more people into Great Britain, but she herself comes from i believe right or is she she, or is she landed gentry well she's landed in gentry now i suppose as a a member of the cabinet at one point she will be very much rewarded later in life so yes much like liz truss who after four weeks of doing sod all uh I'm looking at. I'm looking at, I'm looking at. The I'm looking at Suella Braverman. So is she a descendant of like the Norman conquests? Is that why she's yes. immigration? A man called Norman, very much conquested one of her ancestors, as I expect. I see. Okay. Um, so she's anti-immigrant. That's that's very. You were talking about yeah. Liz Truss. Yes. Delectable lady. Uh, right. She's thick as two short planks, but. Uh, I'm sorry? She's blonde. So that's, uh, she, she's as thick as two short planks, but uh, she's blonde, which is uh, par for the course. Mm-hmm. And smart? No, not at all smart. We don't like uh, politicians smart. Uh, cunning, maybe. Cunning, but not smart. No, no, no discernible intelligence. Yeah, if they had any intelligence, they would be in the aristocracy. Right. Is Boris coming back? Do you think? Was she set up by Boris Johnson to to become the leader of the Conservative Party because he knew she was incompetent? It's beginning to look a little bit like that. Yes, I don't mind Boris. He was a good lad as a child. 
uh, quite quite competitive. Um, yeah, so I I think Boris may come back. Who knows? But uh, that's one in the eye because he's a member of Valis, descended from aristocracy. I wouldn't consider him aristocratic now. Right, bit of a champion of the people, which is not on at all. Don't want any of that stuff. And so when you were talking to King Charles, say while he was laughing, he was laughing yes. at what was going on in, in Parliament today. Yes, simply cackling, cackling inanely each time I picked up the phone. Wild rabbit cackling. However, I've since gleaned uh, that whilst on the phone, his uh, delectable wife uh, was tickling his toes while uh, while he was on the phone, which is a strange practice. As, uh, as you may remember, his brother Andrew used to have his toes sucked for pleasure. Yes. And Charles goes, Charles goes for the tickle. Right. He's a tickler. And, and he married a toe sucker. She was, I remember she was photographed. It rhymes, it rhymes with toe sucker, yes. <laughs> at least the, at least one part of it. The less said about that, the better, David. Yes, yeah, I, I remember. One so. may, I may find myself in uh, sticky mud if I pursue that endeavor. Yes, I remember Sarah Ferguson sucking the toes of some Texas oil executive in in the nineties. So, yes, well, she's quite a ravenous lady. She, she, uh, not quite dim. She doesn't know when it's dinner time, or you know, the other. So, so she's. She what in fact she thought she was doing was uh, tucking into a meal, which is a uh, it's startling for the recipient. Yes. How do you suck? By the way, you have one tooth. You have a, a front. I have one tooth. Yeah, one real tooth. I have a number of prefabricated teeth, but one I have. I, I don't want to pull the final one out. You see, it's been mm-hmm. like going bald, but in the, in the in the in the mouth, you cling on to that tooth. I've seen yes. pictures of you, though, where you, where you only smile with one tooth, that one tooth. Well, uh, I don't know where you've seen these pictures, Dave, because there, there is a dis, there's, a dis, there's a disclaimer amongst anybody within my circle that those pictures should not be seen. Okay. Um, you may want to give up your sources, old bean. All right, I'll be careful. How is your mother today? How is she feeling? Uh, she's still feeling rather hard. Mm-hmm. Very firm. Um, no smell today. I've been using her to... She's a roughly the same size as Liz Truss, so I've been using her as a model for, uh, for the eventual stuffing of Liz. Oh, wait. Um, so, yes. So I, 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 I smeared her in Vaseline and covered her in uh, papier-mâché and uh, cracked her open and made a little model out of the uh, the, the mold and I've uh, been stuffing it from Arsenal to Beak and uh, seems to be working a treat. So when the inevitable day comes, at least trust needs to be stuffed. I will be right there stuffing away, yes. Your mother is the same size, dress size, as Liz Truss. Your mother, h- how old is she now? Oh, she be, well, 110, uh, yes, yeah, still 110, yes. Still 110. 110. Still. And she can break a swan with a blow of her nose, yes. Right, she was, 100 and, she was 110 two years ago as well. Yeah, that's because that's, that's pretty much when she died, and she's. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure we can keep on with the aging process once dead. I see. I think that, that mm-hmm. I think that's the, the discernible time when that ends. Yes. Right. At that age, the bones become brittle. Uh, yes. What What kind of diet do you have, Ron? Uh, creosote. Merely smearing creosote. She she's dead, David. One mm-hmm. cannot imbibe anything and digest it and extricate it. So she's very much she's dead, David. I, I can't reiterate this enough. I mean, it's been she's, a few weeks now. She's very much dead. And she sits. I can't really feel it. And she spent the day today in in your bedroom or the solarium. Where does she spend most she, of? The- 
Well, after the old uh, making the mold for Liz Truss's eventual stuffing, uh, we went out and uh, I've made a replica uh, about four times her size for the upcoming festivities on uh, Guy Fawkes night. She's going to be, there's going to be a Liz Truss guy on my fire. Mm hmm. Yes. Okay. In, at that age, uh, 110, it must be tough for her to get around, right? It's tough, full stop. She, she, she's, she's very tough. Yes. She's, like I say, I'm, I'm going to reiterate this, David. She's covered in creosote. So, oh, so to get around, so yes. Um, so moving to get around, 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 you know, so she's quite light, even though she's covered in a vast array of uh, garments every now and again and covered in creosote. She she's dried out somewhat, so she's very light. All the fluids have long since dripped away, and so she's not as active as she was, uh, say, twenty years ago. That's sad to see that happen. She's actually more active, but it's a, it's more of a biological fizz than an actual articulation of the joints. How do you, since you are your mom's sole caretaker, is that debilitating for you to to see somebody you love so much in that condition? doesn't really take a great deal of, um, well, let's just say she's not high maintenance like most old women. Look at creosote. I mean, I'm re reiterating this again, David. She, she, she basically, she's dead. You, you, I can say that she's dead. Now, all I need to do is to keep her smearing creosote to preserve her and every now and again dress her up. Right or, now, you're... You're the same age as King Charles, so that puts you around 73, 74. You yourself yes. are not a young man. No, no. As as your mom's sole caretaker, are you worried? I, I worry for you. Do you. Does anybody ever relieve you? Does anybody ever step in and give you a break from taking care of your mom? Well, the, the, my nephew singular not plural of course uh quentin uh, fulfills that's one of those sort of thing for functions he uh fulfills david one of the uh he certainly um let's say looks after me he is he looks after you but somebody has to also look after your mother i i worry that sometimes you're the only one like who dressed her this morning i i, I don't think i can state this any more explicitly, David, she's dead. Um, and, doesn't and take a great deal of maintenance. I, I can do. I mean, What's that sorry, David? I'm sorry, like, who dresses her? Who takes her downstairs? Generally, me, but every now and again, I've noticed uh, uh, the, the, the residents of this building have uh, been having a bit of fun with me and uh, been finding her in strange positions. Uh, dressed and uh, it was a bit upsetting at first, but it's just the, these boys having a a bit of a laugh at my expense. I don't mind that. I've got a, a great good, sense of humor. And your, mom, and your mom plays along with this. She has no option, David, because I, again, I must reiterate and I can't reiterate that she's dead, David. Yes, very much dead, stony dead. What kind she of COVID, what kind of COVID precautions are you taking with her? Uh, well, she did, David. So uh, the the cautions are irrelevant. I I can't stress this enough, David. My mother is dead. Right, and so are I know you're conservative. I know a lot of people in the aristocracy, uh, yes. including your friend King Charles. There are hints yes. that he has questioned the efficacy of vaccines. Yes. You do have. A, a mom who is 110 years old are you vaccinated is she vaccinated are the people around you vaccinated the living souls in these quarters are vaccinated however for the umpteenth and i would hope the final time david you must grasp this concept Mother is dead. She doesn't uh, covid any sort of uh, protection Oh, it would be totally unnecessary. She's, 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 she's dead, David. So I think in a roundabout way, you're saying yeah. that you have not gotten your mother vaccinated. 
that in, in definitively yes that is ex- that is exactly what i've not done i've not had uh, my dead uh preserved quite well mother vaccinated in any way shape or form so do you think you're putting me in a bit of a an awkward position here as the host of a podcast i'm on several platforms yes and you're putting me in jeopardy here getting dinged uh for putting an anti-vaxxer on the show i am i am a one would see it as a large push to remonstrate against your advocacy or not of uh, vaccination given that the subject in hand is someone who is very very much deceased i i don't think i'll reiterate this one more time david one of the things that uh, your people do you're you are on the right is you you're very slippery in how you answer questions so i'm going to ask you straight up yes or no straight up david this from the hip david straight up yes Yes. or no is your mother vaccinated no your mother is not vaccinated at the age of 110 no she is not vaccinated no and are you worried that she's going to contract COVID no you don't care if your mother gets COVID no okay I think you should sit down with a a trained professional and figure out uh what your issues are with your mother that you I I think given the fact that I've kept her in the house and uh smeared her in creosote daily for approximately two years in order to just have her here I think any professional coming to the house may find other issues I have with my mother than the the notion of being an anti-vaxxer I think Remington Hall where you live has a whiff of elder abuse that is that's not a whiff that's a world that's a whirlwind this neck of the woods lordy b we've got lots of elderberry trees in 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 the gardens you seem very you you know you seem very glib about this uh yes I don't approve if you you know this is responsible uh on your part and I urge all my listeners to get would it would it please you if I somehow asked um Pfizer to uh do me a batch of creosote with the um vaccine impregnated in the creosote whatever way you can get the vaccine into your mom that's what I would prefer I, I could do that I could do that I don't see the point and basically but uh, if it makes you I happy understand David you're thinking I just don't understand the carelessness on your part we have to wrap it up I don't understand in the name of continuing this cordial relationship I will endeavor to vaccinate my dead mother on your behalf yes David thank you I would hate for anything bad to happen to her well uh the inevitable has already occurred I fear yes yes anyway I think maybe the inevitable cross purpose here is I think maybe it is I, I don't want to speak out of turn here but maybe you may need a little bit of help yourself I may need need what a little bit of help I need help yes I think you need a little bit of help okay yes I, the, the fact that you can't acknowledge a very, a very I, I will reiterate this one more time the notion of a dead person not being able to catch a disease I think you need me you may need a little bit of help there David yes yes just yeah. a suggestion I, I think you're I'm doing being dogmatic I think you're doing your own research and that's putting your your mum's life in jeopardy yes yes well well do your own research listen to the medical community I so, will I will listen to the middle oh, well I'll do now I'll Google can people who've been dead for two years contract COVID-19 you see what well, this is why the internet is so dangerous 
Don't, don't do, listen to medical professionals, please. I will. I will ask any medical professionals to ring in to this show, in fact, and give me any advice you can on the efficacy of vaccination upon a uh, biannually dead personage. Okay. Give my best to your mom for me. Mom, he says, hello. Okay. Wear a mask. In or... my mind, she said hello back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling, Royal Watch. Hi, He's been coming to us from Remington Hall uh, in East Anglia. It's next door to Sandringham, where King Charles has a castle. Thank you, Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling. Well, it's time for Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. He's a Freudian psychoanalyst. And if Dan is here, are we, Dan, are you, should we do a quiz? Would you be up for a quiz, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld? Oh, we hang on, we have to. All by myself? Well, where, where is? Uh... Sidekick, I don't know, but. He told me he was planning to be here, but I'll, I'll, I'm game for well, anything. Why don't we talk? Let, let's catch up a little. and yeah, let's catch up. Catch up. And then Quizmaster Dan Frankenberger will, yeah. will step in. And what, what is today's quiz about today, Dan? Well, what we have today is, let's see what we got. Winning a very important election in Europe in 1978, Carol Joseph Wijola took the name John Paul II. Today's quote, today's quiz is on the Pope. On the, well, this is going to be tough because if there's anything Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, David Feldman, and Ethan Hershenfeld know about it, not just a Pope, but a Polish Pope. I mean, I cannot tell you the number of times Ethan has called me and said, What's up with Poland? Is Poland okay? Why don't we talk for a little while and then we'll have the quiz master come in and quiz our knowledge of Pope John Paul II. I'm getting Paulus. So sorry. There is a phenomenon of Jewish men converting to Catholicism. Robert Novak the uh, egregious columnist uh, became a Catholic. Bill Barr, the Attorney General, under really? Trump, was born, was born Jewish, and his father uh, converted the family to Catholicism. Full bore. I couldn't be happier. <laughs> To lose both of those guys. <laughs> I have a list of other, but I happen to have in my hand a list of other. Uh, if, you, you know, if, if you're a New Yorker, it actually makes sense just because of the parking. <laughs> like when you go to church, you can park wherever you want on a Sunday. On Saturday, you still got to worry about it. So just purely based on parking, it's a good decision. I, I think Catholicism makes sense. If, if, you have, if you have to convert, Catholicism makes sense to me. It's, Why is that? Uh, I'm sorry? Why is that? It's just as ridiculous as Judaism. It has one tenet after another, papal bulls, encyclicals. They have a college of cardinals who are issuing rulings that if you don't pay attention to it, you get left behind. You got to stay. There's an intellectual tradition. They're the, the Jesuits. And in the end, like the Jews, nobody really believes this shit. You just do it because you do it. I kind of, I'm not, I'm not converting yet. Okay, but I could I could see, uh, and there's a lot of anger at the you know a lot of Catholics are angry at the ch at the church. I I like that. I'd make a very good Catholic. It okay. turns out I learned recently that the uh, the Hebrew Day School, the so-called Hebrew Day School, which is like a. a 
religious school up in the Bronx that I went to as a kid, it turns out there was a lot of uh, sexual predation by the rabbis there. And I always disliked these guys and had a suspicion that they were not good people, but it's now out in the press that these guys at this SAR, this academy, um, there was a lot of that going on exactly when I was there in the 70s. So, um, well, we find they share, that, so they share that with the Catholic Church. I think that that's with any uh, orthodox people who are very rigid in their religious beliefs, right? right. Would you say that, Dr. Hershenfeld, that people who uh, have very strict dietary and sexual codes are prone to uh it, it is true because you don't find a lot of strippers hitting on young boys no you that's don't that's right you make a good point right yeah i don't, I don't Sorry, get i interrupted doctor you were gonna say i was gonna say ah. let's change the subject yeah no, nothing good can come from this conversation there is no upside whatsoever to uh anti-semitism there is no upside there well it's a it's a it gets you out of the house <laughs> what what anti-semitism yeah it's good for meeting people uh, <laughs> it's good you, you want to sh hang out with people who share a common interest oh. <laughs> these are all good things so i wouldn't say it's all bad <laughs> you could that's right uh people don't bowl anymore remember that that's exactly all... yeah now yeah what's the matter with kansas <laughs> uh, i used to bowl as a kid i think <clears throat> some people may disagree with me about this but that's okay people disagree with me about lots of stuff i don't okay thank you i think a case can be made that anti-semitism has been the glue of Western civilization for over two millennia. It's certainly a crazy glue. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of saying, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. We're not greedy and avaricious, they're greedy and avaricious. We have a common enemy. <clears throat> I think it's done all sorts of things. <clears throat> and yet they could have just shared uh, the hobby of gardening. I mean, there were so many better choices. To... No, but you're, it's, it, it explains away the inexplicable. When you can just say, this group of people is responsible for all my, yeah. my problems. For, for the Black Plague, Jews were everywhere they were blamed for the plague but in all fairness they did i was going to say it hasn't been disproven so. <laughs> yes marjorie uh marjorie taylor green the uh watching kanye it is so illustrative of the 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 mental illness behind racism anti-semitism homophobia this is a, a man I, I don't mean to be cruel here but this is a man clearly having a, a psychotic episode uh, saying these things and I've I've everything I've been told is that, that racism anti-semitism homophobia is a sickness is a mental illness don't agree. I agree that there are mentally ill people who share in these ideas, but there are non-mentally ill people who share in these ideas. Let's get back to Marjorie Taylor Greene, since you brought her up. When she said that the fires in California were um, caused by Jewish space lasers uh, paid for, I think, by the Rothschilds. Mm -hmm. It sounds crazy. 
I, and yet there, there is actually such a thing as a Jewish space laser. It's a, it's a tool used by real estate agents to show you the square footage of one bedroom. <laughs> the Jewish well, space the laser. Chases. And the cat chases it around the room. Yeah, and it actually turns any any studio into a one bedroom and one bedrooms into two bedrooms. It's, okay. you can get it on Amazon. Sorry, go ahead. So, so it sounds crazy, but I think that if if she were examined carefully, I'm not sure she would be found to be psychotic. I I think she's a evil, manipulative person who will stoop to anything to gain power. So but a good she, mom, but she's a good mom. Right, great mom. <laughs> And bakes very well, I'll bet. Right. I, and I, I think you and I are going to end up in her oven. So Listen, go ahead. I do want to, I do want to say that um, th there is that issue of group psychosis or group insanity. So these people might on an individual level look mentally healthy, but they are part of a, of a, of a cult that is insane. A cult that is insane. I was watching those clips from the debates. These are all people who are espousing they're espousing beliefs that are 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 nuts. Yeah. I mean, we have we have proof now from England, this grand experiment in in getting rid of taxes and in the free markets. And these guys, they just they subscribe to to this idea about the economy that time and again is shown to be false. That's that's mental illness. Is it, doctor? I, I, and and again, respond to the uh the the good doctor Samuel Benjamin author of today yes. now yes when I look at somebody like Liz Truss I want to be careful here because she is the face of ambition but it's you got to be careful you can't call a woman ambitious because so is so was uh Boris Johnson so is Keir Starmer I mean they're all ambitious uh so I think there's a lot of sexism here and also a lot of stupidity. I mean, she just really just seemed craven and just wanting to be, to sit at the table and be in charge. But is it pure ambition? When you look at somebody like Liz Truss, does she believe this stuff or is it just she wants, she just wants it? No, I think she believed that that economic theory that's been disproven over and over again that what is that called that uh trickle down supply side yeah that well, do, what yes yeah I, I, um krugman has a has a has a phrase for it it's not voodoo zombie. economics but it's like zombie zombie, zombie. exactly that zombie stuff um right. so i believe that she believes it and her ambition is not a problem for me all these people are ambitious all politicians are ambitious i think some of them might actually be trying to help people but that's not a problem it's just that she was willing to do this experiment at the expense of a lot of people's uh economic well-being and unfortunately the free market in this case knocked the crap out of her and combined with they have a political system where you can instantly then lose your job which is so mm -hmm. great yeah. I mean, imagine if we had that where you actually have to then stand up in front of the opposition and listen to them and in public respond and get booed and then lose your job it's so i mean that is just yeah i'm gonna get pushback i'm gonna get pushback i'm gonna say something <clears throat> that i i partly mean i i believe the the monarchy must be abolished but the instability that you're seeing in great britain the efficiency where they where they can have a shakeout they can be a lot more honest about mm -hmm. failure in Great Britain than we can it's the parliamentary system but it's also the security blanket of a monarch that these people are civil servants the MPs they they are there to they're not good at it. I'm not saying any of them are even Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer is horrible. Labor is horrible. But they're able to shake things out without people worrying that the whole thing is going to crumble and collapse on itself because you have this totem 
pole. You have this king now who's, you know, keeping the, the, the he's a blanket of security. We, we don't have that in America. Not that I want it, but it's something to keep in mind. If you, well, you know, if you that me. it makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, do you have a cold, Dr. Hershenfeld? I do not have a cold. I do not have COVID. I have, I have sort of year round allergies and they wax and they wane and they are waxing right now. I was prescribed ragweed. They say it's ragweed. I was prescribed antibiotics for my, for my nose. I and I'm afraid to just, I, I, I won't take them because I just feel Why should I be taking antibiotics for my medicine? I totally agree. They are so overprescribed. And what about your nose required antibiotics? Uh, my doctor said, man, you got a big nose. <laughs> well, he should have sent you to a plastic <laughs> surgeon. <laughs> no, uh, I have, there are some days that uh, it takes me a good half hour to uh, breathe through my nose. Yeah, go, I have that go, sometimes also. Do you go swimming every morning? You want me to sw breathe through my nose while I'm swimming, doctor? No, I want you to go swimming every morning, and I will cure that without the use of any antibiotics. I don't think there's any truth to that. I swam every morning, and it did nothing for my nose, but it's... But it wouldn't hurt to swim. It just wouldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I think it's time. Okay. To uh, and should, Dan, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. And should we bring in Sir Arthur if he wants to compete? Sure. Are you, do you are, do you want to go up against Sir Arthur Grebe? Okay. Hello, David. I'm here. Yes, I'm here. And and carry on with this charade. Let me let me do our little music here. Okay. That's good quiz music. Yes. <laughs> All right, Dan, take it away. All right. Uh, um, we quiz, have... Please welcome quiz master Dan Frankenberger. Today's, today's quiz is on popes and we have six questions so the order is going to be uh, dr hershenfeld then sir arthur greeb striebling then ethan then david so uh dr philip you are first and the first question is i'm winning i've got five points whoa well done, david. thank you I was going to say six questions might be a lot because six times four, that's 24 of these episodes. I would just cut out <laughs> one of the questions. Pope Julius II commissioned which artist to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Was it Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, or Banksy? Who's up first? It was Michelangelo. We all know this one. Moving on. Okay. Oh, Dr. Oh, we're getting crazy. You know, not everybody went to. Everyone knows this one. Not That's everybody amazing. went to Cambridge Community College. So <laughs> let's uh, let's go. Let's. All right. We'll do the dance. Okay. He ruined the first part. Let's go on to the next one. I'm going to say uh, Banksy. I'm going to say Leonardo DiCaprio. What, what's the answer? The correct answer is Michelangelo. <laughs> so it's it's tied. <laughs> Question number two, uh, Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling, you are first. Which pope was born Giannaccio Pecci? Was it Pius the Ninth, Sixtus the First? Leo the Eighth, or Thomas de Simone the Second? What happened to Fistus? Pope Fistus. 
<laughs> I would like every answer to be poop hilarious. <laughs> uh, what was the first one again? Uh, a broken character. Oh no! What was the first one again? The answers are Pius the Ninth, Sixtus yes. the First, Leo the Eighth, or Tommy D. Simone the Second. I will go with Pius. Ethan. That is correct. Pius. David. I agree. Dr. Hershenfeld. Pius. The correct answer is Leo the Eighth. <laughs> That was that was my fourth choice. Do I get any points? <laughs> Question number three, Ethan, you are first. Okay. Leo the Tenth excommunicated which Catholic monk for publishing ninety-five theses calling for reform? Was it John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Wesley, or Fester Adams? <laughs> it was Martin Luther. David. I'm going to go with uh, Marty Luther. Doctor. Yes, Marty Luther. Um, Sir Arthur. I'm going to go for the James Brown trumpeter, Fred Wesley. The correct answer is Martin Luther. <laughs> but Sir Arthur Reed, you, you you knew that answer, right? Yes, I did, yes. Okay, so it's tied. Next Question number four, David. In 19, or excuse me, in 1095, Pope Urban launched which of the following? I'm taking a class with Professor Adnan Hussein about this. Is it the First Crusade? It, first of all, it was Pope Cosmopolitan. They, they, used to say, they called him Pope Urban because he was African-American. And I found that, just say it. Just tasteful. It's, he was black, so they called him Pope Urban. I think. In 1095, Pope Urban launched which of the following? The First Crusade, the Spanish Inquisition, reforms to eliminate the selling of indulgences, or the first dictionary that included the Dirty Sanchez? <laughs> what do you think? Um, I'm going to say the Crusades. Doctor. Crusade number one. Sir Arthur. Crusades, yes, 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 yes. We need to bring that back, by the way. <laughs> Ethan? Crusades. Uh, also, and the second crusade was launched by Pope Suburban. <laughs> <laughs> Pope Suburban. The correct answer is the first crusade. <laughs> A Pope Suburban had a great encyclical about weed killing that nobody ever talks about. And also he wrote that treatise on the cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Roundup? Did the Pope sprawl do the fourth? <laughs> the Great Roundup. Question number five, Dr. Philip. Before assuming his papal name, his full name was Joseph Alois Ratzinger. Was it Benedict the Sixth? Yeah, Francis, Francis, Benedict the Sixteenth, or I'll, Peroni's the Third. I'll go with Benedict, Benedict the Sixteenth. Now Peroni's was a little curved, if I remember correct. Was it? Yeah. His miter like curved to I the right. This was a family show, Dave. It is. Uh, you're thinking you're thinking of Pope Peroneum. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Arthur, was it Benedict the Sixth, Francis, Benedict the Sixteenth, or Peronis? Benedict the Sixteenth, the, uh, the Nazi youth chap. Yeah. That would make a great list of famous uh, un, un, uh, the popes that deserve a lot more, like Pope Pudenda. All the great Pope popes Pudendum, there, yes, that's the next <laughs> on the list. That deserve credit and don't. Be, I'm sorry, I, I'll go with Benedict. Ethan. I don't like yes. Peroni's disease. Isn't Benedict? Is... Benedict. It's Benedict. Uh, Benedict. Benedictus Paulus. 16. Yeah. 16th. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, go, correct... I'll go with 16. The correct answer is Benedict the 16th. Yes. 
Ratzinger. Ratzinger. Sir Arthur, the last question. Question number six. We're, it's completely tied. Holy moly. What are the chances? I'm winning, David. Oh, that's right. You yeah, can. no, I'm not winning. No, no, it's not tied. Where right. do where do papal elections take place? Is it St. Peter's Square, the Papal Palace, the Sistine Chapel, or Vatican High School Gymnasium? <laughs> <laughs> Sir Arthur. It's the Papal Palace. Papal Palace. Ethan Hirschenfeld. Um Yeah, Papal Palace. David. What are the choices? St. Peter's Square, the Papal Palace, the Sistine Chapel, or Vatican High School Gymnasium. I, I just, I'm going to, the Sistine Square is outdoors, the Sistine Chapel. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to guess the Papal Palace. Doc? Yeah. Palace. The correct answer is the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. We got that all wrong. Yeah, we're tied again. Yeah, you're all still tied. That's what I meant. I meant to say <laughs> Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Your eyes said the Sistine Chapel. Is there even such a thing? Isn't, isn't it weird now? that the uh, the like the, the the Catholics discovered America and wiped out a lot of indigenous people, and both sides used smoke signals? Yes. Yes. David, where where is this guy who's who's hiding his face from us? He, he's not. He's Sir Arthur Grebe Streebling from Remington yeah. Manor. He he grew up with King Charles. But I don't see him. Well, he has one tooth. He's, he looks like a beetle. He's got one tooth that sticks out. He's a bee. He's part beaver. He, in fact, he was a. You, you were related to Lord Beaverbrook, weren't you? Yes, yes. I found him in a brook. So. And uh, he he grew and he dated. He was using poop on a rope to wash himself. And and he dated Princess Anne. Yes, by severing off a limb and counting the rings. Yes, that's how he dated her. And how old was she? Twelve thousand years old. Perished oh, wood. Okay. Yes, it's old almost. Yes. Well, thank you, Quizmaster Dan Frankenberger. Good job, gentlemen. Great job, Dan. Really great. He's getting, uh, that's turning into one of my favorite uh, segments. Yeah, that was funny. That high school gymnasium. That was funny. Ethan, you, you look like you're pissed off. Oh, no, no, not at all. I just really wanted to win. Do you get grumpy? I really wanted to win. And I, it's very upsetting to me. <laughs> um, he, he is very competitive, by the way. No, no, I'm not. Um, I am I grumpy? Well, I get, I can get grumpy. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. In in playing games, Doctor. No. Is he? Although, yeah, I was very in my sporting days. I, oh. I was. Yeah, that's true. Back when what I. What about games, like I Wordle and like cross? No, I like playing those things, but I'm not competitive about it. I. I uh, no. Ping pong. He I looked like, for him ping pong. He he was merciless when we were playing ping pong this summer. I but I uh, I prefer just to rally. I prefer to hit than to actually play play a game. How important is it? In all seriousness, how important is it for you to win Scrabble? Mahjong? Yeah. I know you and your dad like to play mahjong in the hours of the night. Yeah, and. Uh, how important is it for you to win? I don't, I, I gave that up. Yeah. 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 I used to be a uh, pretty, uh, yeah. I think like a lot of kids, I had a lot invested in winning these games and things. Is competition, of, but I, we're almost out of time. It feels like, at least with, yeah, sons and daughters, that competition comes naturally. Of course. But you don't have to say to your kid, get in the game, win, that, that they just innately 
Well, well some kids innately and some kids are inhibited in their competitive drive. Com competition is not a dirty word. Right, but the, when you say inhibited, that, that evinces a bias towards the competitive ones over the yeah, ones that are not competitive. I would agree. But, I, would agree. I right. don't mean cutthroat competitive. I don't mean cheating competitive. Right. But to, to want to do better and, and to succeed, I, I think that's an important good trait. To succeed, yes. To do better than... Not necessarily, because that again. That's this would be that. a. This is a good conversation for next week, because okay. I, I think the problem that this country is up against, and this is anecdotal, but I think my father came home from World War II. Uh, the movie or the, the actual war? Oh, the war! Wow. Yes, and. I think a lot of the greatest generation felt they had something coming to them and they did and they told their kids uh, they instilled a sense of competitiveness with other kids you know I I was kind of raised to be a little competitive and uh it didn't, you, think, you think you think that's bad? Well, it didn't make me happy because I kept losing. And I think, I, lose. very, no, I think it's very unhealthy. I think that that whole, and it's especially true in New York and in New, certain New York schools, that kids from a very young age are brainwashed into the system of winning and losing and succeeding and excelling and striving. And none of that is good for anybody. I agree. Kids, it's not good for the country. It's not good for their psychology. <laughs> it's great for your business, Dad, because it creates a lot of neurotic parents and kids. I'm not kidding. Okay. A lot of these kids were just obsessed with this notion that they got to get ahead. And in the end, there's no getting ahead. Everyone's going to the same place. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, I believe that. Yeah. I'm not where, saying it's Where, where are we? We're all going to the same place. Where are we going when you say Gimbals. that? Gimbals. Gimbals. Go... Yeah. I mean, once I. And maybe this is a, a subject for another book by Dr. Samuel Benjamin, author of Today Is Now. Thank you. That once you realize you're a loser, it you stop competing, you turn off sports, and you focus on what's really important. I don't. I don't know if "losers" the the right way of framing it either. I embrace my inner loser. I, I I've lived long enough to realize I've tried everything and I'm a loser. So what's the? What do you then focus on that's really important? Being the greatest loser in America. That nobody can come close to my level of loserio. Okay. I'm the biggest loser in the I'm a world champion loser. I just find like competition. Go ahead, Ethan. And then oh, no, no I, I, I was just thinking about um, Jesus and why he's so popular um, and how, why I feel like these evangelicals and these right wingers miss the message completely because he's king of the losers. His whole thing is the least among you will be first. It's it's a it's a it's a gospel to me about uh about uh non-competition i think he was a crisis actor i think they i think the pharisees sent him out there to the tell pharisees people. i call them the pharisees no, i'm talking about like the, i'm talking about the italian italian mob they moved in next door to me when i was growing up the pharisees i think the pharisees said go out there and tell people they'll get it in the next world and we'll get it in this world these here, here's the other thing about competition we see where it leads you because that's what these republicans are up to now they've all embraced this idea that you win at all costs including cheating right uh, and screw the system and screw democracy and screw fairness and screw all that we just have to win at all costs yeah uh, and that's just uh that's the death that's going to be the death of us okay god bless you all god bless thank you dr philip hershenfeld Thank you, Ethan Hershenfeld. Go by. Go by. Today is now. Bye, Dr.
by Dr. Samuel Benjamin, who is Ethan Hershenfeld's alter ego. Thank you. And by the way, thank you last week for giving a little plug for people to search me on IMDb. I think it actually really worked. So, really? Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone didn't do that and wants to go to IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, and just look at my name and click around and see some of the weird things I've done. And it helps me. Please go to go Thanks. to IMDb. And I going to ask people if you're enjoying today's show please subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts please subscribe to this podcast it's it's important it it is that's the way you can help by subscribing telling your friends to subscribe uh the kids say smash the like button uh please hit the like button and uh every time uh you get somebody to subscribe to this show it 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 helps me a lot it does because I have great guests and the more people know about these guests uh the better the world will be like my friend Emil Guillermo who hosts the people the PETA podcast people for the ethical treatment of animals well sir and you are a columnist for ALDEF the Asian um, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund and there is going to be a woman named Wong on our currency yes Anna Mae Wong who is Anna Mae Wong she was she's known as the first first real big Asian American star. She was born in LA. So she's Asian American, not from China comes here. She was Asian American and she, you know, plied her her trade in movies in the late twenties and thirties. And she was going to play the part uh, in uh, the lead role in Pearl Buck's um, uh, the good earth, but they didn't give it to her. They gave it to a white actress who played Yellowface. And so that that was one of her, um, the moments where she was greatly besmirched by Hollywood. It happens if you're in the media. It happens if you're Asian American. And, um, but she went on to star in like something like 60 movies uh, all throughout her life. And she has a Hollywood, you know, star. So she's going to be on the quarter. And and who is she replacing? I don't know if she's replacing anyone. I th- I think she's part of that that group of women who they they hand selected to to be on the quarter. But they're making they're making three hundred million anime Wong quarters. So this is not. I mean, I'm glad she's in the quarter, and not on a half dollar or not on a dollar, because then. People would be hoarding that stuff, you know, like I can't tell you how many Sacagawea dollars I have that I'm not putting out in circulation because I'm hoarding those things. Or the, hoarding, I, the Susan B. Anthony. The, the Susan B. Anthony. I hoard her. I hoard all the dollars. And so thank goodness Anime Wong is only on a quarter because you're going to use the quarter, right? You'll it's use totally, totally. a pinball. You use it when you play Galaxian. Do you still play Galaxian, David? I don't even know what that is. Galaxian. How about, uh, you know, uh, Space Invaders. Space Invaders. I, after... I played Pac-Man. Oh, you play Pac-Man? Okay. When I you play Pac-Man. Pac-Man, Pac-Man if, I ever, if I ever become one of those assholes who has uh, one of those games in their man cave, it would be a Pac-Man. I would sit there all day playing pac-man pac-man huh see i i don't have a man cave i i have a a covid closet and i got my gong here in my covid closet but man cave i kind of get it you know i i was into when you were talking to the hershenfelds about competition because i i didn't start thinking like you like a loser until you know i started meditating and then it made me accept my luxuriousness yes yeah i mean i'm i'm fine i'm fine with losing because what what you learn when you meditate is 
you ain't going nowhere. You're already there. Right. And, and so when you realize it's striving bad, I wish I had known, I wish I had known that and taught that to my, my charges whom I coached in girls soccer at third, fourth and fifth grade. I wish I had known that and said, look, we're not striving for anything. You know, everyone's going to get a trophy. Don't, don't worry. You know, I wish I told them, but we were, I was, when I was a soccer coach, a girl soccer coach, I was like, we were going for it. We were going, we were like practically going for the world cup. Well, know? there's something, but it, when it's a team, there's something beautiful about rooting for a team. When you you're know, rooting for Sean McEnroe versus Yvonne, Lett, I mean, then it becomes kind of, Hey, don't, don't kid yourself. I mean, yes, I, I know what you mean. There's a difference. Between sport, but there's usually one dominant, one dominant player. Yeah. But if you, I was insane, my kids played little league, my daughter. And when they played little league, mm -hmm. I was, I was insane. Did you make her catch? Did you make her catch? No, I would go to the game and I would root for the team and I was insane. You mean as a parent? As a parent. Oh, okay. now if I were her coach, I would have I would have taken you aside and like. Oh, I, I didn't. Sh I didn't shout or anything. Oh, what did you do? I just was like I. I was there was there was just something about seeing my kids in those uniforms. I would get a lump in my throat. It, it, it was just you like it, huh? something. It was, but it was base. It was the little league, the soccer. I couldn't care less. There was that's something okay. about, I, and I know that's a flaw of mine. Uh, More exercise uh, and actually very simple and also very beautiful game soccer. You know, when you realize, when you look at it as a spatial thing, putting the ball in space where they're not, and you realize that it's not about, you know, bunch ball when you're a kid, it's about using the whole field and, you know, playing it, Brazilian or Italian style. It, it's a, be so they a beautiful pubic hair? They play it without pubic hair? Uh, I don't think I said that, David. You said playing soccer Brazilian style. I would oh, 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 the Brazilian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The I, hate myself. I just hate myself. Yeah. This is why I, I accept that I'm a loser when I just, hey, um, yeah. Yeah. Now you are going to be appearing on Broadway. Off Broadway, off off Broadway. I I, I got a part in that. that How off Broadway? Uh, like first first street, right down there by the, uh, you know, Ukraine Village. So you're coming to New York City. I I got to I got to I, I have like a little speech I'm gi giving in this play, and I was doing it on Zoom, and they liked me, and they. They offered me the the part, so it looks like probably in the springtime I'll be there for a little bit. Wow, we'll hang out. Yeah, I know. Well, I'll take you to the Filipino joints that I used to go to a few years back when you know. I th I hope they're open still, but uh, yeah, Jeepney. You ever been there? That's a Filipino joint. I I'm by, 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 yeah 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I got this part, and then you know I might get into another thing. Do you know that theater under St. Mark's? You know that place? No. Oh, oh, it's it's a place that's on that's like kind of like around the same area, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll talk it up the closer we we get Ishmael to it. Ishmael Reed write it. Ishmael Reed wrote the play. It's called The Conductor, and you know the thing about Ishmael, he's so he's a satirist, as you know, and he's so far ahead of his time. But now people are talking about this phenomenon in. In politics, I mean, we're talking about the midterms right now because we're three weeks away. But now the thing is to go local and to flip school boards and to determine what, you know, if you, if you want to make an impact on your kids' curriculum, on, on what people are learning, and if you want to stop all that dreaded CRT, you, you got to go to the school board level. So the Republicans are now going to school board districts trying to flip the school boards and they're and if they can't flip them in elections they're trying to um recall the school boards and that's what happened in san francisco they had these very wokey 
kind of uh, progressives on the school board. They wanted to uh, bring diversity into the schools, uh, shut down the academic high school, which actually I was against. I was against that. So it's not that we can't be at odds because I'm for, uh, you know, elite public high schools because it's the only way poor Filipino kids like me can afford to get a, a decent public education. But some people would rather that they diversify and let everyone into, you know, public high schools that are, are all the same. I, I respect that. I mean, I think we can have a diversity of opinion, but they were trying, they recalled the school board members in San Francisco. And you remember when it happened, it became the talk, you know, from the world, from the East Coast perspective, you know, oh, this is happening in wokey San Francisco. So this must be a thing. Well, it is sort of a thing. It's become a thing. Okay. Anyway. So Let's what, talk about that. inflation. And the yeah. I, I am tired of the talk about inflation because people don't understand that what the Republicans are saying now is like they have no answer. The, their, their answer is help the rich, cut taxes. And, you know, cutting taxes is inflationary. But people are, they gravitate to this idea that Republicans are, they're the fiscally responsible ones. They're the people who know money. They're the people who do things like Donald Trump, who overcharges, you know, the government when he has a Secret Service stay at his resorts. You know, they're the people who think about profits and for themselves. That's who they think about. And people who are fooled into thinking that the Republicans are going to save the course of the country in terms of our economics are just dead wrong. And that, that, that's the thing when people mention inflation. That's all people are talking about. They're not talking about abortion. They're not talking about the southern border, although... A little bit of southern border is important, too, because you need a little bit of xenophobia, you know, in your elections. You need a little racism in your elections to split up the electorate. But, you know, I hear this inflation talk and everyone, all the polls are suggesting that Republicans have the edge when it comes to solving inflation. And they don't. They don't. The economy. They do. Yeah. You know, uh, the economy always does worse under Republicans, the Democrats have to come in and clean it up. Yeah. The, the, you look at the Republicans, when they're in charge, they destroy the place. Mm. The Democrats come in and try to fix it. The Republicans fight them. And but the residual pain left over from the Republicans gets blamed on the Democrats. Yeah. And yeah. That's what's going to happen in three weeks. We're yeah, not going to win the House. I mean, look at what, look at what happened with o Obama, right? After Bush, you know, tanked the economy, he had to come. Obama had to come in and save Bush's butt. Two thousand, you know, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and uh, look at Trump. I mean, the national debt. I mean, I was looking at this figure. But they lit. It was he was. You look at what happened under Trump with COVID. Giving away the store. The whole system shut down, literally shut down. We always think about the financial crisis of 2008. Mm -hmm. COVID was worse than the financial crisis. Yeah. The whole economy shut down. But you have to admit, the when they, they took pictures of how everything looked, you know, the, the skies, less pollution. Yes. You know, it was good for some things, but you're the right. Animals I mean, came out of nowhere. Huh? Animals came out of nowhere, right? And yeah. So, so you're, you're going to talk about the midterms. Are you fearing what I'm fearing, that it's going to be pretty? I think pretty, it's going to be a very depressing Thanksgiving. Yeah. I, I, I was just looking at the numbers uh, about how many, what, what the Democrats have to do. Uh, because right now it's like 221 to 212. That's Democrats ahead. And there's like 23 toss-ups. Uh, and if they just lose a handful of the toss-ups, that's it. That You know, the Congress, the House is, is to the, the Republicans. And if, and if in the Senate races, if you lose one Senate race, forget it, right? It's like, that's why everything, not just Pennsylvania, but Georgia, Wisconsin, um, Nevada. I mean, it's all... It's yeah, Adam Black Salt is leading. Last time I checked. Yeah, I saw that. Turn Nevada red. Yeah, 
the J.D. Vance should be losing in Ohio. We should be flipping that blue. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's close. It's close. With, I which, think I Ryan mean, is a good candidate. I know he's not good on on issues. He's good on meditation, though. He's a med. He led the meditators caucus in the in the house. Really? Yeah. Seriously, he, he's a meditator, uh, Tim Ryan. And you know, I that that was the one debate this week that I saw Tim Ryan versus J D Vance because I hate J D Vance and. The question to Vance was, tell me about the great replacement theory. And J.D. Vance, that's like uh, the bread and butter for the Trump base, right? Mm -hmm. And J.D. Vance had to bring out his wife and his kids. He he has biracial kids, which I didn't know because he doesn't talk about having biracial kids. You don't talk about having biracial kids if your base is racist, right? Right. But he had to admit to his the racist Trump base that he was married to a South Asian, his kids are biracial, and his kids were threatened, and he was using that as some kind of shield. But that doesn't make sense because the people attacking him, if he's right that he, his kids are attacked, they're his supporters. They're the people who would vote for J.D. Vance. So he's totally screwed up, J.D. Vance. Anyway. But he's... He should not win. And I think Ryan has done a great job mopping the floor with him in the debates. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't I hope I hope you're right, because I keep getting emails from all these candidates who say, oh, it's not looking so good. I, I'm turning to you. I need money. You know, it's some come on, of course. Hey, I'm worried about Val Demings down there in in Florida, because it looked like when she was on that impeachment, um, the. I guess it's, it's, they're not called the impeachment squad, but, you know, when she was on that committee, I thought she was pretty sharp and she was a law and order type. And I thought she should be able to kick Marco Rubio's butt, but apparently he's got a lead. I know. But you, so I played some clips at the top of the show of, oh, I missed that. of her debating Marco Rubio and sending him back to school. It was glorious and everybody should donate money to Val Demings. However, you watch the debate and you think anybody in their right mind would say, I got to vote for Val Demings. And then you go, oh, it's Florida. Nobody's in their right mind. (laughs) I watched that debate and I'm thinking, why would anybody vote for for Rubio? He's just a liar. He's just a liar. liar, But he's he takes advantage of of his position he doesn't show up to votes he doesn't do his job i you know he's he's floating he's floating on on marco uh the magnificent i'm you know republican i'm the you know boy wonder as he ages he's still the boy wonder i he is brilliant he he's evil but he's brilliant yeah Yeah. he He was the only one in 2016 who could (laughs) spar with trump uh, yeah. Yeah, but his sense of humor, his yeah. facility with language, putting sentences together. Well, I, I still, uh, I, I look at his, you know, his activity as a senator, and I'm wondering why do people like this guy? You know, it, because he doesn't show up. He doesn't even show up for his constituents. So, anyway, I hope Val Demings has a shot. He reads the polls, and he knew exactly what he was doing when he was supposedly losing that debate. Yeah. Oh, well, he, he, it was a master's class in how to lose a debate and uh, get a, a bump in the polls. Well, just like uh, the guys who lose. Oh, well, like uh, what's his name? Walker, right? He uh, has to admit or he doesn't admit. But during the time when all this stuff is coming out about all his his uh, abortion activity, he's raising money. Um, that's the thing. If you've got whoever raises the last dime. That's the kind of politics we have. Uh, if we were able to get the money out of the politics, which should be the goal, it might be fair. So you look at somebody like Fetterman. Yeah. I find myself saying, I, I, first of all, I really like Fetterman, but he's also had a stroke. There are reports that he's having trouble at times communicating. He's going to get better. He's young. And we should support anybody we should vote for somebody especially for senate 
who who has a little difficulty speaking because of a a, a stroke. Uh, okay. It's not like he's it's not like he's running for president and he has to go in the situation room and everything that comes out of his mouth has to be precise. Then again, we have Joe Biden uh, and he's in the situation room. He's a senator. You vote for what's in his heart, not what his heart has done to his brain. I and agree with Fetterman on everything. Yeah. Translate that to uh, Herschel Walker, who cannot string a coherent sentence together. He's in advanced stages of CTE, concussions. But, but David, he was right. a good football player. Well, but if you want the same way I root for Fetterman, yeah. people on the other side root for Herschel Walker and they say, who cares? that he can't string a coherent sentence together. His heart is in the right place. Yeah, that's what they say publicly. But you know, it's 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 the whole thing about why people stick with Trump, right? They, they want to go with a winner and they they they're going to make uh, uh they're going to make hay uh with the guy they got. They're going to dance with the guy uh well, you know, they're going to they're they're going to go with their guy and because there is no rational way that Herschel Walker next to Raphael Warnock uh, is the guy you would choose. I mean, any rational person would say, God, you know, this Warnock, you know, he's a preacher. He's uh, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you know, Church of Martin Luther King, MLK. I mean, how can you say, I think I like this other guy, you know, because he offered to pay for a woman's abortion. He tried to talk a woman out of an abortion. You know, how do you go with Walker? I, I don't get it. Anyway, thank goodness I'm in California where, you know, David, there's California 22. This is a good race. David Valadeo, he's a Republican who's winning in a Democratic district uh, around Bakersfield, south of Fresno. He, he actually voted to impeach. And what's his name? Kevin McCarthy saved him because he convinced Trump not to come in to California to try to primary David Valadeo. So Val David Valadeo is neck and neck with this guy, uh, Rudy Salas, who's a Democrat, California 22, and that's a toss-up state. It's, it's really tough because Valadeo might beat Salas. And the, the really sad thing there is Salas is Latino, Valadeo is Portuguese, which is essentially after a generation it's white, right? Rudy, Rudy Salas, would, if he wins, would be the first Latino to represent the Central Valley in Congress, which is like outrageous when you think of the fact that Rudy, Rudy Salas, like Latinos before him, was a picker in the Valley, you know, ag labor, and he's fighting this guy, Valadeo, who, even though he voted for impeachment, he's a Republican, and if he's loyal to Mac McCarthy, that can't be good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about uh, vivisectors in the Ivy League. Yeah, there's this one. She's really loathsome. Margaret Livingstone is her name. And for the last 40 years, she's been taking monkeys, pregnant monkeys. Oh, hang on. Okay, go ahead. She's been taking pregnant monkeys in her Harvard Medical School lab. And as soon as they have their babies, she strips them of their babies. So it's maternal deprivation on the part of the baby. And then for the babies, she, she sews the baby's eyes uh -huh. shut. Is that cruel enough for you? This is not as bad as what they did to me at Harvard freshman year. However, uh -huh. All right. it, but seriously, this is going on. It's been going on for... You know, people thought in the 80s they got rid of these kind of experiments, particularly these kind of maternal deprivation experiments. But they continue to be funded, uh, $32 million a year, NIH grants, and science, other members of the scientific community, not an necessarily animal rights people, are trying to stop Margaret Livingstone and Harvard Medical School from doing these eyes shut these babies eyes sewn shut experiments 
uh, because they're just cruel and, and, and no value. No what, value. What is she learning by doing she, this? Uh, she's learning apparently something about. I know she says something about the vision of the of the monkeys. How they develop their vision. Um, in other words, it's total BS. There's there's nothing that she's that that is useful to either science nor to humans from these tests. That it's just the scientific welfare system in our in our country in in action where you apply for a grant to nih you vary your grants you change a wording here you get your you know tens of millions of dollars you run labs out of major uh universities that's what they do with the larry yeah. summer why don't they bring larry summers back to harvard and do well, the experiments on him instead that might not be a bad thing although he might have some good ideas about fighting inflation you know maybe uh, suddenly he's discovered the the real cause of inflation yeah i i don't know i i just think that sudden, the fact they're still doing these experiments uh is is really appalling after as i said 40 years ago uh, when these kind of experiments were first exposed uh the scientific community said no uh or it was under the assumption that that's it. They weren't, they weren't around. And, but she, this Livingstone person published in a major um, academic uh, journal very recently and people noticed and now PETA noticed and other scientists are noticing and they're trying to shut, shut down her lab. Horrible, horrible. All right. Congratulations on getting, uh, this this role very it's a very small role it's about somebody who goes who went to an ivy league college and learned how to be white and uh likes the anglicization of all people of color so it's kind of a stretch for me but um i'm going to try try to I, it's a small role i'm not it's not the major i'm not a, not the big star but capable of maybe stealing the show because you're competitive I'm compat yeah, except I'm I'm meditating now. I'm telling David, you know, like remember last week we talked about uh, the LA City Council and about uh, Nuri Martinez resigning and they were trying to get Kevin DeLeon to resign. Remember we talked about the LA City course, Council? Yeah. Kevin DeLeon just yesterday said he wasn't gonna resign. And I got into this big argument with someone who said because uh, I said, Well, you know, maybe they should try to work with Kevin DeLeon because maybe they should use the fact that he's seen as an Hispanic icon because I'm trying to be in my non-competitive way instead of being judgmental and trying to like knock him down I'm trying to say maybe we can work with Kevin Dillion maybe we you know we can use his his power uh with within the Latino community and make it work for everyone and a lot of people just say are you crazy Emil yeah he didn't knock down this uh, this racist tirade by Nuri Martinez. He doesn't deserve to represent the public. And I said, well, why are you so judgmental? You know, shouldn't we just be open to see that maybe there's a way that we can meet a, we can meet our needs if we meet his needs, which is to try to come out of this so that he owes us and he helps us. I mean, that's the strategic way to think about this. But no, a lot of people just want to like slap him down. But I'm I'm all about love now, David. I love you. I love you. I love you too, and I forgive you. Yeah, I, thank you, thank you. I and I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. Emil Guillermo is the host of the Pita Pot. That is such a disturbing Harvard people. I mean, uh, the eyes shut. Yeah, I'm telling you, she's been doing it for 42 years, and she'll keep doing it as long as she gets millions of dollars. Isn't that amazing? What is her name? Margaret Livingstone, Harvard Medical School. And people can listen to the current PETA podcast, number episode 246. I talked to a PETA scientist. And, and do they know which building she does this in? You know, I, I imagine they probably do. I probably, if you do a Google search, you can find her. Uh, but yeah, she's at the Harvard Medical School. She gets millions of dollars and she keeps getting millions of dollars and she's been flying under the radar flying under the radar until she published um in this current 
uh, there's this very high-minded uh, uh, journal in her field, and other people saw it, and they were just disgusted. So nothing thank goodness. Good, nothing good comes out of Harvard. Nothing. Nothing good comes out of Harvard. Ethan, you, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. I mean, I, I'm, i you know, I'm not at the same level as, you know, Margaret well, Livingston. Uh, Brian Wright, Brian Rich, a couple of comedy writers. Yeah. Uh, Conan? 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 Nothing good comes out of Harvard. Joe Toplin? Joe Toplin? Nothing. Yeah. I mean, which I would not go if you told I, I, I'm telling you the truth. If if a doctor told me he graduated from Harvard Med, mm. I'd go next. You win. I would never go to a doctor who graduated from Harvard Med. And I never hear of anything good coming out of Harvard Med. Well, you know, having been in hospitals, visiting loved ones, yeah. it, I don't need uh, somebody with a fancy degree. I need somebody who a knows what they're doing and b cares is thinking about what's in front of them not what's ahead all right now david this happens a lot now because there's a doctor shortage but if you go research a doctor that you're about to have a procedure and you find out he went to a medical school in either india or yes. the Philippines. Yes. And he comes here and he yes. interns at the University yes. of Cincinnati. Better. Better? Better. Okay. Absolutely. I'm well, being serious. I, I, I'm being serious too. I know that there's a lot of people who would say, oh, I can't, you know, you got, you don't have any I doctor. I you that you get, you get a doctor from India, you're going to get treated better than a, an American doctor. Well, this is a line in Ishmael's play, uh, The Conductor, because this comes up, you know, when uh, people insist on the Anglicization and, you know, you know, the white studies, essentially. Right. And he's pointing out that before there were, uh, you know, higher before there was higher education in in in, in Europe, in England, uh, there was higher education in Asia, in India. Of course. You know? Hundreds of years before. And who do you think is taking care of people in the hospital and making all the major decisions in the hospital? It's the nurses. Yeah. And where do you think they're from? Yeah. Well, they're from I, Harvard. They, and m many of them aren't from America. Yeah. I, I, I know. Well, I just point, I, I just, when I saw that line in Ishmael's play, it's just to indicate that there was civilization well before, you know, what we know as Western civilization. And, you know, point out little facts like Euclid. Did you know Euclid is, you know, is from Africa? Do you know that? I thought he was from Cleveland. Uh, Euclid yeah, Avenue the in Cleveland. Jewish, the Ashkenazi. Uh, no, no, he's from Africa. Euclid's from Africa. Euclid was a black guy. But, I mean, how many people have seen pictures of Euclid? I, I mean, you know, my, my geometry book had like a bunch of shapes, but it didn't have his picture, so. Emil Guillermo, follow him on Twitter at Emil Amuck. Listen to his nightly broadcast on YouTube. Emil Guillermo, you do a live show every night? 2 p.m. Pacific uh, uh, on YouTube and also on Twitter at Emil Amuck. And I put it, uh, I put, I put the replays on amok.com. So fantastic. Thank you, David. I love you, buddy. No. I'm just, congratulations. You're coming to New York. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there maybe sooner than you think. Good, good. Thank you, Emil. Let's go to Massachusetts, where the Reverend Barry W. Lynn is standing by. Uh, how are you feeling, Reverend? Well, the good news is I no longer test positive for COVID, but the not so good news was just two days ago, an entire set of bookshelves with hundreds of books on them collapsed on my head. And that was not so good. They yeah. say books are good for the head. Yeah, that's what they say. And, you know, I never really understood what that meant until <laughs> they fell on me. And I was, I, 
there's a very strange sound when hundreds of books fall on you. The creaking that comes from the screws that were incorrectly put into the wall all of a sudden decide to come out of the wall with the books all on them. All right. Well, I, yeah, that was a, it was it, I didn't I mean, I think I wrote you that this happened and I didn't get any get well card, but that's OK. You didn't get my get well card? No, I didn't. Uh, but it might have come to uh, the, the wrong post. address. You know, oh, the, the reason the post office has a bad <laughs> reputation is that people like me who don't mm -hmm. send sympathy cards and then they just blame the post office. The post office <laughs> is phenomenal. It's people like me who are too self-centered to, in all seriousness, the co last week you were pretty amazing given that you were knee deep in the virus. Correct. And where were you sitting when the bookshelves? Ran? I was standing up next to the bookshelves that had been put in. I should say the company that put them in, we sent them some photographs and they they were shocked. They couldn't believe that this much damage had gone on. And, you know, I got a headache and I have a bruise on my uh, left arm. But, I mean, if a, if a child, for example, oh my God. had been fall, fallen there, he would have been seriously hurt. I mean, oh God. so don't read books. That, that's, that's, if, you, if you had books, don't read them. If you do have them, put them in a closet somewhere. Don't put them on shelves. That's the clear message that comes from that. It, it's like what Homer Simpson used to say. Um, if you try and fail, next time, don't try. <laughs> I mean, it's, sim you know, it's similar to uh, The Simpsons when... You know, we used to watch that religiously. I mean, our son was incredibly into The Simpsons for the, a long time. And uh, we would go to church in the mornings. And then at 7 o'clock at night, we'd religiously sit around and watch The Simpsons. And, then, and there's an episode of The Simpsons that predicts the year Queen Elizabeth II will die. I heard about that. Yeah, I heard about it too. You know, she was killed by Liz Truss. I'm pretty sure that happened. I mean, like Why is it that in England you can you can raise taxes, but not on rich people, and it only takes 45 days for people to wait? Go wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. That's why we have so much inflation. And now, and it only took 45 days. We've been having the same debate about the economy for 40 years. There's a candidate running up here in Massachusetts. If elected, I think she would be the youngest person ever elected to the House of Representatives. And she actually, the night she won the primary, she actually said, um, I have to balance my checkbook. Why don't governments have to balance their budgets? Now, I heard that 40 years ago, and then every time somebody would say it, I'd say, so do you, um, do you have a car? And they go, uh, well, the bank and I have a car. I said, so, so you don't have it free and clear. How about your mortgage? You have a mortgage? Oh, yeah, you got to pay $1,000 a month. Hmm. Yeah, so we borrow. It has long been my feeling, and I'm not an economist, but it's long been my feeling that what America needs is two budgets. I mean, a budget for the things that really matter, that have a long shelf life, and then another budget for the kinds of things that uh, have on an emergency basis or might last for a year or two. But we never do that. We never think about having two kinds of, of federal budgets. And uh, that's why, you know, we, we live in a, a world of economic stupidity, or at least a that's country true. of it. Amen, Reverend. Yep. Got to do that. And we vote our hate. Yep. We don't care what the truth is as long as the right people are suffering. We're, we're voting yeah. against each other. Yes. While the rich get richer. Yep. 
But the other great fiction that is repeated constantly is that if you, you come from a poor family, you could all of a sudden become the next fill in the blank, Jeff Bill Bezos. Gates. The next Bill Gates. Who, or Bill Gates. His father was a successful lawyer, multimillionaire, sent him to Harvard. Bill Gates was not working his way through Harvard. <laughs> no. And he dropped out to buy MS-DOS. Yeah. To buy, <laughs> to buy it. He didn't create MS-DOS, <laughs> bought MS-DOS. He was busy playing poker with his other friends from Harvard. <laughs> You know, uh, I knew Andy Grove pretty well. He gave us a lot of money to do a couple of projects. And uh, he literally came to the United States with 25 cents and the address of a relative who lived in New York City. And from that, he parlayed that into the management of, of course, of, uh, of Microsoft and oh, Intel. I mean, of Intel. And, um, you know, he... He an, an ex, was an extraordinary human being, and one of his management techniques, although I wasn't so sure, we used to go out and see him every every two months. He he wanted to talk to the people who were doing the work. No he wanted, doors. He had you know, no he, doors. The off, it, right, the offices. Right. He had no doors, and he wanted to go out, not to talk to the head of whatever department it was. He wanted to know who's actually working on this project. I want to talk to them. And by the time I knew him, he had very severe Parkinson's, but uh, he was still, you know, brighter than almost anybody I've ever met. Wow. Well, the midterms are, what, three weeks away? Three weeks away. Now, I heard you and Emil talking about some of these races, and uh, they're not looking as good as they were, at least to my eyes, about four weeks ago. But here are some numbers that I do find encouraging. There actually is an organization that collects data every day about the number of people who are casting mail-in ballots or voting early. And here are the numbers as of today. Of the all of the millions of votes already cast, 53% are from women, 47% from men, and on the Democrat-Republican split, 52.6% Democrats, 37.8% Republicans. And historically, early voters tend to vote Democratic. And women of course at least in recent years tend to vote democrat so those numbers are astonishingly high for a midterm election and this gives me some real hope that in some of these very very close races uh, i can perhaps be as optimistic as i was a month ago hmm. yeah. uh, you're the only one well, because I'm not raising any money. I mean, I'm giving money, but I'm not raising any aren't, money right, for myself. Aren't, aren't the polls showing? I mean, you look at the polls and they're not good, right? No, they're, well, they're, they're certainly not on a good trajectory, but on something in Pennsylvania, the whole, the Fetterman eyes race, um, I don't, th they, they only have one debate schedule. I don't think it's happened yet. But um, so the complaint is that uh, Fetterman will have to use, uh, will have to look at the words of the questions before he answers the questions. But you know, I had uh, I had a stroke similar to his, and it was pretty damaging for a couple of months, and then I regained, you know, what little. I, evidence of intelligence I had and I could speak and I could speak and but for a couple of months I mean I was really really concerned about whether I'd ever actually speak well that's gotta, again. That's got to be both frustrating scary and anger making. Oh absolutely there's no question about it I mean and you know it's uh, it would be nice um, if one could really get as you know, I've frequently said on this program, Medicare uh, 
not my ideal solution to getting health care for everyone. And it, having moved to Massachusetts from DC, uh, DC, I was in the Kaiser Permanente health care system. I liked it generally. I liked it a lot. I liked the doctors it attracted because they actually seemed to care about patients. They actually knew who you were. If there wasn't some kind of a thing they wanted examined in more detail, you could walk from your uh, general clinician's office to the lab, to an x-ray, to an... Now, in Massachusetts, it's, we don't have any kind of Kaiser Permanente, so I have to shop. And shopping for it, even with the wisdom of my wife, it's very difficult to figure out how to go and how to find a cardiologist, how to find an ophthalmologist. We're going to have uh, Dr. Nancy come on, mm -hmm. and you're welcome to join. We're going to do... Uh, the primer on what Medicare is, how to sign up, and what you should pick. Uh, please join us. When is, when is that going to be? Well, I haven't scheduled it yet. Okay. But let's go over some of these numbers here because sure. Uh, it's I'll go over the depressing numbers. This is the real clear politics election poll numbers. So they take all the polls that are out there, and then they do the averages. When you look at Wisconsin, the horrendous Ron Johnson is leading Mandela Barnes by close to three points. How can that be, other than racism? I, I think it's got to be racism. I mean, it's... Um... When he be beat Russ Feingold the first time, I was doing a radio show and I had Russ on, and I said, look, I mean, what has Ron Johnson actually done? This is two, two and a half years into his first term, and uh, Russ said, he hasn't done anything. He, and he still hasn't done anything. He hasn't accomplished anything but Mandela Barnes, he's African American, and I think that Racism is very much a factor in the Wisconsin race, very much a factor. Can it be overcome if there are, is enormous turnout in Wisconsin, particularly in big cities? I think it's possible to overcome one or two percentage points. But my general view is if a Democrat isn't ahead by four or five percentage points, she or he is not going to win. There was... I played this at the top of the show. In Georgia, there's a debate between Stacey Abrams, an African-American woman who should be the governor of Georgia. She basically won four years ago, but the right. Secretary of State purged the voting rules of African-Americans, Brian Kemp, and then ran for governor and won. Uh, she, uh, This is hers. It belongs to her. She's losing by five points so far in Georgia. How can that? She's a black woman. Yeah, she is a black woman who, after her nearly successful, and you're right, by any stretch of the imagination, she should be governor now. But remember, there was a kind of salacious book she wrote. And when that came out, people go, well, she's writing dirty books now. And she had written it long, long ago, but she did have it republished, and it still comes up in discussions that, well, we I don't know if we can trust her because, I mean, she wrote something like pornography. Hmm. It wasn't. It was pretty gentle. But the, these things that happened, Mandela Barnes did in fact say at one point, suggest that he supported the defund the police movement. And now, of course, he says he didn't. Unfortunately, there is tape of him suggesting he was very sympathetic to that movement. And so that's what he's being hit on. And the ability of the Republican Party to lie about crime is just unbelievable. They will take one or two th examples and then they will say, uh, you know, this is, this is proof. If you look at the murder statistics in any, every state, 
the top 10 murder states are all run by Republicans, all right. run by Republicans. But when you get some kind of a story like, uh, you know, in New York, where there is an increase in crime and, you know, where there's uh, reports of this uh, cab driver who picks people up and then kills them to harvest their organs, you hear that story and they go, my God, I can't believe it. Crime. Nobody has a good answer for crime except make sure that people who are in dire poverty have a place to sleep and medicines to get and food to eat and a decent education. And then you won't have any disparity in the crime statistics in white neighborhoods and African-American neighborhoods. Yeah, we you, know what works. Yeah, you'll still have crime, rampant crime in the corporate suites. Of course. That we don't talk about. No, well, we some of us talk about it, but uh, we we don't really do much about it. So am I wrong in saying that when the Republicans talk about crime, they're talking about black people, people of color. Going back to Nixon, we, the Southern strategy in 68 was law and order. And this is the stubborn stain of racism. This is what Ron Johnson is running on yep. in Wisconsin. And crime is dog whistle or we'll make sure uh, we're bothering black people. It's really hard not to draw that conclusion, isn't it? I mean, Netflix has a new series about Jeffrey Dahmer, which is extremely popular. And to I its like credit... I didn't like the acting. He was chewing the scenery. <laughs> That's a good line. It's a great oh, yeah, joke. Sure you should repeat that. Uh, not right away, but I mean, like maybe Monday. Um, but, and people do, do get horrified by that, but they also love it. This is the third series. I haven't seen any of this, but there was an earlier series about the Dahmer murders, which I did watch. And now there's a third one. I think they're all on Netflix. I don't know if... You know, you maybe could watch episode one of one and then go on to episode Why? two of Why another would... one. Why, Why would you? Well, the theory, I mean, to the extent that the, the, the criticism of the new Dahmer film is that it almost makes him appear human. It almost seems to forgive him. You are I'd, what you eat. You are what you eat. That's another good one. You should do this. Um... But but in the in some of these other cases, I mean, Michael Bennett in California, the last poll I saw in Colorado, he was 15 points ahead. He's still raising money, and he he has not taken many controversial positions. And in fact, he he irritated me because when I lived in Washington, he said he didn't want to uh, grant statehood, thus voting rights, for the District of Columbia. The only person running four years ago, as a uh, six years ago as a Democrat, who took that position and won. And now he seems horrified about the prospect uh, that he might have to, he might get reelected and then he might have to vote on these really central issues for democracy. Right. right. Adam Laxalt. I don't get him either. Um, I think I mentioned to you that I, I he's knew running, his. He's running. Yeah, he's running one or two percentage the, points ahead. Yeah, and okay. you know I I know his mother quite well, and uh, ex Laxalt. <laughs> ex Laxalt. Yes. So well, we, we call it. <laughs> <his play. laughs> but but I you know I uh, her name's Michelle. I mean. On that United Auto Workers network I was on for a couple of years, uh, she was my co-host, and uh, uh, but she, it, it, it is not Paul Axalt's kid, you know that. Oh, it isn't. No, it's not. Uh, she had an affair with uh, another senator from New Mexico, 
and uh, eventually that did come out a couple of years ago and she she's a very classy person and she dealt with it very very well but the Laxalt name uh, is what's carrying those extra percentage points so for Adam a real bastard most politicians only play it being those but he's a real bastard <laughs> That's so true. The illegitimate son of Paul Laxalt. Well, he, Paul Laxalt didn't have anything to do with his creation, but were they, uh, were they, yes, were they married? And oh yeah, they were married. And so, and he's a Republican. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, MAGA Republicans. I don't know if he's really a MAGA Republican, well, although he's. Rally. Yeah, he goes to the Trump rallies. I, I don't know if he's actually said that he thinks the election was stolen. Maybe he did. I don't know that. But there's, you know, there's other people who are running who make it very clear that they still believe the 2020 election was stolen. Now, I, let me. I'm just trying to figure out my morality here. Whose fault is it that he's a child out of wedlock? in the Republican Party. Who, who do you blame? Well, the you committed. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I don't think you necessarily have to find anybody to blame. Well, I mean, I, I, it's not Adam Laxalt's fault. Are you sure? I don't even I don't even know when he knew that he had a, a father who was not married to Michelle. I don't know when he knew that. And he's running as a Republican. Yep. On the Laxalt name. Yep. Family values, Republican. Laxalt, the dad, was Ronald Reagan's best friend. Absolutely. It was his, um, he was his campaign manager in the first campaign that Reagan won. And um, I, I, did I ever tell you that so it's story okay. about... It's okay if they do it. It's okay if they commit adultery. Hmm. Right? Yeah, but I mean, whether you can blame the son for that, but he, but I don't know. On, but he's running on the Laxalt name. That's true. But I mean, he never changed his name. He never, I don't know when he knew that Paul Laxalt was not his father. The Republicans but, are obsessed with cucks. Yes, they are. And his dad, he's, he, he kept the name of a cuck. I'm not trying to be cruel here. Sure, he did keep it. He kept yeah, he the did. name of a cuck. Yep. So it feels like the people who would vote for Adam Laxalt in Nevada should know he's a son of a cuck. I think they do know by now. I mean, this this guy. The hypocrisy. An enorm they they yep. hate. It's, hip it's hypocritical for the anti-cucks <laughs> yes. to support the product of a cuck. Yeah. Except, um, I, I, I'm being, it, I got no, You're cruel. being serious. I know you're being serious. No, no, I, somebody just said to me, don't be it, cruel. Look at this mf -er. I'm cruel. <laughs> Anti-abortion. Yeah. I'm cruel. Mm. I'm the bad. I'm always no, bad. no. It's, but I just think I, I was about to ask if I ever told you the time I had uh, the lunch I had with Paul Laxalt. Did I ever tell that story? No. Okay. So one day when I'm doing this show with Michelle Laxalt, she says to me, "You know Ollie North?" And I said, "Yeah." And I I said, "I do." And she said, "My dad, Paul." Uh, love to have you two guys come over for lunch. So I go, I set up a time, we go over for lunch at Laxalt's lobbying office, and uh, I'm late because there's some terrible traffic jam. So I'm a little late, I knock on the door, the secretary shows me in, and North says, Oh, you invite one liberal to lunch, and he's the guy that's late. And I looked at them and I, I said, you know, if this was just a few years ago, I'd look at you, North. I'd look at you, Paul Laxalt. And they also had a, a 
terrible New York congressman named Jerry Solomon who had just joined their lobbying. And I'd say, and the only question I'd have for the three of you is, where's the war going to start tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, but that, that's, that's when Laxalt said, you know, the big mistake we made with the first Reagan year, we did not stack the courts. And we're never going to make that mistake again because the courts are everything. And we just screwed it up. Well, and he when, couldn't stack the courts. The Democrats kept rejecting <laughs> there Ginsburg, Bork, weren't there a that lot? That was the Supreme Court, but I mean, most, you know, 98% of cases in the federal system oh, never right. never end up at the Supreme I, Court. I yeah. They end up with Judge Judy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you're, so you're talking about paying attention to the lower courts. Of course. Yes. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, there have been some astonishing developments in the prosecution or potential prosecution of Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump does not have all of the support he thought he would have if he managed to get so many uh, people uh, serving on these appellate courts where most of the cases end. And now it's all unraveling. It's kind of like when Bill Barr appoints um, a clown who was supposed to investigate lying to the oh, FBI, Durham. Durham. And Durham was the, I mean, he was the totemic animal for the right wing. And of course, earlier this week, he now lost the third case because he couldn't prove that there was lying going on between the person being prosecuted and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. When you when you have cases where Fox News says it's a slam dunk and they said it for years and then he loses every single case, uh, you'd say maybe uh, maybe they should have thought of something else. Maybe they should have thought of some other crime. Have you, have you, I'm curious, most of my listeners, not my, I don't know, most of the people who are active in our chat rooms <laughs> do not believe Russiagate is a real thing that that Putin had no played no role in the election of Donald Trump I'll tell you what I believe I believe Hillary played a major role in the election of Donald Trump <laughs> but mm. I think Putin had about half a trillion dollars to spread around, and he spread it around, and nobody loves money more than Donald Trump, yep. the Republicans, and they took that dark money. And Kevin McCarthy has said this week, <laughs> when they get the House, no blank check for Ukraine. That's right. What are your thoughts? on? No, I think you're likely to be more right than wrong. I, I do think that uh, I think the biggest factors in Hillary Clinton losing uh, at first was this: Did she do something wrong? Did, 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 what about the emails? Uh, the FBI director at the time who managed to tick people off every time he did anything. Well, she you didn't commit a crime, but it's very bad manners or whatever he said and then of course he he clears he appears to clear her that then irritates republicans and then he decides that there's another crime just weeks before the election involving emails that were on her assistant's uh, Huma Abedin's computer and of course Abedin was married to possibly at the time the most hated Democratic politician in America. She was married to Hillary? Hale. No, I was not. <laughs> no, she was, she was married to uh, a guy, I can't oh, even Wiener. think of his name, Wiener. Any, Wiener. Anthony Weiner. Weiner, Weiner. Weiner. And that was, um, and, and the truth, and the fact that, the, that CNN constantly, constantly cut away from their regular programming 
to cover Trump rallies. And I think the reason for that was they ne they didn't want to miss a golden moment when Trump would say something outrageous like, oh, uh, uh, it, it, there's a heckler, uh, we'll take care of him. Or if you, you know, if you sock him, I'll defend you, you know, right. <laughs> and nothing. And Hillary Clinton could give lectures about anything. She could do campaign. Ex she never got the airtime that CNN gave to Donald Trump. So CNN, the FBI director, I think are much bigger causes of her defeat, uh, besides the fact that she really wasn't a terribly good candidate. Do you think uh, Putin had troll farms going yeah. on Facebook and messing with stuff? Oh. I absolutely do that. I do believe that. You know, so here's here's Hillary Clinton who, you know, I've actually, um, I've come to like her much more now that she's not in public office. She's, in fact, you know, she, ne she went on the Howard Stern show some months ago. She never went on during the campaign. And she was downright clever, funny human all the things that people said during the campaign that she wasn't hmm? well she's smart yeah yeah alternative history uh it is three weeks until the midterms i think had hillary won in 2016 we would have been in Ukraine on we would have been arming Ukraine on day one. There would have been wars all over the world. No question. And that's not good. It's not good. No, of course it's not good. And you're right, that's certainly a possible outcome. But the the damage done by Donald Trump what is in so many directions that I don't know that I don't know that she, if she, if she decided to send uh, more weapons or encourage NATO to directly send troops, I don't. She might have done that, but I, but I mean, look at the, look at the disaster that Trump represented. Not just for all the regulations that have been changed, all of the bad economics, all of the frighteningly bad. Uh, information that he gave about COVID and um, the judges that he appointed. Yes. I mean, this is this in the long run could arguably be worse than having a military presence of the United States in Ukraine, much as I hate the thought of, of that climate, In terms of abortion, in terms of climate, in terms of turning back same-sex marriage, uh, in terms of our economy and, and politicians who lie worse than Democrats mm -hmm. about inflation. Uh, again, the, uh, Bill did things that were far worse to our economy than Reagan. The Telecommunications Act. Not to Ralph Reagan, yeah. From Glass, you know, getting rid of Glass-Steagall. Mm-hmm didn't even come close to the damage that that Reagan did. And I'm being serious. Yeah. No, right. Reagan did not do nearly as much damage. And this MF for Bill Clinton, huh. who, you know, I showed a picture of him with Jeffrey Epstein. Yep. She could not govern with him around. He cannot help himself on the tarmac. When he, you know, when he got off, oh, yeah. had to speak to the <laughs> acting attorney general about the, the server. Uh, he cannot help himself. He loves her and he hates her. And, he, <laughs> and you know, he would subconsciously destroy her presidency with scandal. There's a cottage industry that already knows how to investigate him they know his peccadillos they know yeah. how to get him he would he would have dragged her down i do think though the trajectory would have been better 
than <laughs> Trump. Yeah. No, I agree. Or not I mean, the rest of the world. I think No, that's that's true. You would but, have bombed the shit out of I don't mean to be glib here. A lot of no. dead a lot of dead kids. True. He he yeah, I mean she might have done that. I it's very hard to um to replay history or to make the kind of not that it's an illegitimate or uh, unexpected or inexplicable conclusion, but um, I don't know what would the Republicans have been doing? Would they have become even closer to Putin than so many of them are now? Would they be the ones who said, "Wait a minute, we're not going to war. We're not going to another Clinton war," or would they have just gone along and said, "Yep, yeah, well, she's the commander in chief. We don't like that." but we'll send more weapons, more money, and even put troops on the ground. The, the Republicans, I watched uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, testify before the Armed Services Committee about three months after we came out of Afghanistan. And the way some of these Republicans talked to Mark Milley, like Matt Gates. No. Oh. They might as well have been 60s radicals, the way they were talking to the military, the way they talk. Of course, of course. Um, <laughs> the military and the FBI, sure. I'm thinking, why don't the Democrats talk this way? <laughs> well, that's right. And, of course, we, we know just in the last week from those newly released bits of evidence in some of the Trump trials that Trump actually had ordered withdrawal from Afghanistan before the end of his term. Who would have, I wouldn't have believed that. But he, didn't Pompeo make a deal? Uh, <laughs> the deal was, we're gonna pull out. If you don't, if you stop killing our soldiers, we'll pull out next year. I think that was the deal he made with the Taliban. That's why Biden was kind of forced to pull out. Yeah, but I mean, but what I'm talking about is is before the end of the year. Oh, in 2020. Yeah, in, that, that, that he had insisted that someone draft up a statement in which he would say we're withdrawing from Afghanistan. So... But you no, know I'm he's sure. he's in trouble. Be, I mean he's not, you know uh, it's like um, Hillary Clinton made some mistakes. You, when you think about that, when she gave her concession speech in 2016, and she basically uh, basically said, "There's a there's a, a a dome over the earth." I mean <laughs> you know the stupid things. You know on paper, and there was a lot of wishful thinking at some of my idiot friends a lot of well-intentioned friends had about trump that and i remember I'm, I'm remembering this. there were a lot of people who said he needs to be loved and and mm. bothers donald trump is that the liberals in new york city always hated him and he's going to go to washington dc and finally get the love from the liberals he he, he never got and he's going to end the permanent wars, and you know he's going to give us socialized medicine, because <laughs> he, he doesn't need the money. Sure, he's turning <laughs> you know, legacy, and he wants to go down in history, history. and he can do yeah. it. And he can tame. I remember hearing he can tame the Republican Party. Tame the Republican Jackals. Party. <laughs> These battles are out of control. Only <laughs> Trump can rein them in. I, I, I know. Like, it's horrifying. I had people say the same thing. But all they had to do was watch a single Trump rally to know that this guy was not going to put water on flames. He was going to drop gasoline on right. planes, flames and then say, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? And people would say, he doesn't mm. really mean it. And I'd go... Yeah, he doesn't really mean it, but the people with all the guns think they... he really means it, and they don't care whether or not he really means it. And he's ruled by that base. They're in charge. Exactly. You know, exactly. Got, when Hillary 
reminds me of is comedians, uh, they tell a joke. If it works, they keep it in their act. Mm -hmm. He, he's, you know, he tr floats these trial balloons at his rallies. And if it gets a big response, the people have spoken. You got he, it. He's ruled by that base, not the other way around. It's that he's, he's <laughs> just figuring out what these deplorables, I'm sorry they are, what they want. Yeah. And that's why most stand up comedy sucks because the <laughs> audience is dictating what the, the material, sure. material as opposed to the comedian like monty python is <laughs> test material on their audience they told mel brooks woody <laughs> allen you sure. Mar you know marty sure they don't care <laughs> what the audience thinks I i'm here to tell you what's funny it's called <laughs> leadership you but got it it's just the audience this works okay shoot uh, bleach into your bloodstream <laughs> with your COVID. Yeah, people can believe all kinds of weird things. It's, uh, you know, even uh, um, Tucker Carlson, you know, who I think is among the most disgusting people I've ever met. Um, but, uh, you know, he made it clear on, on television the other night, I always watch 15 minutes of Fox, that the Centers for Disease Control is going to require COVID vaccinations for anyone who goes to school, which would mean that if you have a first grader, they'll have to get the first grader vaccinated. And Tucker Carlson made that clear the other night. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we have a religious right nut of the week. I didn't send it to you. Okay, I'd like to look at it then, and I do. I want to talk about one other thing. Okay, but let, play the play the clip. Let's well, see. Know, if I... We do a disservice on this show. We we Why? talk a lot about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah, and that's unfair to Lauren Boebert, who is equally equally <laughs> that shit crazy. Yes. Yep. We like we you know we need to give both sides of the bad. <laughs> shit crazy argument and uh, lauren bobert god bless her she yeah. is a republican congresswoman first term fresh woman from colorado <laughs> and you know she's a christian nationalist yes, and she is she gave a speech uh i believe uh to the knoxville tennessee uh, to a knoxville tennessee where was it yeah it was in knoxville tennessee she was in knox county uh for the republican party lincoln day dinner and mm. you know how many people in knoxville tennessee <laughs> love lincoln oh yeah there was there's a huge fan base for oh that. my god lincoln, <laughs> lincoln. All about oh we loved him yeah all about it. i believe yeah. that if lincoln <laughs> Came back to life, he would be uh, a states' rights Republican. So here is okay. Let's hear it. Here is let's hear it. Lauren Boebert at the Knox GOP okay. Lincoln Day dinner. Uh, here we go. Okay. I'm so happy to be in Knox County. Thank you so much, Congressman Burgess. I've been here with two words. Let's go, Brandon. <laughs> it is something else to be serving in our nation's capital right now. In all seriousness, there is a calling on each and every one of you to be involved and to rise up. It is an honor to serve in this time. I believe that many of us in this room believe that we are in the last of the last days. <clears throat> That's not a time to complain. That's not a time to grumble, to be dismayed, to be disheartened, but a time to rejoice. You get to be a part of ushering in the second coming of Jesus. Uh. 
That's uh, Jesus getting, that would be Jesus getting a round of applause. Absolutely. Well, not the first Jesus, but the second one. The second coming. Yeah, yeah, the second one. By the way, you couldn't see the podium, but it said Rothschild on it. Rothschild, I swear really. To you. No, I, don't, I swear no, to God. No. I swear to oh. you, Rothschild on it. I believe it. Oh. So, well, you know, I, I, I hadn't gotten any clips. If you sent them, I didn't get them. No, I didn't send them. That's okay, because I found a couple of things, and I just want to mention them to you, because this has something to do with a guest I'm going to have for us next week. There was a mural painted by a high school student in Grant, Michigan. It was part of a competition to brighten up the middle school health center and the students were supposed to suggest ideas uh, to paint images of these are their words smiling children as well as the message stay healthy in the painting there are three children a boy is seen in light blue pink and a white t-shirt the colors of the transgender pride flag a girl wears pink royal blue and purples the colors of the bisexual flag and a second girl is in rainbow pride colors now that's pretty weird that they would notice that but parents were upset about it and then they discovered a few other features that were not in the proposal for the painting including a demon face inspired by the popular video game Genshin Impact and a Hamsa hand, also known as the hand of Fatima or the hand of Mary. That's a palm shaped design that has been used as a symbol for good luck in many parts of the world, particularly in Latin America. Now, this has upset the community of Grant, Michigan, so much that they have somehow managed to talk the student who did the painting into correcting it and taking away the LGBT and uh, possibly demonic symbols. Mm. And this is just the beginning because another thing that just happened this week from the religious right, book burning, people think, oh, we don't do that anymore, uh, but they do. Greg and Locke. Greg Locke, and he's at it again. Uh, on Halloween night, he is encouraging another huge bonfire where you will take not just um, records, uh, horror movies, uh, burn them, video games, burn them, Dungeons and Dragons equipment, you know, b get rid of that. And um, he, he is also uh, against something called the Masonic Bible, which is uh, a version of, of the Christian Bible used by the Masons, and the Masons are themselves uh, viewed by the religious right as a demonic presence. And I mention these two things because they all involve things that we thought had gone away, that the right was so interested now in critical race theory there that they were going to give up on worrying about Satanism in the schools, but they haven't. And I, I do, I just talked to probably one, the most uh, well-known Wiccan priestess in the country today, and she would love to come on next week and talk about the civil rights of Wiccans and pagans. Tens of thousands of people identify in that way in this country, and they are still the subject of enormous public opposition yeah I, I, absolutely now yep. you know halloween's around the corner yep so, yeah it is and uh you know she will talk about that but uh, she was very much uh involved in a couple of things that i i did at uh, americans united uh defending uh, pagans and wiccans and uh she'd be delighted uh to share some of the great. current controversy and and Joe in Norway, who does the cooking segment, will hmm. make candy apples with razor blades in them to um, have a wicked. Now, let, me, let me just say to Joe and to you, you are so, you're out of date. 
razor blades are not the thing anymore. It's fentanyl that's okay. going to be in the kids' candy. But now, I also want to, just, we're, we're running out of time, but I just want to say this. I said four things tonight that are demonstrably 100% false. And I was curious, it was a little thought experiment. Would anybody in the chat say, wait a minute, that's not true. When Hillary Clinton, but these are all things, rumors that are out on the internet. Of course, uh, Hillary Clinton did not talk about some kind of a, of a uh, shield over the United States, a ceiling. She was talking about a glass ceiling for women. And she said, I worry the glass ceiling may have caught me, but there are plenty of women who will break it one of these days. So she didn't. She didn't think we had a flat Earth and a, and oh, a dome I, I, over it. You did say that. Yeah, I did say that. No, I said that there's a dome over them because this is these all. How about this one, T Tucker Carlson? That that's not true either. He did say that this. Centers for Disease Control is going to do that, but that's not who sets the vaccination standards for any state. Every state has a board that considers what vaccinations will be permissible in the event uh, that a new vaccine is developed. So Tucker Carlson says it, now it's all over the social media, but it's also a lie. And just to, to prove um, the New York City's crime statistics, that, that is a story, the story of the cab driver who picks people up and then kills them and harvests their insides. That's also not true. That is a persistent rumor, not just in New York, but in other cities in the United States and indeed around the world. But it's resurfacing today. And I was curious if anybody would. And The Simpsons, by the way, it's true. We did watch it religiously. But it is not true that they predicted the day of Queen Elizabeth II's passing. That is not true either, but that's widespread enough that PolitiFact and other fact-checking organizations have looked into it and declared, in all of these cases, pants on fire, which is kind of the, the worst lies to be told. And I, and I mentioned this, and I did this uh, not just because I didn't have any clips and because he didn't send them, but because it's so easy for any of us to listen to somebody and say, well, I mean, the guy said it, it must be true. And people on the left, I like to think we're a little bit more sensitive, that we're not going to buy into this junk, and people on the right. But uh, I'll tell you, it's, um, <laughs> it's amazing. And I, there was a guy who wrote a book about pranks. He was a guy, he, I, I, I was trying to find the book earlier. I think it fell on me yesterday. But um, the he, he, like he would he would go into a big store like a Barnes and Noble in New York City and announce that he was there for his reading, and he and he he would fake a Russian accent, and uh, he he would say, "If uh, you read my poetry," and they'd set him up as if he. <laughs> was going to do a reading of Russian poetry. And people sat down and listened to him, and it was all a hoax. But hoaxes is need... Is Alan Abel? Alan Abel. No, I think Alan Abel was the guy that started the rumor about animals wearing clothing. Wasn't he the guy? I was, <laughs> he was one of his soul. One of his soul really? really? Yes, he was yep. on the show. He was a very funny man. Destiny he... Colbert in the <laughs> in college. In pedestrian toll booths. People would pay they toll. believe it. Yeah, Omar yeah. Beck. People should know who Alan Abel is. Yeah. We have to wrap it up. Okie doke. Great Alan Abel. Look him up. Great. A -A Absolutely. A B E L, I believe. A -B -E -L. Alan Abel. A -B -E -L. And there's a documentary his daughter made about him and one of the great pranksters of all time. One of the great. 
We yeah. just lost him. There's a document, and he's on my. Go to my website. Okay. Type in Alan Abel. He and <laughs> Henry uh, used to go on talk shows in the fifties and the sixties, trying to clothe naked animals. <laughs> they complained that you know children were saying animals. <laughs> Yeah, and, mm. and they need to all be wearing diapers and little old ladies would send them money to help their <laughs> cause they took, they took them serious and now oh. now i think <laughs> reverend yeah if buck henry and our people <laughs> were still alive they could do it again and and Absolutely. We'd have to clothe. <laughs> clothe the naked animals. And, uh, well, you know, at least you can say if you put clothing on animals, it's least it's better than taking their fur to make coats. Well said, Reverend. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Go to barrywlin.com. Glad you're feeling better. And, and uh, I'm glad the book case. <laughs> Uh, Jesus, that's scary. The thought of that yeah. falling on I know. It's really bad. Oh, God. It just Terrible. Stinks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Selena Fox and I will be back uh, next week, and uh, we'll talk about life for pagans and Wiccans in America, probably the most hated religious group there is. My kind of people. Yeah. We love them. Coming okay. up. Thank you, Reverend. Stay out of Thank trouble. You. Only good trouble. Thank you. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Coming up, the professors and Mary Ann. By the way, we do not approve of book burning on this show. We support book boiling. It's better for the econ It's better for the environment if you boil your books. Um, a federal jury in Manhattan has said that Kevin Spacey does not have to pay uh, Mr. Rapp, who sued him for battery. Anthony Rapp uh, will not be getting any money from Kevin Spacey. Rapp said that Spacey back in 1986 pinned him to a bed when he was 14 years old and fondled him. Uh, the jury took 90 minutes to reach a decision that said Kevin Spacey is not liable. I think that's the second case uh, where they, they lost in court accusing Kevin Spacey. <clears throat> when we come back, we will be joined by the professors and Mary Ann. But first, some much needed music from Professor Mike Steinel. <laughs> If you're thinking about going south to the Sunshine State, I suggest that you may want to think twice. I suggest that you may want to wait. They got a man named Ron DeSantis. He's got a face like a praying mantis. I'm quite sure he ain't gonna grant us permission to say gay. So if you are a teacher, you better mind your P's and Q's. A lot of people down there got the wrong DeSantis blues. They say if Trump pulls out or if he goes to jail, DeSantis is the next man up. They say he might prevail. The man is on a mission to do everything he can to improve his position so he can be the man that moves into the White House up in Washington, D.C. If that gives you the willies, you better sing along with me. I got the wrong DeSantis blue. DeSantis blue I got the wrong DeSantis blue I got the wrong DeSantis blue Santa 
Jesus blues From my head down to my shoes You can bet your bottom dollar He's against the right to choose We can only guess what he might do To the LGBT and Q We've all seen this playbook before Civil rights will be out the door But if he don't win the election There may be a ray of hope But then again the Republicans Will just find some other dope Don't forget about Sarah Palin Who's taking time to reload The path to 2024 Might be a crazy road You know it might behoove us To bring back that crazy doofus I'm talking about the orange-haired goon With the tan like a silly raccoon But for now I'm following the news Don't have no time to schmooze Gotta keep my eye on Ted Cruz While I sing the wrong DeSantis blues I got the wrong DeSantis blues Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel, the Ron DeSantis Blues, the most, one of the more despicable human beings uh, in America. Joining us is Professor Marianne Cummings, particle physicist, Professor Adnan Hussein, who hosts, co-hosts, Gorilla History and the Mudgeless Podcast. He is uh, chairman of the religion department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, every Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. I am learning about the Crusades, and you can too by going to adnanhussein.org. Uh, learn, it's a great class. Uh, Professor Ann Lee joins us. She writes over at the Daily Co's. Her handle is Annie Lee at Annie Lee, A-N-N-I-E-L-I. And Professor Jonathan Bick joins us, and he will be at office hours teaching Star Trek and the Twilight Zone. Welcome. Let's do our, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Professor Ann Lee at midnight writes a, a, a nightly update on Ukraine. Uh, did we win? Is it over? Have we defeated Putin? Oh, um, actually, he's in a lot more trouble, but I think maybe we want to talk about sushi first. Oh, I'm, you're right. I'm sorry. More important. Uh, hey, oof, that was a close one. Yes. I'm going to barely make it within an hour. Yeah, you're uh, making sushi. <laughs> heat up. Heat up. Joe in Norway is making sushi. What are you making? Morning, David. Yeah, I thought I'd uh, show you how to prepare rice for sushi. And if I have enough time to cool it down, I'll roll a kapumaki, which is the cucumber roll, and maybe a tamaki with some roasted uh, sweet potato, shredded carrot, scallions, and okidaki, and okidaki mushrooms. So this, this will be the, uh, the savory uh, vinegar sauce that you mix with the, the rice after it's cooked and the kombu to give a little umami flavor to the, to the rice. But I got to get cracking. Get cracking. Unbelievable. Uh, back, to, back, back to Professor Ann Lee. Uh, so he's in, well, he's been in trouble since February, but... Still, still is in trouble. Um, he uh, enacted what is sort of uh, de facto martial law across all of Russia. Um, it's a little stronger in the in the regions close to Ukraine, but generally, or the one report says that 
it's actually um, it's you know you have more police powers and there's more controls over traffic. Uh, the police can stop any any vehicle, for example, and they're restricting movement between regions. Now, how 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 rigid that is, I, I'm not sure. And it's pretty clear that they have to do a lot of uh, trade and stuff. So I don't think it's going to be as rigorous, but it is pretty clear that it's not simply about the uh, the four annexed prov uh, oblasts. Wow. I, I, at the top of the show, I said it was the four annexed provinces. I didn't know it was martial law throughout all of Russia. Well, it's it's not declared quite like that. They said they refer. Uh, I think the it's probably different in Russian, but it's some sort of basic something or other that applies to the entire entire nation. But it's applied obviously more seriously in the air in the oblasts closer to Ukraine. And why does that mean he's in trouble? Well, it's not so much in trouble. It's just that uh, I think the, the populace is going to go, oh, no, going to get more, you know, it seems a little more repressive when people are going to stop you for no fucking reason. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, it, you know, and, and uh, maybe it's just a, a little bit more authoritarianism than usual. That's all. Right. Is it being an authoritarian leader is it that hard these days to keep people in line? What what does modern history tell us? I, I kind of suspect it is harder. I don't think so. I think you you'll begin to see more uh, more police presence everywhere. Probably, um, you know, it's going to be, uh, and also things aren't going to be are going to be. Be reported on less, which is the the current issue. Right. I think the 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 thing is, it's some of it is face saving because uh, the current report from Ukraine is that uh, they've mined the uh, uh, Kakarov um, uh, Dam. It's in uh, it's on the Dnipro and uh, it's above Kherson. Um, has a a reservoir, and uh, the Russians have mined it so that. Uh, if they retreat back over the Dnieper, they're going to blow it up and uh, flood 80 villages and towns. It's going to be a major disaster um, if they do it. So they're threatening to do that. This is in the absence of all this uh, palaver about uh, nuclear weapons, which has gone back and forth and is, uh, on the one hand, silly. On the other hand, you know, interesting, just from a disinformation point of view, which is kind of the thing I'm, I'm more amused by. These, so that, you know, I hear, I, I hear Republicans saying they're scared that he's going to use tactical nuclear weapons. What yeah, you, the, the Republicans are doing that so they can cut the budget. You know, it's fear mongering just so that, uh, oh, well, we don't want to get involved. We'll just cut all our aid to Ukraine. Oh, and, and, and in the counter counter move there is that uh, I think we're trying to um, secure a $50 billion uh, uh, increment before um, the next Congress. So that's going to come in in December. You're talking about a continuing resolution to keep the government open. Yes. So it'll still be put in there. And by that time, there may actually be another attack. But uh, uh, the current view is that uh, the Russians are are still incredibly disorganized for all the usual reasons and anticipate probably some uh, invade a, a new uh, offensive that the kind of offensive that they originally wanted to do at the beginning of this war. And they're going to try it again, I think. Um, I think that's why they've made this feint towards uh, uh, raising more arms and also launching more missiles from Belarus, which is what they did. The recent missile attacks is kind of 50 50 from other places and Belarus. So that's what's going on uh, on the ground. Um, otherwise, everything is pretty much the same <laughs> for a war. Uh, there are there are interesting sidelights. You know, the, the Swedes managed to get a camera down to the um, uh, the damaged Nord Stream pipe and 
to show that it did get damaged. It's not that bad, actually. So that it's actually interesting to, to see it in that condition. Um, you know, lots of and, other things. And uh, sabotage? Ahead. Were they are they certain it's sabotage? Well, the the assessment was that uh, uh, several small uh, explosives were placed against the pipe. That's what that's the claim. Uh, you know, whatever whatever interpretation you want to raise in that particular point. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, it's the usual. We need more weapons. The um, the current uh, uh, media frame is that uh, members of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard are um, functionally on the ground with uh, Russian troops because they can manage the launching of these uh, uh, Iranian uh, missiles of, of a variety of types. And it's not all small, you know, 40, uh, 40 kilogram um, uh, uh, munition type uh, uh slow drones they they actually say that they're going to that they and they have actually launched slightly larger iranian missiles as well so it looks like that's kind of where they're getting all those things from otherwise there's traffic jams and it's really a pain in the ass and kirsch and a variety of other things are happening um we'll hmm. see anybody want to ask professor lee a question or make a comment did I hear you right? Iranian missiles? Russians are using Iranian missiles? Drones. Drones. They're using drones. Iranian drones. That's not even clear because I've seen on various military blogs that, you know, for instance, the Kalishnikov company or the company that owns Kalishnikov actually makes these type of kamikaze drones, which look a lot like Iranian drones. I don't know if Iran... I, I, Iran is happy to like, you know, claim credit for Yeah. The, yeah, um, no, no, the, the parents it's, it's a big in, deal in, the Iranians. Yeah, uh, I I'm kind of surprised that Russia would have to rely on Iran for anything really. But, you know, uh No, they're, they they're cheaper. A, they they, they, they are in, in a um they are in an alliance at least, you know, they are uh they are cooperating on, on other things, so maybe this is just a little show it's, of goodwill yeah it's much more complicated than that of course it it uh and iran is uh i think happy to do it because it's uh it's a promotion for them i mean in the sense mm -hmm. that they can produce these things relatively cheap and they are very cheap they're 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 small they they don't use very complicated technology they use a, a simple gps in other words, they're not guided. You just they just you just plug in the whatever the GPS coordinates, you just launch it, and then it sort of gets there, I think, and, and also allows for some delay, I think, for loitering. So that's kind of what they have. But the point is that um, the original order, I think, is committed for 2,400 of them, and uh, the Ukrainians have shot down 233 so far. So, you know, it, it's... I don't think it's going to be a lot at, at that moment. And of course, they, they have other drones, too. I mean, they've, they, they have Chinese drones and blah, blah, blah. And then there's the, the uh, underlying discourse on whether Iron Dome should be, you know, and there's some pressure to get Iron Dome in Ukraine. And it's uh, the political elements are there. And then the, the other complications of Turkey. I think Turkey is out of out of drones i think they they sold all their drones so um or they they haven't been uh caught up in terms of building it and the us i think is close to the end of a kind of drone production so we're we're looking at uh, production cycles essentially and also the the russians have just gone you know crazy and and launching stuff and as i said they're they're down to i think some people estimate 20 to 30% of their uh, mid-range uh, missiles missile stores uh, uh, supply is is uh, available so they've been you know they've they've thrown a lot of material at uh, at the ukrainians i i know this is kind of boring detail but these no, it's things it, it terrorized people in Kyiv. that's the bigger deal is that uh you know people they just you know, you're and, and they've had air alerts every pretty much every day. Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine has never not had an air alert a day 
they have multiple air alerts every day, pretty much. The, the Twitter shows how um, the regions for air alert, then you get these in, incredible numbers of air alerts, and they're not the same as the fires data, the, the actual firing of, you know, the, where you see heat, heat signatures. It's just that, you know, the, you, you wake up and in the middle of the day, you got to go to the shelter. You know, that's, it's that kind of terrorism in that sense. Well, thank you for that. Everybody should read Professor Ann Lee over at the Daily Kos. She writes about a lot of things, including Ukraine. Follow her over at the Daily Kos. Her handle is at Annie Lee, A-N-N-I-E-L-I. -E and Professor Bick, what would you like to talk about? I, there are other things I know Professor Lee wants to talk about, but what would you like to talk about, Professor Bick? Um, well, I want to talk about the uh, upcoming election in the U.S. a little bit. Uh, just in case there are any uh, independents who are viewing your program, um, like to make an appeal to them. It, it seems that the polls are showing that uh, independents are moving uh, in the direction of uh, voting for Republicans in the congressional elections on November Amazing. 8th. Amazing. Um, so I'd like to say that if you are thinking of voting for Republicans because, say, uh, inflation is high, um, it's important to know that they will do nothing to lower inflation. Uh, about half of inflation is due to corporations rising prices simply because they can. About a third of inflation is due to rising, uh, the rising cost of housing, uh, especially rent. So my question is, what will Republicans do uh, to stop corporations from price gouging? What policies have they mentioned to rein in the malfeasance of big business? My answer is nothing, and they never have. Uh, in fact, the reason for the existence of the Republican Party, it seems to me, is to make sure that big business can do whatever it damn well pleases. Exactly. <laughs> Unlike, of course, Biden and the Democrats. Well, I do think there is a difference, though. I mean, the Democrats do support um, uh, regulation, at least. Uh, there is a consumer protection bureau that the, is, exists not because of Republicans, but because of Democrats. And that's returned um, millions of dollars to Americans uh, after they've been ripped off by financial institutions and, and other businesses. And they're, the Justice Department is prosecuting antitrust cases. They're losing them. They just lost another one this week. And they have Lena Khan over at the FTC, who is advocating on behalf of smaller corporations, uh, smaller corporations being less inflation. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, I agree that the Democratic Party is a flawed party uh, and it's responsible for a lot of the suffering that uh, people are going through in the United States. But in comparison to the Republicans, um, you know, it's not even a competition. Um, what are the Republicans going to do to reduce the cost of housing? Um, have they said they're going to support uh, building public housing? Uh, do they have plans for increasing the amount of affordable housing? Uh, do they favor rent control or other measures to restrain the avarice of landlords? What policies do Republicans support to bring down the cost of rent and housing? I'd love to hear it. It's just crickets. What, what do they support that's going to do the market. That? the market, the market? Oh, wow. The magic market. Well, the, the market's been operating for a very long time and we keep getting more and more luxury housing and more and more expensive housing that people have to go into debt for generations in order to uh, afford a house. Because the government spends money, it, the government drives up the cost of rent and the cost of college by subsidizing people's rent and education. 
Yeah. Yeah. Professor John, I have to push back some what? Yes, that's true. The, the, the Republicans offer nothing. But a lot of these, the problems with gentrification is happening in democratic controlled cities. You know, notably Boston, notably Chicago, where basically, you know, there's no support for uh, modest income and low income housing. There's an awful lot of support for quote, economic development and you know, doing nothing for blighted areas except for you know, just forcing people out and then selling them to developers, which will you know, provide upscale condos and, and apartments and you know, for stores that can cater to the affluent. So you know, um, I'm kind of tired. I, I think that the, the problem is the Democrats are playing the good cops to the Republicans' bad cops in the same scam. And the number one target of democratic leadership is not Republicans. It is crushing any, any chance of a real progressive takeover of the Democratic Party. Right. I, I agree with all of that. It's uh, three weeks it, before the midterms. It, 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 excuse me for one second. By the way, I was, being, I was giving the Republican argument against subsidizing people's education. Yeah, I know. I know, I do, but people don't under. So they go, Feldman's against uh, three weeks before the educate uh, the educate three weeks before the election. Uh, I feel we can have this fight, and I'm on your side. But three weeks before the midterms, uh, we've already had this fight. Now we have to join together and defeat the Republicans. Three and weeks before agree. the midterms, the Democratic Party has not given a dime to uh, to a very progressive candidate in a very competitive district, the Texas 15th Congressional District. That district, on the whole, voted at the narrow margin, but voted for Biden, went for Biden in 2020. Uh, her name is Michelle Vallejo. Uh, Alaminsky had her on the uh, on the <clears throat> on the Zoom meeting for the Progressive Democrats of America about a week ago, and uh, finally, finally, Bernie Sanders endorsed her this week, but none of the squad has come down. She's getting no Democratic money. Um, the race, by all measures, is very competitive. Uh, I haven't seen much polling out of it. She doesn't really have the money to do that, so it's. You know, uh, the Democrats are happy to lose to the Republicans if it means preventing progressives, real progressives, not performative ones, not the ones they can bring to heel from getting elected. I think people should be getting a little tired of this now. Oh, I, I'm, I am more than a little tired of it. I'm, I'm just pointing out that I can agree with everything you said and still want the Democrats to win um, the congressional elections, because I don't see how things get better at all. I, I only see things getting worse uh, if Republicans control either house of Congress. And um, so if I have a choice between bad and worse, I'm going to choose bad. Well, not if this bad prevents better from ever happening. That's the problem I had. I was kind of with you a few years ago, but now I just see it's a ratcheting effect. You know, we've got to vote, we've got to vote for the Democrats and the Democrats do everything they can to be just epsilonically less horrible than the Democrat and the Republicans. And what they actually do, they may have nicer rhetoric, but, and of course, I've I'm surprised the phone isn't ringing now because it usually starts ringing at this time of night and it's somebody asking me for money, you know, because, oh my God, Roe v. Wade. And I said, you guys could go tomorrow if you were serious. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's, she, she's crazy. And the, and the Republicans took away her chairmanships and she took away her committee assignments. She doesn't, she doesn't care. She's still at it. The Democrats do nothing to punish the likes of cinema and mansion for squelching 
any of the legislation that could have possibly helped the Democrats win. I mean, a real build back, I can't, I hate the name of that, but I mean, there were some in the original ones, there was some, in, there was some sub substantive stuff at the core, just the uh, revisions, which were not minor to Medicare. That those were three, the, the three conditions, the lowering the age, the uh, including dental and vision and the ability to negotiate drug prices. These were not trivial minor universal, changes. Universal preschool, paying for mm -hmm. uh, home care workers. There was a lot of stuff in there that they got rid of. And just to cater to this guy or, you know, but just to cater to Manchin or sometimes it's the parliamentarian. I mean, this is, you know, just done. Uh, at least when Trump was in office, like a, everything he did and said got trumpeted, so to speak, all over the press. Everybody was hyper aware. You know, people were motivated. But, you know, Democrats just have this ever since Obama, I have noticed, just to put the left to sleep and, you know, getting a little better and then getting way worse and then getting a little better and getting way worse as you're continue, continually drifting that whole little oscillation to the right is just kind of what I see. Now, I have no control over it now. I mean, uh, I'm working for local candidates, but I did send some money to Vallejo uh, uh, down, in, uh, down in Texas. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, you're doing what you can do. Uh, and but my question is, if the Democrats lose, will there be any price to pay for the Dem leadership? Or are Dems still going to allow Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to stay in power? Well, I, I, for God's sake, Trump won the election uh, for president. Uh, did, did the Democratic leadership pay a, a cost? No. They didn't. No. I mean, and but that you know much... why? Because we were willing to still keep voting for those a-holes. Whether we vote for them or not, they seem to be willing to do it. So I, I, I don't know if that is the factor that's going to make the difference. I think you've got to have voting and then you've got to have uh, agitating outside of the voting process. Yes. And there is some things happening in the states. I mean, there are people pushing ranked choice voting that will eventually enable, that will make third parties more viable. Maybe not more viable to be elected, but certainly more viable as threats to the Democratic Party. That could work. But, but so you, you agree with me then that the Democrats are not gonna learn a lesson if they lose the House and the Senate. They are not going to lose a lesson. They're not going to learn a lesson if they believe that basically we have nowhere else to go. The people who identify themselves even as progressive Democrats have nowhere else to go. And, you know, this last time Trump, Ooga Booga, we did get the squad who promised that they would bring the ruckus to the House within the Democratic Party. Well, we kind of play that was four years ago. <laughs> so that kind of played out. Now we have to either get a few people who genuinely will gum up the works, or we have to put our, our, our money and our efforts more locally, more on the states. I mean, that's what the Republicans did 30 years ago. They focused on states. They focused on local elections. They weren't worried about the next one or two election cycles. They had they weren't putting all their their chips on one candidate or the other. They were looking long term. I, I guess they did have the luxury, though, of knowing that the other party was not trying to subvert the democratic process. Um, what? I witnessed twice <laughs> the the, the, demo, the uh, nomination for Bernie for Sanders the entire getting country. stolen. I witnessed, you know, as. I witnessed a coup happening right in front of our eyes. And did we storm the Capitol and cause those people to wet their pants and maybe switch some of their, vote, some of their votes from, from uh, George W. Bush to Al Gore? No, we didn't. And we lost democracy like decades ago. I mean, everybody wringing their hands over it now. It's, it's... 
I mean, but they don't take us seriously because they don't think we're serious. Well, I guess my point was that the Republicans know that if they lose an election, that the Democrats are not going to do anything that's going to make their long term goals impossible. Bingo, Professor John. Whereas, (laughs) whereas we're in a, but we're in a position now where if the Republicans will do that, they will make sure that the machinery of government will never allow Democrats to implement, uh, or let me say progressive Democrats to implement uh, significant changes in policy. Oh, they did. Regular Democrats are already doing that. I mean, if they're getting money from the same people, they're 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 doing the same. They're doing the same bidding. They just put a better face on it. I, I, I just don't see where we're in a better position if the Republicans are in charge of the House or the Senate. My neighborhood was not in a better position when the Trumpy took over and the Republicans took over. Things didn't get worse. Actually, things kind of got better, but that was me. <laughs> Park <laughs> District Commissioner. So anyway, it, it, I, I, look, I, I, I understand everything you're saying. And I would a few years ago, I would have been right there with you. But, um, you know, I, I think really... And now the Democrats, of course, you know, they what they thought was Russia. And, you know, like 50 percent of the Democrats polling as late as 2019 really believed that Russians interfered interfered directly with the November elections. Of course, what else could it be? You know, well, well they, they probably did interfere, but that was not the uh, reason the Democrats lost. Exactly. But. You know, they had a whole, that was one of the litany of excuses that they had for why they lost, even though, you know, Hillary got most of the, uh, the popular vote. But, you know, what I'm saying is that there needs, there is, there is no cohesion of the, uh, of the progressives right now. And they're just in disarray. I could see why they thought the experiment of justice Democrats could possibly be a way in. It's not working. It's um, it, it's going to be hard to think of a strategy to make things better. But you know, uh, I think you first have to, as Lawrence O'Donnell said, as, and he should know, as he said back in 2007. I worked in the for the Democrats in the Senate for over 20 years. I never once had to listen to the left on anything. And he said, if the left wants the party to push in its direction, it's got to be able to not vote. And you have to make that, you have but to make what, that what element is, clear. So is- well, I, I agree with that, but they have to be in office in order to withhold their vote in Congress. What is Who there- Who has to be in office? Maybe we have to get rid of these Democrats. Well, Maybe I mean, the, progressive the, Demo- Demo- the progressive Democrats have to be in office in order to withhold their vote um, in Congress. That's what you were just saying, right? That that the progressives that are there, when the Democrats have a majority, should say, look, you're either going to include progressive priorities or we're going to withhold our votes and none of this is going to pass. Well, they had their shot. They had their shot, you know, right after 2020. I mean, they coordinated to make sure that enough of them abstained so that the Capitol Police, you know, got their big increase. Oh, they could they could coordinate on that vote, but a vote on Medicare for all on forcing basically not voting for the infrastructure or build back better unless a $15 minimum wage. They needed all of their Nancy Pelosi needed all of their votes for that one. They didn't do that. So I think their window, you know, the rare opportunity where that particular group of people could have used their leverage is now closing. Right. And but if we if we ever hope that they, you know, are, are change their mind and are able to do it in the future because of an outside uh, movement, uh, Occupy Wall Street type movement, they have to be in power in order to engage in that tactic that you're talking about. 
Yeah, if the well, Republicans they didn't, they are, if the Republicans power, have the Congress, that's not it. gonna make a difference. <laughs> we gotta get a, like different people. And you know, I'm sorry. Obama, but, you know, in, as I said, not to pile yeah. on, but Obama was president in 2011, but he didn't have the House, and he didn't have the, he did have the Senate, though, I think. Did he have it? His Justice that? Department encouraged a crackdown on the Occupy Wall Street protesters. So. But the Occupy did, you know, give us the 99% type, you know, rhetoric. So that has persisted. Consciousness did change. It just didn't change enough, you know, and the centrists ultimately co-opted. I mean, you know, was Occupy supposed to last as long as it did? And it, it, it should have evolved into something much more integrated into the party, but it didn't. It gave us Bernie. It gave us uh, Hillary in trouble in 2016. It wasn't a coronation. Occupy, for the first time in my lifetime, we talked about income inequality. Nobody was talking about it. We had John Edwards in 2008 talking about the two Americas, but nobody, until Occupy in 2011, nobody was talking about the one percent gobbling up everything it set the stage for uh the le the the new left to emerge my, my question let me ask professor adnan hussein this and professor ann lee uh is there a left in america this Maybe left there's no left left uh you know after all i mean i guess here's here's uh my observation on the state of the current democratic party is of course it's not going to learn any lessons when it loses the house it's going to blame the left for because which are the districts they're going to lose they're going to be the close districts obviously aoc is going to get back in because you know the democratic party hasn't put forward a credible primary year against her because well she hasn't maybe merited it you know i mean um but uh we will see people in those purple districts or whatever um losing their seats to extreme right-wing republicans and um the party is going to blame the progressives that uh america's you know not interested in their far left agenda and you know uh, they have CRT, and uh, that's losing us the elections. That they uh, had um, a bad slogan, you know, to end police, you know, to contest police brutality, defund the police. This is why we're losing. So they're not going to learn any lessons. They're going to blame the progressives, and uh, the situation is is such that even the left option that we had arise from. Occupy Wall Street, Bernie Sanders and his movement. Um, they're not embracing him. He, you know, there, there's all this talk that he's going to go on this uh, tour to try and increase turnout because he recognizes that the economic message has not been made. Instead, it's on these other kinds of issues that we hoped might, you know, motivate and bring people out, like Roe v. Wade and the abortion. Uh, um, uh, issue and so on it looks like now maybe that isn't going to work and um he's trying to counter with this economic message but it's not clear whether candidates are actually going to appear with him there's a lot of discussion um that uh, the centrist uh, democrats don't want to be campaigning with bernie sanders i mean this is outrageous you know He's still one of the more popular politicians in the Democratic Party, certainly among the congressional Democrats. And the idea that you would reject and repudiate, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, attempting to save your bacon. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable to me. That shows that there really is no 
I guess what Marianne is saying about the fact that they would rather, they would rather have the Republicans in fundraise against, uh, you know, uh, against them, play the resistance game uh, that they did under Trump, uh, than they would actually try to be responsible for uh, socioeconomic appeal to voters and stand by, you know, policies um, that might galvanize people and improve, you know, society. And instead, I do believe that we are under threat. The extreme right-wing Republicans will uh, further destroy democracy and uh, perhaps make it difficult uh, for progressives or even the left of any kind to um, win future elections through voter suppression and various techniques um, in our very undemocratic uh, system already. And when I see things like Lauren Boebert um, introducing a kind of uh, Christian nationalist accelerationism, okay, it's not the just the Christian nationalism that we heard, you know, earlier from Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's now accelerationism, okay, because uh, we are all now participating in the second coming, you know. Um, uh, and I think the response and reaction to it really misses the boat on the theology behind this uh, and what the implications are here. Uh, some of the um, you know criticisms of her statement at this fundraiser in Knox County in Tennessee um, uh, criticize that you know how how can you adequately represent any constituent who does who, who does not believe in this end times prophecy? Can you really have someone making decisions on your behalf that thinks nothing they do now will matter? Uh, they don't get it. The whole point is is that everything you do now matters in ushering in the apocalypse, and that is what their politics in this extreme fascistic way is organized around, you know, um, basically a kind of chaotic uh, vision. Um, and, you know, I, I think she earlier she said, um, how many AR-15s do you think Jesus would have had um, to a crowd in, in Colorado? And her conclusion, well, he didn't have enough to keep his government from killing him. Okay, so these people have a very strange theology that is rejecting normal Christianity, which is in fact that, you know, Jesus's sacrifice was actually necessary. You know, it was a necessary part of salvation history to redeem everybody from sin. Instead, you know, um, there's this idea that, um, you know, and it's the same idea, to be honest, that, you um, in the medieval period that developed into uh, persecution, a new change in the way in which Jews were persecuted by actually blaming them as deicides of Jesus. This becomes a new kind of charge, uh, a grievance against the Jews because, um, you know, they killed Jesus in the same way here that, you know, uh, Jesus becomes uh you know, somebody who wasn't able to defend himself against government oppression, but he could have if he had, you know, guns, right? So this is the kind of allegory for our, you know, policy <laughs> now. We're not going to let that happen again. I mean, this is the lesson we take is that we saw what happened to Jesus. We're not going to let that happen. We're going to keep <laughs> our guns. And they don't get the idea that the whole point is that this is uh, was supposed to happen so that it redeems your sin, right? You know? Uh, so I think we are living in very dangerous times. That um, far right uh, extreme community is gaining strength in the Republican Party. Um, they may, you know, get kicked out, uh, as Marianne said, they may get kicked out from their respectable committee positions, but they are gaining ground um, rhetorically intellectually, if one can even use that word, but I guess let's just say ideologically. And um, I do think that it we do want to stop them, but it just doesn't seem to me that the Democratic Party is fit for purpose in doing so. And they seem less interested in it um, than making sure that the left doesn't displace them. So you're saying, 
we it's a doomsday cult we're up against a doomsday cult why take care of the poor why fix anything the second coming is around the corner and if yeah, we, the rapture is the housing you know uh, crisis solved because we'll all just you know <laughs> go up to heaven i mean i don't think they they, they want armageddon this. right they they are a death cult i mean the way that the nazi party was a death cult the republican uh national uh christian nationalists are a death cult they want to usher in Armageddon so that Jesus can come back and forgive us of our sins. And this is a destructive religious ideology. It is. And it's also incredibly, this is another interesting element of what's happening is these people hate America. They really do because it's not the America they, they want. So they think destroy the village to save the village. Okay. So we're going to save the true, you know, uh, you know, that's what the rapture is, is destroy everything else, but it saves the special people who are, you know, in the right community. And they look at America and all of the critiques we have, that there's inequality, you know, there's poverty, crumbling infrastructure, an elite that is, you know, preying upon and exploiting everyone else. They see that. And they also combine it with this kind of resentment of the multiracial and multicultural corporate Hollywood elite. They see it all together. It's the globalists, i.e. it's the Jews, but it's the globalists because we're not going to say, you know, uh, uh, use this, the same language that they did in the 1930s. We'll update it and we'll make it a little bit more abstract. But in reality, their critique of America, they hate this America uh, because it's, you know, both oppressive economically, uh, but also because they feel they have been displaced from their rightful inheritance, you know. And so something drastic has to happen in order to restore, you know, the city on the hill, you know, the beacon on uh, the beacon on the hill. And, and, and that means... Um, that means, you know, you know, uh, this apocalyptic kind of doomsday cult that uh, Prof. John was just mentioning. I, I, I got to say, you know, it's time to wake the hell up, people. Uh, heaven is a dangerous idea. Hell <laughs> is a dangerous idea. It's dangerous. Stop it. For God's <laughs> sake. We're here living on a planet. We have to make the best of what we have now, of what actually exists. Stop dreaming up fairy tales that are going to get us all killed. But the sad thing is, is that we have not been able to articulate a compelling uh, language and story and narrative that is about the real problems and the real solutions to them. I mean, for whatever reason, I mean, Bernie was effective for you know a brief period of time he it was derailed but also it, it that's the problem is that it, it has to be overwhelmingly successful to overcome those entrenched interests and obstacles and he was just very successful in communicating this message so i don't know i mean i think um i understand and have sympathy with um the fact that there's so much disenchantment with the conventional narrative of America, it hasn't worked. Um, but unfortunately, uh, what are the avenues really for organizing? The only thing I can see being beneficial with the Democrats winning and keeping you know, uh, Congress is that at least it gives us a little time and a little breathing space to develop some of those alternatives, but we haven't been using that time very well up to this point. Um, so I don't know if you know we will use the time wisely, but I do see on a small scale in places like Seattle, where you have one true socialist progressive force can make a difference by building a social movement, that is what we need to be doing in all of our cities. Marianne mentioned that, you know, 
part of the problem is, is that many of these cities are democratic held and they're suffering from the greatest inequality, from the you know, uh, high cost of housing, endemic homelessness. You know, and this just undermines the social vision and social claims that progressive Democrats might have unless we actually take a stand in these local communities and start showing some results and build a movement around them uh, that meets people's needs. I mean, I think we're just going to see uh, the ever increasing advance of, of the right. And the, yeah, the role I'm not worried about fantasy Armageddon. I'm worried about a president now talking about nuclear Armageddon. I'm worried about the neocons currently in the State Department talking about winnable nuclear war scenarios, just like the beginning of the Reagan administration. I'm looking at a complete, you know, just abnegation of any major policies toward dealing with climate change. I mean, that is gone. I, that was the one thing I thought might actually happen because that's going to affect everybody was that there would be at least maybe not even politically, but maybe some serious funding in the Department of Energy to start getting serious people together, thinking about the, you know, revamping the whole energy grid, thinking about devising strategies for our transportation, our agriculture, our, our building, everything. That is not happening. That is happening piecemeal here and there. Is there's no coherent movement in that in, in that direction. And I think the rich people like Bill Foster and Sean Caston, who are supposedly our two scientists in the house, they're rich. They, you know, they really feel like, well, they can just move. Or they and their and they and their immediate families aren't going to feel the effects. It's already happening in the global south. But that's nobody knows what's going on in other countries. So, you know, it's, um, but I think it's not that we're, it's all gloom and doom. I think that um, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned friend, for our alluded to friend of the show, Kashama Zawant. I mean, yeah, she's really one person has really stirred up a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> My friend, <clears throat> Rachel Ventura, if she gets elected, um, she and 12 other serious progressives in the Illinois State Senate are going to, they are not going to be afraid to vote as a block to block the Madigan machine that's still there in, in Springfield. I have no doubt. And uh, if Michelle Vallejo gets elected down in Texas, and I encourage that's the one Democrat on the national level that I gave a little money to this time around. I mean, that'll be a big slap in the face to the, uh, if she wins, because she owes the Democrats no nothing, absolutely nothing, if she wins her election. So, and maybe she might do what the squad refused to do and, uh, you know, bring the ruckus. I don't know, you can only do what, it, you can only use your limited resources in the best way possible to move things and, you know, I am not advertising at all that I support the Democratic Party. There are individuals I do support. So the takeaway from tonight's conversation is when it comes to climate change, the Democrats are offering the American people sacrifice and patience. The Republicans are offering heaven. What's a what's the winning message here? Huh? Vote for us and we'll all go to heaven or vote for us and give us 10 years and we'll switch to uh, electric cars and get off gas. Maybe <laughs> or we'll all go together when we go. I'm, all suffused with an incandescent glow. <laughs> the well, that's that's why the only message is heaven on earth. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And we could have a paradise. We really could. We could. Mm. But we have to get beyond the current two-party stranglehold now. Who was it? Tom was it Thomas More who wrote Utopia? Uh, I, I echo Professor Jonathan Bick. Beware of promises of a utopia. 
<laughs> Great conversation. One of one of the best. One of the best. This was thrilling. Uh, Professor Ann Lee, right? Maybe you should call that the night then. No. I was just trying to get your juice, your competitive juice. Because I came on to promise utopia. I don't know if you want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> well, I didn't exactly say that, David. But um, Darn Marxist. I, 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 I said, you know, uh, the utopia that you, you want to try to aim for, uh, I wouldn't call it a utopia, but uh, it should be grounded in reality. Right. It shouldn't be made up of whole cloth the way religion is. Um, it's should, wishful thinking and, you know, saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if it, the, the utopia that you actually want to create or a near utopia is is based on the reality of human beings, the environment in which they operate and the resources that are available. Um, Heaven isn't, you know, the concept of heaven and hell are not restrained by any of that. It's just total nonsense made up to control people. And as we see here, to get them to do things that they would not normally do. And in this case, it is uh, a death cult. To join hands, say, we're all going to go to heaven. We're all our sins are going to be forgiven. It's dangerous stuff. But it is cheaper than raising the minimum wage. Well, I can't argue with that. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> how can how can we raise it to $15? We can't compete with God. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Ann Lee, reader of it, The Daily Co's. Her handle is Annie Lee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mary Ann Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Thank you, Professor Jonathan Bick. We will see you at Office Hours teaching Star Trek and the Twilight Zone. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Maybe Adnan shouldn't leave. Are we talking feudalism tonight? What are we doing? Well, I'll talk. You want to talk feudalism? Yeah. Uh, well, you were probably just about to say that. Um... You know, I'm co-host of Guerrilla History, and that was going to be my opportunity to say, well, you should look out in the relatively near future for a fantastic conversation. If you want to talk about heaven, heaven is having a great conversation about the <laughs> British Marxist historians. That's just so fun. And we had a great time speaking with uh, Harvey earlier uh, today. So look forward to that. Wow. Uh, okay, and uh, the Mudgeless podcast. Who's on the? Uh, feel free to stick around and give us a, if you have time. A uh, well, I don't see is Al is uh, uh, Alan. Okay, uh... I, actually, this is I'm gonna. Alan called me. Okay, here's what happened today. He had to fl he's flying to New York. It, the day began where he was gonna fly to New York to check up on his mother up in Rhinebeck, New York. He got to the airport and for some reason or other, he was unable to get on the flight he was supposed to get on. And so he went to the desk and they told him that the only thing they could do for him if he was going to fly today was to fly him from L.A. to Fort Lauderdale to New York tonight. So and if he wanted to wait till tomorrow, he had to pay a few hundred dollars more. He didn't want to do that. So he called me from the airport in Fort Lauderdale and said, he knows he can't make a phone call, probably, but he wondered if he could connect through a Zoom link to the show. So he, he was going to he was going to try to do that. So who knows? He may pop in. The other thing he asked me, and I probably shouldn't talk about this openly here, is he, he said, how late does David stay up? Can I crash at his place? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, what is it? Is he flying into New York tonight? Yes, but it doesn't get until midnight, I think. Okay. Um, let's talk. First of all, let's talk about. Uh, Can I just say I had a really remarkable week? Yeah. Marianne Williamson came to visit and also to speak here at the university. And I, you know, I think I said this before. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how 
little I really knew her until these last few months. We had really remarkable conversations and her talk was truly, I mean, moving for the people who attended. There were two, it was a full house, 200 seats full. Um, yeah, it was students and community people. A lot of her, a lot of fans of hers from this region came came from some distances. Actually, it was surprising. And um, anyhow, so it, it was that was that was the first couple of days of the week. And then on Wednesday, I had lunch as part of a small group with Randy Weingarten, the head of the American Federation of Teachers. She's launching this thirteen state tour to promote dem- vote, you know, Democratic voters to turn out. You know, to try to save the election. She got back from Ukraine, I believe. That really? Yeah. Randy Weingarten. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Interesting. Yeah. So uh which was that? so it was a few days that were really more interesting than the usual days in Green Bay, Wisconsin during the week. And then today I did the guerrilla history. I got to see Henry for the first time in a very long time. He and changed. He did, yes. He look, he looks a little uh looks good. He's in love. Yeah. He's married. Yeah. When did he get married? I think this year. That's okay. Because all of a sudden he referred to his wife, and I thought, what? You know, what's going yeah. on? Yeah. You yeah. know, it's funny. He as I think you may know, he only lived when where he grew up is only a hundred miles away from here. Really? Yeah, he lives up, he grew up in the UP of Michigan, as I said, upper peninsula of Michigan. It's a hundred miles, maybe not even that to where he where he grew up. And back in the spring of 2020, we kept talking about trying to get together. And but then the pandemic got all the heavier and heavier and heavier. So it never really happened. So he may said he may be back next summer and then we'll finally be able to get together. Let's talk about feudalism. How far away is this country from feudalism? When you look at Blackstone, the. uh, private equity, venture capital fund buying up. Uh, they became like the biggest landlord in Spain. Yeah. Housing yeah. is yeah. is, is going to be, is un- unaffordable once. Uh, right. And the, the, the student debt question, which is only, you know, partially resolved. Par- I don't even know if partially is the proper term. Um, that implied a kind of, you know, a debt bondage, basically, which was a, a which was the f- which was actually a sort of post feudal arrangement to keep people in you know in tow and in place, but it clearly was you know an imposition comparable to you know to to a past form of uh, of bondage. We're talking with Professor Harvey J. K. His latest book is his oldest book. The British Marxist historians. I want to continue this conversation about feudalism, but we have to go to Norway. Oh yeah, I definitely. I'm definitely intrigued because yes. one night a week we have sushi here at the house. We go out and buy it at the local store and we put it out, and um, that looks great. I assume we are talking about a, a vegan sushi there. Are we? Joe? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so I made sushi rice is basically rice seasoned for sushi mm-hmm. you, you make you make a, a reduction of kombu seaweed sugar and rice vinegar and you mix that in with the rice after it it's um, cooked so then i i made a few different rolls i made a yeah, wait, tell, it, tell me about the rolls yeah so this is a uh, scallion and cucumber kampamaki with some mm. uh, sesame seeds in it And then uh, inside, inside out roll with sesame on the outside. I had some mm-hmm. smoked tofu, uh, scallion, mm-hmm. and these funky mm-hmm. eno- enoki daki mushrooms. And mm-hmm. then I made tamaki roll. These are the, the quick and easy, lazy, lazy rolls. So tamaki is just a hand roll. You can st- cut little squares of nori seaweed and roll it, uh, roll it up real quick. And those are. Those are nice. This one was a sweet, a sweet potato. It's one of the fine. I mean, all your dishes usually look great, but these look, they just caught my eye immediately when I came on. Is there uh, a way to get more protein into that? Like, I'm going to ask, can I ask you a really stupid question, Joe? Sure. Pharaoh is 
so high in protein, so high in uh, mm -hmm. fiber. Is there any way to make sushi with, I know they do it with brown rice, but could you do it with farro or would that, is that impossible? There's all kinds of uh, modern quote unquote uh, sushi rolls with various grains. Uh, of course you can use whatever grain you like basically. Uh, as long as it just sticks to the the glycemic index for vegans, you got to be careful there. There's uh, a lot of starch and not too much protein, other than the tofu. But I'm not certain that's enough. I mean, as an appetizer, uh, is that a meal? I don't know what the obsession with protein is. As long as you're eating a broad range of foods, uh, a variety of of foods from starches, proteins, uh, fats, etc. you're fine. Um, vegans may have to supplement B12 because they're, miss they're missing out on, on the, the uh, animal protein from that, but you, it does exist in miso and some fermented foods. Mm -hmm. But the, there's the, if you're going to criticize this, you could say, I'm well, not, I'm not, I'm not you're using, no, no, no. If you, if you're, there is a criticism that oh you're you're using white rice which right. is basically you know eating air almost you can substitute short grain brown rice just as easily they're just heavier that's all but it can be done can be done with farro right but I, I wouldn't obsess over that I'd focus more on eating a broad range of variety of food. that's that's the main issue okay. and fresh. Thank you, Joe. We'll see you at office hours. Joe, do. can't do office hours without Joe. Dave in PA continues the ASMR for our eyeballs. What are you going to be Hi, David. What are you going to be making? I'm going to uh, focus on this. I'm going to carve these letters. What? You? F -U. It's for your desk. It's for the dean's office. It's for your dean's office. Oh, F you. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to carve those out. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great backdrop for you. Just the F you. For me, for you. Oh. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Wow. You, you do remember your name me. is Feldman, right? Yeah, that would be. We're, 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 we had a meeting last night about the backdrop for the show. And I should have a bookshelf with uh, FU in the background. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dave. We'll keep an eye out for you. Thank you. And so let's go back to feudalism, Professor Harvey JK. What is feudalism? Uh, people didn't, as you said last week, nobody woke up and said, time for feudalism. <laughs> kind of came out of what? Like, how did we? Nobody wakes up and says, well, actually, I sometimes I'm sure we all wake up at occasionally say time for socialism, but yes, doesn't seem to make much difference who we tell. Um, yeah, I mean, feudalism. OK, so feudalism. For a long time, in at least intellectual and historical and social sciences circles, was understood to be referred to the relationship between sort of the king or at least the chief lord in a region could have been a duke or whatever, and a vassal who would have been a lower, you know, a knight or a lower kind of uh, aristocrat, nobleman, that kind of thing. But to, to link it to this, to the British Marxist historians and other people who, who follow in that kind of thought, um, feudalism is not a relationship among the elites, but rather it's a relationship, between, it's a relationship that involves a certain kind of surplus extraction. And the, the, the standard un understanding would be that peasants are held in a in a form of bondage called serfdom. Now, a serfdom is interesting because it, it is different than slavery. Okay, in slavery, the, the I mean, it's still they're they're both forms of exploitation and surplus extract and extraction. But in in slavery, the slave the person of the slave is the property of the master. The owner, in serfdom, the peasant is 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 essentially tied to the land 
that they work and the land is part of the domain or holding of the Lord. But one thing to understand is that it varies a lot region to region. Tenant tenant farmers? Well, it wasn't tenant farming exactly. Tenant farming is usually where people enter into it voluntarily and an arrangement is made for uh, for rent. Whereas with serfdom, it's that the, the serf has various responsibilities. One, in fact, to till whatever soil here, he, they, he and his family are, accord, are accorded, okay? And that the, the Lord is entitled to a certain, sounds not simply a share, but literally, you know, well, it is a share of what is produced and or an amount. If it's an amount, then it can be very difficult for the, the, the peasant because that means they're going to have more or less to put on the table. The other thing is that they're subject to to labor in the Lord's manor house or castle, whatever the, the, you know, the residence might be. Also in, in France, at least there were forms of serfdom, which involved collective labor where they would have to work, you know, repairing the roads or, you know, building infrastructure of various sorts. In no, mo- no money. Well, I mean, there might have been some exchange of money, but this wasn't a matter of paying. The, they didn't get paid for that labor. That was part of their responsibilities as serfs, their obligations, their duty as serfs. Um, so, I mean, it was, a, it was a form in which, you know, the, in the middle, in the, the ideology of the Middle Ages was essentially that there were three orders or estates, the lords, the priests, and the peasants. And they each had a function. The Lord's task was to protect everyone and govern, to rule. The priest's responsibility was, of course, to pray, to intercede with God. Okay, they too were living off of the labor of, well, they were living off of tithes that would come to them probably by way of the Lord to to them, but it's essentially based on the, the income provided by peasants to their lords. And then the peasants, their job was to work. Now, that model left out all the people who lived in towns. So left out the sort of laborers in towns and the, and the, what do they call them, the, the merchants and traders. But, but that didn't matter because this was, a, this was an order in Europe, throughout Europe, that was essentially rurally based. The lords were themselves rurally based. So, and, and what people and failed to consider evolved, was the degree. It just, it just, right. evo- it just evolved into an economic system or no it, it it was a sort of it sort of arose in the wake of the uh well you ha- first of all you had all these tribes that were of course occupying stretches of the old roman empire and they had their own sort of hierarchies that would have come to to exist mixed with certain roman customs and and laws and it emerges out of that but keeping in mind that this is not something that peasants would necessarily have entered into voluntarily unless it's the case that the Lord was just a damn good defender because you had, you know, it's, 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 it's feudalism. It's the middle ages. You had marauding groups, you had bandits, you had, you know, obligations to one, one Lord who might well have been wiped out by another. It was an effort to establish some kind of hierarchy and order, you might say, and and the peasants paid for it. Last week, we were talking about your book, The British Marxist Historians, and in that you say there's a a disagreement over how to interpret history, that there are some Marxist historians who have said capitalism has always been with us. It goes back to the... No, it wasn't Marxists who would say that. It was... Marxist historians, some Marxists. No, 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 but not capitalism. There were were many historians and, and the early sociologists who spoke of capitalism as something that prevailed at all times and all places, because they defined capitalism as basically something along the lines of greed and profit seeking. Right. And in that sense, they would be right. And, but and Marx profits, himself, what? Marx, Sorry? does Marx himself? Uh... No, it, no. Marx does, Marx does not reduce capitalism ever to, it, profit seeking is a part profit the pursuit of profit is a part of it but he would never reduce he wouldn't reduce capitalism in any definitional way to does, either does he, does he identify a birth of because 
it, I think it's chapter two. There, you agree on w- what the birth of capitalism was. Well, the, you had these, these, you had various dynamics, but especially the dynamic in a Marxist analysis, especially an analysis afforded by way of the transition from feudalism to capitalism debate, was that indeed class struggles undermined. Not don't forget diseases and other kinds of pandemics that might strike, but th- that feudalism might be might be undermined by by the class struggle. Okay, but it didn't guarantee the end of the end of feudalism. It there, it required that some new political order, new some new political economic order emerge, and that new the, that new order arises out of something that develops in England, where you end up with a, the sort of three these three groups. So you've got the you've got this landlord class. The landlord class itself ends up providing lands to what you before referred to as tenant farmers. The tenant farmers then hire the displaced peasants who were pushed off the lands. Now, what this sets up is, first of all, the tenant has a, has a set rent to the landlord, okay? And a set wage to the workers. And if and his place now is the beginnings or the pressures upon him and it is a him, okay. Um, it, that's where capital. That's at least the argument that capitalism act, actually grows out of this agrarian changes in England. That's the, the now more the most accepted Marxist argument that it was not did not grow out of cities. It did not grow out of commerce, however much commerce was in part of that economy, but that it grew out of this class struggles that that gave rise to or re, or structured agriculture in this sort of three class arrangement but the fundamental confrontation now is between the peasant the former peasant now a worker and the tenant farmer which is essentially the proto capitalist and as he accumulated monies if he could he might well invest in various ways in enterprises and that thus we get the the beginnings of capitalism and then the industrial revolution accelerates which comes well that that comes later because the early form of what we think of as uh, of capitalist workshops it often had less to do with technological innovation by the way and had more to do with basically bringing together the, the workers who were previously doing weaving or whatever else in their own homesteads on their own you know in their own homes you bring them together into a workshop why because you can better supervise them because the original thing was called cottage industry where you would like maybe a merchant would would work with the tenant farmer they would literally hand over materials to peasant families and the and at least and the husband but especially maybe the wife would do the work of creating garments or creating cloth of various sorts that would then be picked up and they would be paid by peace, peace rate. Mm-hmm. But but there was no guarantee where things would get done. So, th- so what ends up happening is that these early entrepreneurs would then bring these folks together into a single, single location so they could supervise them, pay them an hourly wage, and of course, thus, you know, the makings of an industrial revolution, which began in textiles in England, the industrial revolution. We have a question from Rodrigo. Can Harvey, Professor Kay, talk about why neo-feudalism seems to capture the hearts and minds of neo-Nazis and libertarians? Is that true? I don't know that. I I don't know that. Well, could you venture a guess as to what neo? Well, I I well neo-feudalism. I I've heard recently there's talk in places of neo-feudalism. But I didn't hear, it's funny, I didn't hear about it as something that emerges from the right. I heard about it as something that um, certain leftist critics were, like I said before, you know, you had the student debt bondage, you have the the mortgage um, situation, or but now even the inability to get a mortgage, so people are having to rent, okay? Um, and people were saying that it, we're entering this phase in which literally workers become reduced to the status of a serf because they're in debt bond. They're in debt here. They're in debt there. Their capacity to move is limited. 
which is which by the way was peasants could not up and leave the land they couldn't do that in fact the interesting thing about that i don't know if this plays into what rodrigo is asking about is that the question of ownership was so much different in those days it used to be it was called usufruct the, the use rights so if you were a lord of an estate you didn't necessarily operate in the same way in in treating your property as a capitalist would it's rather something that you possess because it's been passed to you as a member of the family well in its own way that's the case with peasants they get pot they got passed from one generation to the next on the estate that's in the mo that's in the most formal sense again things varied um if indeed you know there was a pandemic of some sort a lot of these things would would would, would go through upheavals but pandemics in themselves did not necessarily cause a radical change in feudalism because comparative history showed that when there was a demographic decline in one place and a demographic decline in another, what really mattered was the structure or the class relations that existed, how that shaped the consequences of the pandemic. Plus what Rodney Hilton, the chapter, the, the hero, not the hero, the, the key figure in chapter three in the book, who's the medieval historian, student of peasant life in the middle ages is he really wanted to make sense of peasant class struggles um most historians had i would i mentioned this this afternoon to adnan who knows more about it even than i do it was not unusual for historians to assume that peasants were so simple-minded that whenever there was a rising it may well have been not unlike a drug-induced phenomenon and in fact there were some who argued because of the molds that might grow on cheeses or breads that that might be the source of this of these crate of this crate what do you call it a craze or this sort of uh, mil millenarian movements these you know sudden eruptions but what hilton does is he shows the degree to which there were significant there were those occasions perhaps but there were serious movements of peasants that, that who had banded together who even had their own intellectuals who might well be sort of working class level or, or clerics okay and they and they understood christianity as a religion of the people not a religion of imposition and and so what you find in the case of the 1381 english rising is a movement that not only is rising up against the exploitation and oppression that peasants are suffering, but they actually have a vision of what they're struggling for. And they wanted to eliminate all the landlords as a class and the land would be more readily available. They weren't gonna to have to pay rent and, and shares of what they were producing to anyone. Oddly enough, however, they did in their vision believe there would still be a king. That would be the one Lord, okay? Um, as a sort of, I guess, stability and and, to provide some kind of order and protection against other countries, marauders or attacks. Yeah, I'm just thinking how lucky your students are. Or were, since I don't have them anymore, but. Yeah, have, let's do this more. This is, I like this. I like this a lot. Uh, before you go. Sure. Uh, Alan never did make it, right? He didn't try to get in at all. No. I don't think so. Okay. I understand why somebody is a neo-Nazi. Whoa, now we're shifting gears, okay. Yeah, but going back to Rodrigo's question, and I can understand why somebody would be a libertarian. What is the appeal to of neo-feudalism unless you're, you have land and money and you're part of the landed gentry, in which case, why would you bother to be a neo-Nazi? Yeah, I don't know. Rodrigo is going to have to give us something to, to write around. Do you mind if I, Rodrigo, what, uh, are you there? Rodrigo in Mexico. Rod? Hi, I put it in the... Q &A that... I, I asked the question. So explain to me, you're saying that neo-Nazis and libertarians are speaking of a neo-feudalism that they're welcoming? They like the idea of a future where you belong to a company that belongs to a larger company 
and you're stuck in that company until you die. You like in the 1890s where you belong to the mining company or a far a large farm and you had to buy everything with script from the company mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah yeah I, right i mean basically the and they're the celebrating this they, they, they think this is a good idea well they think they're going to be on top they don't know that they're going to be barely above the lowest rung, but they all think, oh, I'm going to work my way up in this new, and eventually I can become the new king. Professor K? Well, I was thinking, it's funny, I, I'm not specifically what Rodrigo was referring to, but as we were describing it, Two, two thoughts came to mind. One was the uh, studio system back in the 1930s in Hollywood. The second one is, of course, the National Football League. Okay, the way they own their players and trade them. That would be, I guess, also the case for other sports. But I think of the NFL first because I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, but the idea of these, you know, that might actually be appealing to too many people given the current state of affairs because... Given the insecurity of work these days and a job, okay, that you could you you imagine these massive enterprises and conglomerates and multinationals, in which uh, you're guaranteed a job, you're guaranteed a security. The law might provide for the you know for the likes of a Henry Ford to be the master of the of the of the enterprise, also determining when you rise and when you go to sleep. Those kinds of things. I mean. It's, it's a nightmarish scenario, but I'm, we, we, we've seen it in the, in the films even today, this, this warning, the warning. Um, I mean, there's all these different, you know, dark futures we can imagine, like. What are we missing? You know. What are we missing in all of this? What, no, what are we missing in, the, what are we not seeing? Because earlier, uh, uh, Professor Hussein was talking about Lauren Boebert, who is welcoming the second coming of Christ and wants to accelerate it. And the Republicans are kind of selling heaven like, you don't you don't need a job. Just let's keep burning fossil fuel and in a couple of years you'll be in heaven. It's hard for us to believe that we're missing that. I'm missing that. It just seems. When you say you're missing that. You mean how? Uh, what, what kind of imaginations? So Why would somebody believe that? How many people could be that gullible and stupid to believe that? Certainly, they're going to come to their senses, or certainly. Uh, well, let, let's allow for this. Okay, let's allow for the fact that such folks have always existed in the course of American history and the history of other countries. Let's, so let's assume there was always that kind of small percentage of folks who thought such right. okay but now how do we explain the fact that there are not only more people thinking along those lines but that has become part of the public discourse and that we actually have people in congress thinking like that and by the way there were people in congress who thought that way in the past too probably right but, okay but for two minutes but for many years now and th this is one of the reasons that i i really wrote the four freedoms book actually I mean, I don't think we quite grasp how significant the the New Deal years were and how much it shaped American life after it. That is, that it really did rally millions of people to to try to to try to rebuild the United States. And it gave meaning gave meaning to people. They were going to be a part. They were both, not only were they going to improve their own lives, they were going to improve their communities. They were going to improve the nation. This is generally the case. And the, the young people of that time, the teenagers and 20 year olds who served, I mean, they served in a, to the tune of two or more million people, young people in the, C, in the Civilian Conservation Corps. There was all of these works projects and initiatives. And they came away believing that to, you know, basically that you could create a government that would literally enable you to bring about change. And I don't just mean 
I don't just mean, you know, changing who you are. I mean, changing literally entire communities. I mean, it was vast what, what they did. I mean, there were these massive programs of music education and theater and, you know, there were traveling troops of players. I mean, the nation really went through this, a revolution of sorts. And so those young people who then went on to fight in World War II and believed they were fighting fascism for however much they may well have carried racist and anti-Semitic ideas themselves. And they came back and in the post-war world, again, it was still a struggle to fight for equal rights. I mean, we know that for the, from the 40s right through the 60s to secure the laws necessary to at least provide some kind of integration, some kind of racial justice and so on. But it really was a period from say 35 or even go back to 33, all the way through to the arc say of like 1973 in which you, know, you, you actually had this sense that democratic government could be harnessed to create a better America for everyone. And the fight was to make sure it was for everyone in the course of the 50s and 60s and so on. But then, and then on top of that, it really, and it was true, it actually transpired that way. I mean, poverty, it, poverty persisted right through the 50s into the 60s, but it was the case that poverty actually was in decline. When Michael, Har <clears throat> when Michael Harrington wrote The Other America in 1960, 61, that became the book that literally made everyone aware of poverty in America. <clears throat> and when Edward R. Murrow created, he did those um, documentaries on migrant workers. I mean, that a lot of Americans had believed that we had transcended those conditions because of what had happened during the New Deal, World War II, and, and the, the incredible boom of the post-war years. But it's and, and it re did require a war on poverty and a great society effort, which, by the way, did reduce poverty all the more. But all the way through the 50s, <clears throat> because of workers' capacities to strike, to make demands on companies, all of a sudden workers who at once upon a, once upon a time were workers not unlike today, where you had a full-time job and you still couldn't care for your family in the course of unions and strikes. I mean, think about this. When the auto, if an automobile strike occurred or a steel, you know, auto worker strike or a steel worker strike, you might have seen tens of thousands of people out on the strike. You, you know, and not, not, not a strike at a plant of maybe 30 people. I mean, tens of thousands. I think the last steel strike might have seen 50,000 workers out on strike. Okay. Right. So conditions definitely were improving. And because those improvements were taking place, I think it also, inspired the possibility that you might then truly eliminate poverty in the course of the 1960s. Great. Now we, we don't do that any longer. The Democrats abandoned, abandoned the FDR tradition. They turned their backs on the things that made things possible and the organizations and institutions that afforded meaning they, they literally crushed them in the course of this 45-year class war that I mention every week. To be continued. You bet. Go buy the British Marxist Historians. It's published by Zero Books. Buy this. Go buy it. Go buy it. Go buy it. Professor, yeah, go buy it, damn it. Go buy it. <laughs> buy it. And follow Professor Harvey J.K. on Twitter at Harvey J.K., and go by the British Marxist historians. I love you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Maybe Alan will show up on your door knocking it after midnight. Okay. What a privilege. Thank you. By the way, can I at least tell him to give you a call or should I tell him not to? Uh, He's in the air. Should he text you? How about if he texts you? Okay. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Harvey JK. Uh, Let's go to Dave in PA and take a look at what you finished. Almost finished. That looks you beautiful. See, uh, yeah, if I had, hang on a second. If I had my light, you can see the shadow of it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can see it's incised like a tombstone, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm not implying anything by saying that. Beautiful. Yeah, I got the F done anyway. Next week, I'll do you. 
<laughs> how do people, uh, how's peeper, how, how the peepers, how, how are the leaves? Uh, they're blown off now. It peaked out really nice uh, Indigenous Day uh, a week or so ago. It was a perfect fall. Everything peaked out at once. It was and lovely. Good weather. How can people stay at your bed? And it's not a bed and breakfast. It's like an Airbnb. It's Airbnb. Yeah. How do uh, they do it? Yeah, go to uh, Airbnb and it's, uh, what does it say? Uh, small Farm Retreat in Millerton, PA. If you put that into Airbnb, you'll get there. Millerton, uh, PA. PA, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It's Great usually job. booked up most weekends, but you never know. If you can get a weekday off, it's, it's almost sure to be open. Okay. We'll see you. Uh, I'll see Thank you at all. hours. Thank you, Dave and PA. You will indeed. Thank you. Dave actually knows how to do something. Like, you know, uh, Rodrigo. It's, inter Hi, it's interesting to watch Dave and PA. He and Joe can actually, uh, you know, they can do something. I knew how to do some of that when I was a kid. My grandfather was a carpenter. Ah. His fair job. My fa uh, my grandfather taught me how to send soup back at a diner. That was the skill I learned from my grandfather. Does it involve putting a fly on it so you don't have to pay? No, 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 no. I just had to complain about things. Just complaining is a gift, which it is. You know, you go to a funeral and somebody's complaining about the traffic they're a gift somebody's complaining when you if, when you're in a tragic situation and somebody's complaining about something other than the tragedy it's a gift to everybody who's there what's on your mind oh great rodrigo okay, so I, I read it. you've got fans now in the chat room they're calling you king i love rodrigo I don't need that. I think those are my friends. <laughs> I don't need that, Rodrigo. They're not your friends. They're here to undermine my sense of worth. Why not both? <laughs> <laughs> Why not both? Okay. What's on so, your mind today? When you tell somebody a story that contains a lot of details, where some of the details ring true with your expectations, People will believe it without double checking whether the individual parts of the narrative are actually plausible together. I'm going to butcher this story due to time constraints, but some scientists did a study many years ago about several things. One of them involves a short story about a woman who goes to civil rights protest and people are asked, is it more likely that she's a, a librarian or a feminist and a librarian? 85% of people get this wrong, but if you ask in a slightly different way, only a little bit different, that error rate falls to 0%. This is not a story about how people don't pay attention or how people are dumb. This is a story of how most people can get tricked with a few well-chosen words, and it takes a, a lot of double checking to realize you're getting tricked. Now, the reason this particular example is hard for people is because we're not taught logic in school, specifically Boolean logic, logic tables, and how you cannot have a group of feminist librarian women be larger than the group of librarian women. Even rich people's schools don't teach you this for the most part. Conservatives are constantly complaining that China is beating the US in education, but they're also complaining that they're not allowed to teach creationism along with evolution and the quote, Northern War of Aggression, end quote, along with slavery and the civil war, to give a couple of examples. An easy to understand example is when conservatives protest that the murder rate has gone up 16% or 30%. If you look into it, you'll realize that murders have gone up from five to eight a year or something with respect to 2019 or 2020 but if you look at the 80s and 90s the murder rates back then are over 300 percent of last year 
or whenever crime supposedly went up and we're facing a murder wave. I don't have a solution, but I want everyone to understand that most of the time people don't even think to double check things they hear on conservative media. So it's hard to realize you've been tricked because you didn't even think of double checking everything they said. And speaking of double checking, uh, this last weekend, leftists have been talking about this. There was a viral video from a teacher complaining that her school has requested litter boxes in case a school shooting takes hours to solve. Her school is in the same district as Columbine. At some point, someone decided to edit this video, removing all the gun legislation complaints and leaving only the litter box part. Then they started to circulate it as a video protesting woke schools, letting children use litter boxes instead of bathrooms. Eventually, Ro Joe Rogan presented this and complained about crazy people who refused to use the bathroom. I won't go into details of how this was turned into a furry slash anti-trans issue, but I want you to remember that, unlike David Feldman, Joe Rogan has many producers who could, if they wanted to, double-check these things before he says them on air. This is the world we live in. A video protesting the lack of gun control is being misused to complain about wokeism and people who pretend to be cats a few hours a day. So if you hear anyone talking about trans people and litter boxes, you should know where that came from. We've also heard that Kanye is going to buy Parler and Trump after receiving 90% of Truth Social stocks pressured someone to give his stock to Melania this man complained this would be a taxable gift and he couldn't afford to pay the taxes, but apparently ended up doing it anyway and then got pushed out of the board. A new study of lifetime salaries between 1969 and 2019 has found that union workers make $1.3 million more than non-union wor workers across their lifetime. The link, if anyone wants to read it, and David mentioned that in Florida, many ex-convicts are being told to pay $500 or $1,000 for voting when they shouldn't have. And you should know that in Florida law, you only committed a crime if you didn't know you were not allowed to register to vote. Sorry, if you knew that you were they not were allowed. Sent, they, they were sent voter registration cards. And the people who gave you your voter registration had unclear instructions and didn't know they were supposed to deny you. Florida also passed a law recently making it harder to put new constitutional amendments on the ballot. And of course, that Santis extended voting deadlines in only three heavily Republican counties. Finally, Jesse Gender made a four-hour video essay debunking Matt Walsh's What is a Woman fake documentary and YouTube took it down for, quote, violating their sex and nudity community guideline policy, end quote. Which really? is insane, but if enough people report a video, it gets taken down. She didn't even get timestamps about the sections a human YouTube moderator might have objected to. In a four hour long video essay, for reference, I've shown some of her videos in office hours before, and they were less than an hour long each. You should follow Jesse Gender for fun Star Trek videos. Thank you. We should follow who? Jesse Gender. Spell it. J E S S I E G E N D E R. Okay. Great job as always, Rodrigo. Thank you. Thank you. Rodrigo is one of the producers of this show. We have to put him in the crawl there I, I don't think his name is there today's show is produced as always by hang on that's the mods well let me thank the mods first today's mods we have two chat rooms going at the same time one in our virtual studio audience one on YouTube and the mods are Autumn Leaves Midi Doctors Bob Comedy M. Toussaint Choking on Ashes Lexi 444 S Scout is taken, Dent F, Andy Brown, Sarah Bush, and Invisible Ninja. Thank you to all of the mods for keeping 
both chat rooms civil. We try to keep the chat rooms as civil as as possible. Uh, it's not that uh, you know people are opinionated. So, and again, this show is produced by Dan Frankenberger. Nothing gets done without Dan Frankenberger, along with Professor Bick, Andy Brown, Rod in Mexico, Sarah Bush, Invisible Ninja, Grace Jackson and Joe in Norway. Thank you uh, all for helping make this show work. And office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. Please come to office hours. You will meet a better type of person there. We have a great crew of people. Thank you to Lane, who is Sir Arthur Grieb Striebling. I haven't been giving Lane right afterwards. I'm I'm always curious to see what the response is to to Lane. Uh, I I just want, I don't want people to know who is Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling yet. I'm just, the reaction has been so amazing. So I've been uh, pleased by who thinks who they think is uh, Sir Arthur Grebe Striebling, but it is Lane in uh, Seaham, the brilliant Lane. My newsletter comes out every Friday at 6 p.m. Please subscribe to my newsletter by going over to davidfeldmanshow.com and signing up for the newsletter. While you're over there, sign up for office hours. If you didn't get your invitation for office hours, just go to my website and it will take you right there. There's a menu that says office hours, just click on it and it'll take you, take you into office hours. Um, subscribe to the show wherever you get podcasts. We need more subscribers. So please subscribe. I mean, this show is brilliant. These conversations are absolutely breathtakingly brilliant. Please share the show with other brilliant people. It's just amazing. Get better, Professor Mike Steinel. He has a cold. It's not, it's not COVID, though. He's just got a cold. Uh, I think that covers everything. I think I'm, I think I didn't leave anything out. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. Uh, I will see everybody at office hours tomorrow at 8 p.m. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. I'm traveling light, got everything I need. Got a little bottle of wool light and a little bag of weed. Got to saw bellow novel, cause I really like to read. I'm traveling light. I'm a creature of the road, got no regrets. Gave up my postal code and cigarettes. I'm doing much better with a touch of Tourette's. I'm traveling light. Just need a clean room in a Motel 6. Not too close to downtown, but not out in the sticks. I need my pen and teller, magic kit, so I can do my tricks. Got my favorite pillow, which I call Mr. Fluffy. Four kinds of allergy pills in case I get stuffy. A pound of Epsom salts, cause my ankles get puffy. I'm traveling light. I got two pairs of socks and shorts in my little valise. A couple of passports and my sex doll Denise. I'm staying real quiet so they don't call the police. I'm traveling light. sedatives and my antipsychotics a high speed parallax motor cause I'm into robotics and my little red speedo I like to do 
aquatics, I'm traveling late. Got my CPAP machine and my George Foreman grill. A copy of Lolita and my little blue pills. A Navajo blanket in case I get a chill. I'm traveling late. Got my margarita mix and my rusty old blender. A fifth of tequila in case I go on a bender. My attorney's number. I want to change my gender. I'm traveling light. So light. So light. So light. So light. So light. In Cape, I have some visitors. For breeze, if my room is stinky, a Polaroid in case I get kinky. My Jesus bobblehead and my Star Wars bedspread. I'm traveling light. I got my rabbi costume and my portable dark room. My hair plug lotion and my expensive wrinkle cream. My Emmy statue for my self esteem. I'm traveling light. I got my podcast mixer and a fancy microphone, my exercise bike so I have a place to hang my pants, my very valuable Hummel collection, a menorah made of fish heads, a Christmas tree, I like to keep my options open, don't you know, a shoe shine kit, a skill saw, a crossword book, a large supply of mechanical pencils, a year's worth of New York magazines I've been trying to get around to read, some scripts that I've been tweaking for those people in LA, and my enemies list. Don't forget about my enemies.